Author's Note for Nostromo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Peter Dan Nostromo by Joseph Conrad Author's Note Nostromo is the most anxiously meditated of the longer novels which belong to the period following upon the publication of the Typhoon volume of short stories. I don't mean to say that I became then conscious of any impending change in my mentality and in my attitude towards the tasks of my writing life. And perhaps there was never any change except in that mysterious, extraneous thing which has nothing to do with the theories of art, a subtle change in the nature of the inspiration, a phenomenon for which I cannot in any way be held responsible. What, however, did cause me some concern was that, after finishing the last story of the Typhoon volume, it seemed somehow that there was nothing more in the world to write about. This so strangely negative but disturbing mood lasted some little time. And then, as with many of my longer stories, the first hint for Nostromo came to me in the shape of a vagrant anecdote, completely destitute of valuable details. As a matter of fact, in 1875 or 6, when very young in the West Indies, or rather in the Gulf of Mexico, for my contacts with land were short, few and fleeting, I heard the story of some man who was supposed to have stolen, single-handed, a whole lighter full of silver somewhere on the Tierra Firma seaboard during the troubles of a revolution. On the face of it, this was something of a feat. But I heard no details, and having no particular interest in crime qua crime, I was not likely to keep that one in my mind. And I forgot it till twenty-six or seven years afterwards I came upon the very thing in a shabby volume picked up outside a second-hand bookshop. It was the life story of an American seaman, written by himself with the assistance of a journalist. In the course of his wanderings, that American sailor worked for some months on board a schooner, the master and owner of which was the thief of whom I had heard in my very young days. I have no doubt of that, because there could hardly have been two exploits of that peculiar kind in the same part of the world, and both connected with the South American Revolution. The fellow had actually managed to steal a lighter with silver, and this, it seems, only because he was implicitly trusted by his employers, who must have been singularly poor judges of character. In the sailor's story, he is represented as an unmitigated rascal, a small cheat, stupidly ferocious, morose, of mean appearance, and altogether unworthy of the greatness this opportunity had thrust upon him. What was interesting was that he should boast of it openly. He used to say, People think I make a lot of money in this schooner of mine, but that is nothing. I don't care for that. Now and then I go away quietly and lift a bar of silver. I must get rich slowly, you understand? There was also another curious point about the man. Once, in the course of some quarrel, the sailor threatened him, What's to prevent me reporting ashore what you have told me about that silver? The cynical ruffian was not alarmed in the least. He actually laughed. You fool, if you dare talk like that on shore about me, you will get a knife stuck in your back. Every man, woman and child in that port is my friend. And who's to prove the lighter wasn't sunk? I didn't show you where the silver is hidden, did I? So you know nothing. And suppose I lied, eh? Ultimately, the sailor, disgusted with the sordid meanness of that impenitent thief, deserted from the schooner. The whole episode takes about three pages of his autobiography. Nothing to speak of. But as I look them over, the curious confirmation of the few casual words heard in my early youth evoked the memories of that distant time when everything was so fresh, so surprising so venturesome, so interesting. Bits of strange coasts under the stars, shadows of hills in the sunshine, men's passions in the dusk, gossip half forgotten, faces grown dim. Perhaps, perhaps, there still was in the world something to write about. Yet I did not see anything at first in the mere story. A rascal steals a large parcel of a valuable commodity, so people say. 
is either true or untrue, and in any case it has no value in itself. To invent a circumstantial account of the robbery did not appeal to me, because my talents not running that way, I did not think that the game was worth the candle. It was only when it dawned upon me that the purloiner of the treasure need not necessarily be a confirmed rogue, that he could be even a man of character, an actor and possibly a victim in the changing scenes of a revolution. It was only then that I had the first vision of a twilight country which was to become the province of Sulaco, with its high shadowy sierra and its misty campo for mute witnesses of events flowing from the passions of men short-sighted in good and evil. Such are, in very truth, the obscure origins of Nostromo, the book. From that moment, I suppose, it had to be. Yet even then I hesitated, as if warned by the instinct of self-preservation from venturing on a distant and toilsome journey into a land full of intrigues and revolutions. But it had to be done. It took the best part of the years 1903-4 to four to do, with many intervals of renewed hesitation, lest I should lose myself in the ever-enlarging vistas opening before me as I progressed deeper in my knowledge of the country. Often also, when I had thought myself to a standstill over the tangled-up affairs of the Republic, I would, figuratively speaking, pack my bag, rush away from Salako for a change of air, and write a few pages of the Mirror of the Sea. But generally, as I've said before, my sojourn on the continent of Latin America, famed for its hospitality, lasted for about two years. On my return I found, speaking somewhat in the style of Captain Gulliver, my family all well, my wife heartily glad to learn that the fuss was all over, and our small boy considerably grown during my absence. My principal authority for the history of Costaguana is, of course, my venerated friend, the late Don José Avalanos, minister to the courts of England and Spain, etc., etc., in his impartial and eloquent History of Fifty Years of Misrule. That work was never published, the reader will discover why, and I am in fact the only person in the world possessed of its contents. I have mastered them in not a few hours of earnest meditation, and I hope that my accuracy will be trusted. In justice to myself and to allay the fears of prospective readers, I beg to point out that the few historical allusions are never dragged in for the sake of parading my unique erudition, but that each of them is closely related to actuality, either throwing a light on the nature of current events or affecting directly the fortunes of the people of whom I speak. As to their own histories, I have tried to set them down, aristocracy and people, men and women, Latin and Anglo-Saxon, bandit and politician, with as cool a hand as was possible in the heat and clash of my own conflicting emotions. And, after all, this is also the story of their conflicts. It is for the reader to say how far they are deserving of interest in their action and in the secret purposes of their hearts, revealed in the bitter necessities of the time. I confess that, for me, that time is the time of firm friendships and unforgotten hospitalities. And in my gratitude I must mention here Mrs Gould, the First Lady of Sulaco, whom we may safely leave to the secret devotion of Dr Monningham, and Charles Gould, the idealist creator of material interests, whom we must leave to his mine, from which there is no escape in this world. About Nostromo, the second of the two racially and socially contrasted men both captured by the silver of the San Tome mine, I feel bound to say something more. I did not hesitate to make that central figure an Italian. First of all, the thing is perfectly credible. Italians were swarming into the Occidental province at the time, as anybody who will read further can see. And secondly, there was no one who could stand so well by the side of Giorgio Viola, the Garibaldino, the idealist of the old humanitarian revolutions. For myself, I needed there a man of the people, as free as possible from his class conventions and all settled modes of thinking. This is not a side snarl at conventions. My reasons were not moral, but artistic. Had he been an Anglo-Saxon, he would have tried to get into local politics. 
but Nostromo does not aspire to be a leader in a personal game. He does not want to raise himself above the mass. He is content to feel himself a power within the people. But mainly, Nostromo is what he is because I received the inspiration for him in my early days from a Mediterranean sailor. Those who have read certain pages of mine will see at once what I mean when I say that Dominic, the padrone of the Tremolino, might, under given circumstances, have been a Nostromo. At any rate, Dominic would have understood the younger man perfectly, if scornfully. He and I were engaged together in a rather absurd adventure, but the absurdity does not matter. It is a real satisfaction to think that in my very young days there must, after all, have been something in me worthy to commend that man's half-bitter fidelity, his half-ironic devotion. Many of Nostromo's speeches I have heard first in Dominic's voice. His hand on the tiller and his fearless eyes roaming the horizon from within the monkish hood shadowing his face, he would utter the usual exordium of his remorseless wisdom, Vous autres gentilhommes, in a caustic tone that hangs on my ear yet. Like Nostromo, you hombres finos, very much like Nostromo. But Dominic the Corsican nursed a certain pride of ancestry from which my Nostromo is free, for Nostromo's lineage had to be more ancient still. He is a man with the weight of countless generations behind him and no parentage to boast of, like the people. In his firm grip on the earth, he inherits in his improvidence and generosity, in his lavishness with his gifts, in his manly vanity, in the obscure sense of his greatness and in his faithful devotion with something despairing as well as desperate in its impulses, he is a man of the people, their very own unenvious force, disdaining to lead but ruling from within. He is afterwards grown older as the famous Captain Fidanza, with a stake in the country, going about his many affairs, followed by respectful glances in the modernised streets of Sulaco, calling on the widow of the cargador, attending the lodge, listening in unmoved silence to anarchist speeches at the meeting, the enigmatical patron of the new revolutionary agitation, the trusted, the wealthy comrade Fidanza, with the knowledge of his moral ruin locked up in his breast, he remains essentially a man of the people. In his mingled love and scorn of life, and in the bewildered conviction of having been betrayed, of dying betrayed, he hardly knows by what or by whom, he is still of the people, their undoubted great man, with a private history of his own. One more figure of those stirring times I would like to mention, and that is Antonia Avellanos, the beautiful Antonia. Whether she is a possible variation of Latin American girlhood, I wouldn't dare to affirm. But for me, she is. Always a little in the background by the side of her father, my venerated friend, I hope she has yet relief enough to make intelligible what I am going to say. Of all the people who had seen with me the birth of the Occidental Republic, she is the only one who has kept in my memory the aspect of continued life. Antonia the aristocrat and Nostromo the man of the people are the artisans of the new era, the true creators of the new state. He, by his legendary and daring feat, she, like a woman, simply by the force of what she is, the only being capable of inspiring a sincere passion in the heart of a trifler. If anything could induce me to revisit Sulaco, I should hate to see all these changes, it would be Antonia. And the true reason for that, why not be frank about it, the true reason is that I have modelled her on my first love. How we, a band of tallish schoolboys, the chums of her two brothers, how we used to look up to that girl just out of the schoolroom herself as the standard bearer of a faith to which we were all born but which she alone knew how to hold aloft with an unflinching hope. She had perhaps more glow and less serenity in her soul than Antonia, but she was an uncompromising Puritan of patriotism with no taint of the slightest worldliness in her thoughts. I was not the only one in love with her, but it was I who had to hear oftenest her scathing criticism of my levities, very much like poor Decoud, 
or stand the brunt of her austere, unanswerable invective. She did not quite understand, but never mind. That afternoon when I came in, a shrinking yet defiant sinner, to say the final goodbye, I received a hand squeeze that made my heart leap and saw a tear that took my breath away. She was softened at the last as though she had suddenly perceived we were such children still, that I was really going away for good, going very far away, even as far as Sulaco, lying unknown, hidden from our eyes in the darkness of the placid gulf. That's why I long sometimes for another glimpse of the beautiful Antonia, or can it be the other, moving in the dimness of the great cathedral, saying a short prayer at the tomb of the first and last Cardinal Archbishop of Sulaco, standing absorbed in filial devotion before the monument of Don José Avellanos, and with a lingering, tender, faithful glance at the medallion memorial to Martin de Coux, going out serenely into the sunshine of the plaza with her upright carriage and her white head, a relic of the past, disregarded by men awaiting impatiently the dawns of other new eras, the coming of more revolutions. But this is the idlest of dreams, for I did understand perfectly well at the time that the moment the breath left the body of the magnificent Capitas, the man of the people, freed at last from the toils of love and wealth, there was nothing more for me to do in Sulaco. J.C. October 1917 End of Author's Note Part First of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad The Silver of the Mine Chapter One This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Part First The Silver of the Mine Chapter One In the time of Spanish rule and for many years afterwards, the town of Sulaco, the luxuriant beauty of the Orange Gardens bears witness to its antiquity, had never been commercially anything more important than a coasting port with a fairly large local trade in ox hides and indigo. The clumsy deep-sea galleons of the conquerors that, needing a brisk gale to move at all, would lie becalmed where your modern ship built on clipper lines forges ahead by the mere flapping of her sails, had been barred out of Sulaco by the prevailing calms of its vast gulf. Some harbours of the earth are made difficult of access by the treachery of sunken rocks and the tempests of their shores. Sulaco had found an inviolable sanctuary from the temptations of a trading world in the solemn hush of the deep Golfo Placido, as if within an enormous semicircular and unroofed temple open to the ocean, with its walls of lofty mountains hung with the morning draperies of cloud. On one side of this broad curve in the straight seaboard of the Republic of Costaguana, the last spur of the coast range forms an insignificant cape whose name is Punta Mala. From the middle of the gulf, the point of the land itself is not visible at all, but the shoulder of a steep hill at the back can be made out faintly, like a shadow on the sky. On the other side, what seems to be an isolated patch of blue mist floats lightly on the glare of the horizon. This is the peninsula of Azuera, a wild chaos of sharp rocks and stony levels cut about by vertical ravines. It lies far out to sea like a rough head of stone stretched from a green-clad coast at the end of a slender neck of sand covered with thickets of thorny scrub. Utterly waterless, for the rainfall runs off at once on all sides into the sea, it has not soil enough, it is said, to grow a single blade of grass as if it were blighted by a curse. The poor, associating by an obscure instinct of consolation the ideas of evil and wealth, will tell you that it is deadly because of its forbidden treasures. The common folk of the neighbourhood, peons of the estancias, Vaqueros of the seaboard plains, tame Indians coming miles to market with a bundle of sugar cane or a basket of maize worth about threepence, are well aware that heaps of shining gold lie in the gloom of the deep precipices cleaving the stony levels of Azuera. 
Tradition has it that many adventurers of olden times had perished in the search. The story goes also that within men's memory, two wandering sailors, Americanos perhaps, but gringos of some sort for certain, talked over a gambling good-for-nothing mozzo, and the three stole a donkey to carry for them a bundle of dry sticks, a water skin, and provisions enough to last a few days. Thus accompanied and with revolvers at their belts, they had started to chop their way with machetes through the thorny scrub of the neck of the peninsula. On the second evening, an upright spiral of smoke, it could only have been from their campfire, was seen for the first time within memory of man standing up faintly upon the sky above a razorbacked ridge on the stony head. The crew of a coasting schooner lying becalmed three miles off the shore stared at it with amazement till dark. The negro fisherman, living in a lonely hut in a little bay nearby, had seen the start and was on the lookout for some sign. He called to his wife just as the sun was about to set. They had watched the strange portent with envy, incredulity and awe. The impious adventurers gave no other sign. The sailors, the Indian and the stolen burrow were never seen again. As to the mozzo, a Sulaco man, his wife paid for some masses and the poor four-footed beast, being without sin, had been probably permitted to die but the two gringos, spectral and alive, are believed to be dwelling to this day amongst the rocks under the fatal spell of their success. Their souls cannot tear themselves away from their bodies mounting guard over the discovered treasure. They are now rich and hungry and thirsty, a strange theory of tenacious gringo ghosts suffering in their starved and parched flesh of defiant heretics where a Christian would have renounced and been released. These, then, are the legendary inhabitants of Azuera guarding its forbidden wealth, and the shadow of the sky on one side with the round patch of blue haze blurring the bright skirt of the horizon on the other mark the two outermost points of the bend which bears the name of Golfo Placido, because never a strong wind has been known to blow upon its waters. On crossing the imaginary line drawn from Punta Mala to Azuera, The ships from Europe, bound to Sulaco, lose at once the strong breezes of the ocean. They become the prey of capricious airs that play with them for thirty hours at a stretch sometimes. Before them, the head of the calm gulf is filled on most days of the year by a great body of motionless and opaque clouds. On the rare, clear mornings, another shadow is cast upon the sweep of the gulf, The dawn breaks high behind the towering and serrated walls of the Cordillera, a clear-cut vision of dark peaks rearing their steep slopes on a lofty pedestal of forest rising from the very edge of the shore. Amongst them the white head of Higuerota rises majestically upon the blue. Bare clusters of enormous rocks sprinkle with tiny black dots the smooth dome of snow. Then, as the midday sun withdraws from the gulf, the shadow of the mountains, the clouds begin to roll out of the lower valleys. They swathe in sombre tatters the naked crags of precipices above the wooded slopes, hide the peaks, smoke in stormy trails across the snows of Higuerota. The Cordillera is gone from you as if it had dissolved itself into great piles of grey and black vapours, that travel out slowly to seaward and vanish into thin air all along the front before the blazing heat of the day. The wasting edge of the cloud bank always strives for but seldom wins the middle of the gulf. The sun, as the sailors say, is eating it up. Unless perchance a sombre thunderhead breaks away from the main body to career all over the gulf till it escapes into the offing beyond Azuera, where it bursts suddenly into flame and crashes like a sinister pirate ship of the air, hove to above the horizon, engaging the sea. At night the body of clouds, advancing higher up the sky, smothers the whole quiet gulf below with an impenetrable darkness, in which the sound of the falling showers can be heard beginning and ceasing abruptly, now here, now there. 
Indeed, these cloudy nights are proverbial with the seamen along the whole west coast of a great continent. Sky, land and sea disappear together out of the world when the Placido, as the saying is, goes to sleep under its black poncho. The few stars left below the seaward frown of the vault shined feebly as into the mouth of a black cavern. In its vastness, your ship floats unseen under your feet, her sails flutter invisible above your head. The eye of God himself, they add with grim profanity, could not find out what work a man's hand is doing in there, and you would be free to call the devil to your aid with impunity if even his malice were not defeated by such a blind darkness. The shores on the gulf are steep too all round, three uninhabited islets basking in the sunshine just outside the cloud veil, and opposite the entrance to the harbour of Salaco bear the name of the Isabels. There is the great Isabel, the little Isabel, which is round, and Hermosa, which is the smallest. That last is no more than a foot high and about seven paces across, a mere flat top of a grey rock which smokes like a hot cinder after a shower and where no man would care to venture a naked soul before sunset. On the little Isabel, an old ragged palm with a thick bulging trunk rough with spines, a very witch amongst palm trees, rustles a dismal bunch of dead leaves above the coarse sand. The great Isabel has a spring of fresh water issuing from the overgrown side of a ravine. Resembling an emerald green wedge of land a mile long and laid flat upon the sea, it bears two forest trees standing close together with a wide spread of shade at the foot of their smooth trunks. A ravine extending the whole length of the island is full of bushes and presenting a deep tangled cleft on the high side spreads itself out on the other into a shallow depression abutting on a small strip of sandy shore. From that low end of the Great Isabel the eye plunges through an opening two miles away as abrupt as if chopped with an axe out of the regular sweep of the coast right into the harbour of Sulaco. It is an oblong, lake-like piece of water. On one side, the short, wooded spurs and valleys of the Cordillera come down at right angles to the very strand. On the other, the open view of the Great Salaco Plain passes into the opal mystery of great distances, overhung by dry haze. The town of Sulaco itself, tops of walls, a great cupola, gleams of white miradors in a vast grove of orange trees, lies between the mountains and the plain, at some little distance from its harbour, and out of the direct line of sight from the sea. End of part first, The Silver of the Mine, chapter one. Part first of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad, The Silver of the Mine, chapter two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part First, The Silver of the Mine, Chapter 2 The only sign of commercial activity within the harbour visible from the beach of the Great Isabel is the square, blunt end of the wooden jetty which the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company, the OSN of familiar speech, had thrown over the shallow part of the bay soon after they had resolved to make of Sulaco one of their ports of call for the Republic of Costa Guana. The state possesses several harbours on its long seaboard, but except Caeta, an important place, all are either small and inconvenient inlets in an iron-bound coast, like Esmeralda, for instance, 60 miles to the south, or else mere open roadsteads exposed to the winds and fretted by the surf. Perhaps the very atmospheric conditions which had kept away the merchant fleets of bygone ages induced the OSN company to violate the sanctuary of peace sheltering the calm existence of Sulaco. The variable airs sporting lightly with the vast semicircle of waters within the head of Azuera could not baffle the steam power of their excellent fleet. Year after year, the black hulls of their ships had gone up and down the coast, in and out, past Azuera, past the Isabels, past Punta Mala, 
disregarding everything but the tyranny of time. Their names, the names of all mythology, became the household words of a coast that had never been ruled by the gods of Olympus. The Juno was known only for her comfortable cabin amidships, the Saturn for the geniality of her captain and the painted and gilt luxuriousness of her saloon, whereas the Ganymede was fitted out mainly for cattle transport and to be avoided by coastwise passengers. The humblest Indian in the obscurest village on the coast was familiar with the Cerberus, a little black puffer without charm or living accommodation to speak of, whose mission was to creep inshore along the wooded beaches close to mighty, ugly rocks, stopping obligingly before every cluster of huts to collect produce down to three-pound parcels of India rubber bound in a wrapper of dry grass. And, as they seldom failed to account for the smallest package, rarely lost a bullock and had never drowned a single passenger, the name of the OSN stood very high for trustworthiness. People declared that under the company's care their lives and property were safer on the water than in their own houses on shore. The OSN's superintendent in Sulaco for the whole Costa Guana section of the service was very proud of his company's standing. He resumed it in a saying which was very often on his lips, We never make mistakes. To the company's officers it took the form of a severe injunction, We must make no mistakes. I'll have no mistakes here, no matter what Smith may do at his end. Smith, on whom he had never set eyes in his life, was the other superintendent of the service, quartered some 1,500 miles away from Sulaco. Don't talk to me of your Smith. Then, calming down suddenly, he would dismiss the subject with studied negligence. Smith knows no more of this continent than a baby. Our excellent Signor Mitchell, for the business and official world of Sulaco, Fussy Joe, for the commanders of the company's ships, Captain Joseph Mitchell prided himself on his profound knowledge of men and things in the country, Cosas de Costaguana. Among these last he accounted as most unfavourable to the orderly workings of his company the frequent changes of government brought about by revolutions of the military type. The political atmosphere of the Republic was generally stormy in these days. The fugitive patriots of the defeated party had the knack of turning up again on the coast with half a steamer's load of small arms and ammunition. Such resourcefulness Captain Mitchell considered as perfectly wonderful in view of their utter destitution at the time of flight. He had observed that they never seemed to have enough change about them to pay for their passage ticket out of the country and he could speak with knowledge, for on a memorable occasion he had been called upon to save the life of a dictator, together with the lives of a few Salako officials, the political chief, the director of the customs, and the head of police, belonging to an overturned government. Poor Senor Ribiera, such was the dictator's name, had come pelting eighty miles over mountain tracks after the lost battle of Socorro, in the hope of outdistancing the fatal news, which, of course, he could not manage to do on a lame mule. The animal, moreover, expired under him at the end of the Almeida, where the military band plays sometimes in the evenings between the revolutions. Sir Captain Mitchell would pursue with portentous gravity the ill-timed end of that mule attracted attention to the unfortunate rider, His features were recognised by several deserters from the dictatorial army amongst the rascally mob already engaged in smashing the windows of the Intendencia. Early on the morning of that day, the local authorities of Sulaco had fled for refuge to the OSN's company officers, a strong building near the shore end of the jetty, leaving the town to the mercies of a revolutionary rabble and as the dictator was execrated by the populace on account of the severe recruitment law his necessities had compelled him to enforce during the struggle, he stood a good chance of being torn to pieces. Providentially, Nostromo, invaluable fellow, 
with some Italian workmen imported to work upon the National Central Railway, was at hand and managed to snatch him away, for the time at least. Ultimately, Captain Mitchell succeeded in taking everybody off in his own gig to one of the company's steamers. It was the Minerva, just then, as luck would have it, entering the harbour. He had to lower these gentlemen at the end of a rope out of a hole in the wall at the back, while the mob, which, pouring out of the town, had spread itself all along the shore, howled and foamed at the foot of the building in front. He had to hurry them then, the whole length of the jetty. It had been a desperate dash, neck or nothing, and again it was Nostromo, a fellow in a thousand, who, at the head this time of the company's body of lightermen, held the jetty against the rushes of the rabble, thus giving the fugitives time to reach the gig lying ready for them at the other end, with the company's flag at the stern. Sticks, stones, shots flew, knives too were thrown. Captain Mitchell exhibited willingly the long cicatrice of a cut over his left ear and temple, made by a razor blade fastened to a stick, a weapon, he explained, very much in favour with the worst kind of nigger out here. Captain Mitchell was a thick, elderly man, wearing high, pointed collars and short side whiskers, partial to white waistcoats, and really very communicative under his air of pompous reserve. These gentlemen, he would say, staring with great solemnity, had to run like rabbits, sir. I ran like a rabbit myself. Certain forms of death are um, distasteful to a um, respectable man. They would have pounded me to death, too. A crazy mob, sir, does not discriminate. Under Providence, we owed our preservation to my Capitaz de Cargadores, as they called him in the town. A man who, when I discovered his value, sir, was just the boatswain of an Italian ship, a big Genoese ship, one of the few European ships that ever came to Sulaco with a general cargo before the building of the National Central. He left her on account of some very respectable friends he made here, his own countrymen, but also, I suppose, to better himself. Sir, I am a pretty good judge of character. I engaged him to be the foreman of our lightermen and caretaker of our jetty. That's all that he was, but without him, Senor Ribera would have been a dead man. This Nostromo, sir, a man absolutely above reproach, became the terror of all the thieves in the town. We were infested, infested, overrun, sir, here at that time by ladrones and matreros, thieves and murderers from the whole province. On this occasion they had been flocking into Sulaco for a week past. They had scented the end, sir. Fifty percent of that murdering mob were professional bandits from the Campo, sir. But there wasn't one that hadn't heard of Nostromo. As to the town Lapero, sir, the sight of his black whiskers and white teeth was enough for them. They quailed before him, sir. That's what the force of character will do for you. It could very well be said that it was Nostromo alone who saved the lives of these gentlemen. Captain Mitchell, on his part, never left them till he had seen them collapse, panting, terrified and exasperated, but safe, on the luxuriant velvet sofas in the first-class saloon of the Minerva. To the very last, he had been careful to address the ex-dictator as Your Excellency. Sir, I could do no other. The man was down, ghastly, livid, one mass of scratches. The Minerva never let go her anchor, that call. The superintendent ordered her out of the harbour at once. No cargo could be landed, of course, and the passengers for Sulaco naturally refused to go ashore. They could hear the firing and see plainly the fight going on at the edge of the water. The repulsed mob devoted its energies to an attack upon the customs house, a dreary, unfinished-looking structure with many windows, 200 yards away from the OSN officers, and the only other building near the harbour. Captain Mitchell, after directing the commander of the Minerva to land these gentlemen in the first port of call outside Costaguana, went back in his gig to see what could be done for the protection of the company's property. That and the property of the railway were preserved by the European residents, that is, by Captain Mitchell himself and the staff of engineers building the road, aided by the Italian and Basque workmen who rallied faithfully round their English chiefs. 
The company's lightermen, too, natives of the Republic, behaved very well under their capitas. An outcast lot of very mixed blood, mainly Negroes, everlastingly at feud with the other customers of low grog shops in the town, they embraced with delight this opportunity to settle their personal scores under such favourable auspices. There was not one of them that had not at some time or other looked with terror at Nostromo's revolver poked very close at his face or been otherwise daunted by Nostromo's resolution. He was much of a man, their capitas was, they said, too scornful in his temper ever to utter abuse, a tireless taskmaster, and the more to be feared because of his aloofness. And behold, there he was that day, at their head, condescending to make jocular remarks to this man or the other. Such leadership was inspiriting, and in truth all the harm the mob managed to achieve was to set fire to one, only one, stack of railway sleepers, which, being creosoted, burned well. The main attack on the railway yards, on the OSN offices, and especially on the custom house, whose strong room, it was well known, contained a large treasure in silver ingots, failed completely. Even the little hotel kept by old Giorgio, standing alone halfway between the harbour and the town, escaped looting and destruction, not by a miracle, but because, with the safes in view, they had neglected it at first, and afterwards found no leisure to stop. Nostromo, with his cargadores, was pressing them too hard then. End of part first, The Silver of the Mine, chapter two. Part first of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad, The Silver of the Mine, chapter three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Part first, The Silver of the Mine, chapter three. It might have been said that there he was only protecting his own. From the first he had been admitted to live in the intimacy of the family of the hotel keeper, who was a countryman of his. Old Giorgio Viola, a Genoese with a shaggy white leonine head, often called simply the Garibaldino, as Mohammedans are called after their prophet, was, to use Captain Mitchell's own words, the respectable married friend by whose advice Nostromo had left his ship to try for a run of shore like in Costaguana. The old man, full of scorn for the populace, as your austere Republican so often is, had disregarded the preliminary sounds of trouble. He went on that day, as usual, pottering about the casa in his slippers, muttering angrily to himself his contempt of the non-political nature of the riot and shrugging his shoulders. In the end he was taken unaware by the outrush of the rabble. It was too late then to remove his family, and indeed where could he have run to with the portly Signora Teresa and two little girls on that great plain? So, barricading every opening... The old man sat down sternly in the middle of the darkened cafe with an old shotgun on his knees. His wife sat on another chair by his side, muttering pious invocations to all the saints of the calendar. The old Republican did not believe in saints or in prayers or in what he called priest's religion. Liberty and Garibaldi were his divinities, but he tolerated superstition in women preserving in these matters a lofty and silent attitude. His two girls, the eldest fourteen and the other two years younger, crouched on the sanded floor on each side of the Signora Teresa, with their heads on their mother's lap, both scared, but each in her own way, the dark-haired Linda, indignant and angry, the fair Giselle, the younger, bewildered and resigned. The Patrona removed her arms, which embraced her daughters, for a moment to cross herself and wring her hands hurriedly. She moaned a little louder. Oh, Gian Battista, why art thou not here? Oh, why art thou not here? She was not then invoking the saint himself, but calling upon Nostromo, whose patron he was. And Giorgio, motionless on the chair by her side, would be provoked by these reproachful and distracted appeals. Peace, woman, where's the sense of it? There's his duty, he murmured in the dark, and she would retort, panting, Eh? I have no patience. Duty? What of the woman who has been like a mother to him? 
I bent my knee to him this morning. Don't you go out, Gian Battista. Stop in the house, Battistino. Look at those two little innocent children. Mrs. Viola was an Italian too, a native of Spezia, and though considerably younger than her husband, already middle-aged. She had a handsome face, whose complexion had turned yellow because the climate of Sulaco did not suit her at all. Her voice was a rich contralto. When, with her arms folded tight under her ample bosom, she scolded the squat, thick-legged china girls handling linen, plucking fowls, pounding corn in wooden mortars amongst the mud outbuildings at the back of the house, she could bring out such an impassioned, vibrating, sepulchral note that the chained watchdog bolted into his kennel with a great rattle. Louis, a cinnamon-coloured mulatto with a sprouting moustache and thick, dark lips, would stop sweeping the café with a broom of palm leaves to let a gentle shudder run down his spine. His languishing arm and eyes would remain closed for a long time. This was the staff of the Casa Viola, but all these people had fled early that morning at the first sounds of the riot, preferring to hide on the plain rather than trust themselves in the house a preference for which they were in no way to blame, since, whether true or not, it was generally believed in the town that the Garibaldino had some money buried under the clay floor of the kitchen. The dog, an irritable, shaggy brute, barked violently and whined plaintively in turns at the back, running in and out of his kennel as rage or fear prompted him. Bursts of great shouting rose and died away like wild gusts of wind on the plain round the barricaded house. The fitful popping of shots grew louder above the yelling. Sometimes there were intervals of unaccountable stillness outside, and nothing could have been more gaily peaceful than the narrow, bright lines of sunlight from the cracks in the shutters ruled straight across the café over the disarranged chairs and tables to the wall opposite. Old Giorgio had chosen that bare, whitewashed room for a retreat. It had only one window, and its only door swung out upon the track of thick dust fenced by aloe hedges between the harbour and the town, where clumsy carts used to creak along behind slow yokes of oxen guided by boys on horseback. In a pause of stillness, Giorgio cocked his gun. The ominous sound rung a low moan from the rigid figure of the woman sitting by his side. A sudden outbreak of defiant yelling quite near the house sank all at once to a confused murmur of growls. Somebody ran along. The loud catching of his breath was heard for an instant passing the door. There were hoarse mutters and footsteps near the wall. A shoulder rubbed against the shutter, effacing the bright lines of sunshine penciled across the whole breadth of the room. Signora Teresa's arms, thrown about the kneeling forms of her daughters, embraced them closer with a convulsive pressure. The mob, driven away from the custom house, had broken up into several bands, retreating across the plain in the direction of the town. The subdued crash of irregular volleys fired in the distance was answered by faint yells far away. In the intervals, the single shots rang feebly, and the low, long white building blinded in every window, seemed to be the centre of a turmoil widening in a great circle about its closed-up silence. But the cautious movements and whispers of a routed party seeking a momentary shelter behind the wall made the darkness of the room, striped by threads of quiet sunlight, alight with evil, stealthy sounds. The violas had them in their ears as though invisible ghosts hovering about their chairs had consulted in mutters as to the advisability of setting fire to this foreigner's casa. It was trying to the nerves. Old Viola had risen slowly, gun in hand, irresolute, for he did not see how he could prevent them. Already voices could be heard talking at the back. Signora Teresa was beside herself with terror. Ah, the traitor, the traitor, she mumbled, almost inaudibly. Now we are going to be burnt, and I bent my knee to him. No, he must run at the heels of his English. She seemed to think that Nostromo's mere presence in the house would have made it perfectly safe. So far, she too was under the spell of that reputation the Capitas de Cargadores had made for himself by the waterside, along the railway line, with the English and with the populace of Sulaco. 
to his face, and even against her husband, she invariably affected to laugh it to scorn, sometimes good-naturedly, more often with a curious bitterness. But then women are unreasonable in their opinions, as Giorgio used to remark calmly on fitting occasions. On this occasion, with his gun held at ready before him, he stooped down to his wife's head and, keeping his eyes steadfastly on the barricaded door, he breathed out into her ear that Nostromo would have been powerless to help. What could two men shut up in a house do against twenty or more bent upon setting fire to the roof? Gian Battista was thinking of the casa all the time, he was sure. He think of the casa, he gasped Signora Viola crazily. She struck her breast with her open hands. I know him. He thinks of nobody but himself. A discharge of firearms nearby made her throw her head back and close her eyes. Old Giorgio set his teeth hard under his white moustache and his eyes began to roll fiercely. Several bullets struck the end of the wall together. Pieces of plaster could be heard falling outside. A voice screamed, Here they come! And after a moment of uneasy silence, there was a rush of running feet along the front. Then the tension of old Giorgio's attitude relaxed, and a smile of contemptuous relief came upon his lips of an old fighter with a leonine face. These were not a people striving for justice, but thieves. Even to defend his life against them was a sort of degradation for a man who had been one of Garibaldi's immortal thousand in the conquest of Sicily. He had an immense scorn for this outbreak of scoundrels and leperos who did not know the meaning of the word liberty. He grounded his old gun and, turning his head, glanced at the coloured lithograph of Garibaldi in a black frame on the white wall. A thread of strong sunshine cut it perpendicularly. His eyes, accustomed to the luminous twilight, made out the high colouring of the face, the red of the shirt, the outlines of the square shoulders, the black patch of the Bersaglier hat with cock's feathers curling over the crown. An immortal hero. This was your liberty. It gave you not only life, but immortality as well. For that one man, his fanaticism had suffered no diminution. In the moment of relief from the apprehension of the greatest danger perhaps his family had been exposed to in all their wanderings, he had turned to the picture of his old chief, first and only, then laid his hand on his wife's shoulder. The children kneeling on the floor had not moved. Signora Teresa opened her eyes a little, as though he had awakened her from a very deep and dreamless slumber. Before he had time in his deliberate way to say a reassuring word, she jumped up with the children clinging to her, one on each side, gasped for breath and let out a hoarse shriek. It was simultaneous with the bang of a violent blow struck on the outside of the shutter. They could hear suddenly the snorting of a horse, the restive tramping of hoofs on the narrow hard path in front of the house. The toe of a boot struck at the shutter again. A spur jingled at every blow, and an excited voice shouted, Hola! Hola! In there! End of Part First The Silver of the Mine Chapter 3「Part First of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad, The Silver of the Mine, Chapter Four. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part First, The Silver of the Mine, Chapter Four. All the morning Nostromo had kept his eye from afar on the Casa Fiola, even in the thick of the hottest scrimmage near the custom house. If I see smoke rising over there, he thought to himself, they are lost. Directly the mob had broken, he pressed with a small band of Italian workmen in that direction, which, indeed, was the shortest line towards the town. That part of the rabble he was pursuing seemed to think of making a stand under the house. A volley fired by his followers from behind an aloe hedge made the rascals fly. In a gap chopped out for the rails of the harbour branch line, Nostromo appeared, mounted on his silver-grey mare. He shouted, sent after them one shot from his revolver, and galloped up to the café window. He had an idea that old Giorgio would choose that part of the house for a refuge. His voice had penetrated to them, sounding breathlessly hurried, Hola, Vecchio! Old Vecchio! Is it all well with you in there? 
You see, murmured old Viola to his wife. Signor Teresa was silent now. Outside, Nostromo laughed. I can hear the padrona is not dead. You have done your best to kill me with fear, cried Signor Teresa. She wanted to say something more, but her voice failed her. Linda raised her eyes to her face for a moment, but old Giorgio shouted apologetically, She is a little upset. Outside, Nostromo shouted back with another laugh, She cannot upset me. Signor Teresa found her voice. It is what I say. You have no heart and you have no conscience, Gian Battista. They heard him wheel his horse away from the shutters. The party he led were babbling excitedly in Italian and Spanish, inciting each other to the pursuit. He put himself at their head, crying, Avanti! He has not stopped very long with us. There is no praise from strangers to be got here. Signor Teresa said tragically, Avanti, yes, that is all he cares for, to be first somewhere, somehow, to be the first with these English. They will be showing him to everybody. This is our Nostromo. She laughed ominously. What a name. What is that? Nostromo. He would take a name that is properly no word from them. Meantime, Giorgio, with tranquil movements, had been unfastening the door. The flood of light fell on Signora Teresa with her two girls gathered to her side, a picturesque woman in a pose of maternal exaltation. Behind her the wall was dazzlingly white, and the crude colours of the Garibaldi lithograph paled in the sunshine. Old Viola at the door moved his arm upwards as if referring all his quick, fleeting thoughts to the picture of his old chief on the wall. Even when he was cooking for the Signori Inglesi, the engineers. He was a famous cook, though the kitchen was a dark place. He was, as it were, under the eye of the great man who had led him in a glorious struggle where, under the walls of Gaeta, tyranny would have expired forever had it not been for that accursed Piedmontese race of kings and ministers. When sometimes a frying pan caught fire during a delicate operation with some shredded onions, and the old man was seen backing out of the doorway, swearing and coughing violently in an acrid cloud of smoke, the name of Cavour, the arch-intriguer sold to kings and tyrants, could be heard involved in imprecations against the China girls, cooking in general, and the brute of a country where he was reduced to live for the love of liberty that traitor had strangled. Then Signor Teresa, all in black, issuing from another door, advanced, portly and anxious, inclining her fine black-browed head, opening her arms and crying in a profound tone, Giorgio, thou passionate man, misericordia divina, in the sun like this he will make himself ill. At her feet the hens made off in all directions with immense strides. If there were any engineers from up the line staying in Salaco, a young English face or two would appear at the billiard room occupying one end of the house. But at the other end, in the café, Louis, the mulatto, took good care not to show himself. The Indian girls, with hair like flowing black manes and dressed only in a shift and short petticoat, stared dully from under the square-cut fringes on their foreheads. The noisy frizzling of fat had stopped, the fumes floated upwards in sunshine, a strong smell of burnt onions hung in the drowsy heat enveloping the house, and the eye lost itself in a vast, flat expanse of grass to the west, as if the plain between the Sierra overtopping Sulaco and the coast range away there towards Esmeralda had been as big as half the world. Signora Teresa, after an impressive pause, remonstrated, Eh, Giorgio, leave Cavour alone and take care of yourself now we are lost in this country, all alone with the two children, because you cannot live under a king. And while she looked at him, she would sometimes put her hand hastily to her side, with a short twitch of her fine lips, and a knitting of her black straight eyebrows like a flicker of angry pain, or an angry thought on her handsome regular features. It was pain. She suppressed the twinge. It had come to her first a few years after they had left Italy to emigrate to America and settle at last in Sulaco after wandering from town to town, trying shopkeeping in a small way here and there, a 
and once an organised enterprise of fishing in Maldonada, for Giorgio, like the great Garibaldi, had been a sailor in his time. Sometimes she had no patience with pain. For years its gnawing had been part of the landscape embracing the glitter of the harbour under the wooded spurs of the range. And the sunshine itself was heavy and dull, heavy with pain, not like the sunshine of her girlhood in which middle-aged Giorgio had wooed her gravely and passionately on the shores of the Gulf of Spezia. You go in at once, Giorgio, she directed. One will think you do not wish to have any pity on me with four signori inglesi staying in the house. Va bene, va bene, Giorgio would mutter. He obeyed. The signori inglesi would require their midday meal presently. He had been one of the immortal and invincible band of liberators who had made the mercenaries of tyranny fly like chaff before a hurricane, un uragano terribile. But that was before he was married and had children, and before tyranny had reared its head again amongst the traitors who had imprisoned Garibaldi, his hero. There were three doors in the front of the house, and each afternoon the Garibaldino could be seen at one or another of them with his big bush of white hair, his arms folded, his legs crossed, leaning back his leonine head against the side and looking up the wooded slopes of the foothills at the snowy dome of Higuerota. The front of his house threw off a black long rectangle of shade, broadening slowly over the soft ox-cart track. Through the gaps, chopped out in the oleander hedges, the harbour branch railway laid out temporarily on the level of the plain, curved away its shining parallel ribbons on a belt of scorched and withered grass within sixty yards of the end of the house. In the evening, the empty material trains of flat cars circled round the dark green grove of Salaco and ran, undulating slightly with white jets of steam, over the plain towards the Casa Viola, on their way to the railway yards by the harbour. The Italian drivers saluted him from the footplate with raised hand, while the negro brakesmen sat carelessly on the brakes, looking straight forward with the rims of their big hats flapping in the wind. In return, Giorgio would give a slight sideways jerk of the head without unfolding his arms. On this memorable day of the riot, his arms were not folded on his chest, his hand grasped the barrel of the gun grounded on the threshold. He did not look up once at the white dome of Higuerota, whose cool purity seemed to hold itself aloof from a hot earth. His eyes examined the plain curiously. Tall trails of dust subsided here and there. In a speckless sky the sun hung clear and blinding. Knots of men ran headlong, others made a stand, and the irregular rattle of firearms came rippling to his ears in the fiery, still air. Single figures on foot raced desperately. Horsemen galloped towards each other, wheeled round together, separated at speed. Giorgio saw one fall, rider and horse, disappearing as if they had galloped into a chasm, and the movements of the animated scene were like the passages of a violent game played upon the plain by dwarfs mounted and on foot, yelling with tiny throats under the mountain that seemed a colossal embodiment of silence. Never before had Giorgio seen this bit of plain so full of active life. His gaze could not take in all its details at once. He shaded his eyes with his hand, till suddenly the thundering of many hoofs nearby startled him. A troop of horses had broken out of the fenced paddock of the railway company. They came on like a whirlwind and dashed over the line, snorting, kicking, squealing in a compact, piebald, tossing mob of bay, brown, grey backs, eyes staring, necks extended, nostrils red, long tails streaming. As soon as they had leapt upon the road, the thick dust flew upwards from under their hoofs, and within six yards of Giorgio only a brown cloud with vague forms of necks and croppers rolled by, making the soil tremble on its passage. Viola coughed, turning his face away from the dust and shaking his head slightly. There will be some horse-catching to be done before tonight, he muttered. In the square of sunlight falling through the door, Signora Teresa, kneeling before the chair, had bowed her head, 
heavy with a twisted mass of ebony hair streaked with silver into the palm of her hands. The black lace shawl she used to drape about her face had dropped to the ground by her side. The two girls had got up, hand in hand, in short skirts, their loose hair falling in disorder. The younger had thrown her arm across her eyes, as if afraid to face the light. Linda, with her hand on the other's shoulder, stared fearlessly. Viola looked at his children. The sun brought out the deep lines on his face, and, energetic in expression, it had the immobility of a carving. It was impossible to discover what he thought. Bushy grey eyebrows shaded his dark glance. Well, and do you not pray like your mother? Linda pouted, advancing her red lips, which were almost too red, but she had admirable eyes, brown, with a sparkle of gold in the irises, full of intelligence and meaning, and so clear that they seemed to throw a glow upon her thin, colourless face. There were bronze glints in the sombre clusters of her hair, and the eyelashes, long and cold black, made her complexion appear still more pale. Mother is going to offer up a lot of candles in the church. She always does when Nostromo has been away fighting. I shall have some to carry up to the chapel of the Madonna in the cathedral. She said all this quickly, with great assurance, in an animated, penetrating voice. Then, giving her sister's shoulder a slight shake, she added, And she will be made to carry one, too. Why maid? inquired Giorgio gravely. Does she not want to? She is timid, said Linda, with a little burst of laughter. People notice her fair hair as she goes along with us. They call out after her. Look at the rubia! Look at the rubia cita! They call out in the streets. She is timid. And you? You are not timid, eh? The father pronounced slowly. She tossed back all her dark hair. Nobody calls out after me. Old Giorgio contemplated his children thoughtfully. There was two years' difference between them. They had been born to him late, years after the boy had died. Had he lived, he who would have been nearly as old as Gian Battista, he whom the English called Nostromo, but as to his daughters, the severity of his temper, his advancing age, his absorption in his memories, had prevented his taking much notice of them. He loved his children, but girls belong more to the mother, and much of his affection had been expended in the worship and service of liberty. When quite a youth he had deserted from a ship trading to La Plata to enlist in the navy of Montevideo, then under the command of Garibaldi. Afterwards, in the Italian legion of the Republic, struggling against the encroaching tyranny of Rosas, he had taken part on great plains, on the banks of immense rivers, in the fiercest fighting perhaps the world had ever known, he had lived amongst men who had declaimed about liberty, suffered for liberty, died for liberty, with a desperate exultation and with their eyes turned towards an oppressed Italy. His own enthusiasm had been fed on scenes of carnage, on the examples of lofty devotion, on the din of armed struggle, on the inflamed language of proclamations. He had never parted from the chief of his choice, the fiery apostle of independence, keeping by his side in America and in Italy till after the fatal day of Aspromonte, when the treachery of kings, emperors and ministers had been revealed to the world in the wounding and imprisonment of his hero. A catastrophe that had instilled into him a gloomy doubt of ever being able to understand the ways of divine justice. He did not deny it, however. It required patience, he would say. Though he disliked priests and would not put his foot inside a church for anything, he believed in God. Were not the proclamations against tyrants addressed to the peoples in the name of God and liberty? God for men, religions for women, he muttered sometimes. In Sicily, an Englishman who had turned up in Palermo after its evacuation by the army of the king had given him a Bible in Italian the publication of the British and Foreign Bible Society, bound in a dark leather cover. In periods of political adversity, in the pauses of silence when the revolutionists issued no proclamations, 
Giorgio earned his living with the first work that came to hand, as sailor, as dock labourer on the quays of Genoa, once as a hand on a farm in the hills above Spezia, and in his spare time he studied the thick volume. He carried it with him into battles. Now it was his only reading, and in order not to be deprived of it, the print was small, he had consented to accept the present of a pair of silver-mounted spectacles from Signora Emilia Gould, the wife of the Englishman who managed the silver mine in the mountains three leagues from the town. She was the only Englishwoman in Sulaco. Giorgio Viola had a great consideration for the English. This feeling, born on the battlefields of Uruguay, was forty years old at the very least. Several of them had poured their blood for the cause of freedom in America, and the first he had ever known he remembered by the name of Samuel. He commanded a Negro company under Garibaldi during the famous siege of Montevideo, and died heroically with his Negroes at the fording of the Boyana. He, Giorgio, had reached the rank of Ensign Alferes and cooked for the general. Later, in Italy, he, with the rank of lieutenant, rode with the staff and still cooked for the general. He had cooked for him in Lombardy through the whole campaign. On the march to Rome, he had lassoed his beef in the Campania after the American manner. He had been wounded in the defence of the Roman Republic. He was one of the four fugitives who, with the general, carried out of the woods the inanimate body of the general's wife into the farmhouse where she died, exhausted by the hardships of that terrible retreat. He had survived that disastrous time to attend his general in Palermo when Neapolitan shells from the castle crashed upon the town. He had cooked for him on the field of Volturno after fighting all day, and everywhere he had seen Englishmen in the front rank of the army of freedom. He respected their nation because they loved Garibaldi. Their very countesses and princesses had kissed the general's hands in London, it was said. He could well believe it, for the nation was noble, and the man was a saint. It was enough to look once at his face to see the divine force of faith in him and his great pity for all that was poor, suffering and oppressed in this world. The spirit of self-forgetfulness, the simple devotion to a vast humanitarian idea which inspired the thought and stress of that revolutionary time, had left its mark upon Giorgio in a sort of austere contempt for all personal advantage. This man, whom the lowest classes in Sulaco suspected of having a buried hoard in his kitchen, had all his life despised money. The leaders of his youth had lived poor, had died poor. It had been a habit of his mind to disregard tomorrow. It was engendered partly by an existence of excitement, adventure and wild warfare, but mostly it was a matter of principle. It did not resemble the carelessness of a condottiere. It was a puritanism of conduct born of stern enthusiasm like the puritanism of religion. This stern devotion to a cause had cast a gloom upon Giorgio's old age. It cast a gloom because the cause seemed lost. Too many kings and emperors flourished yet in the world which God had meant for the people. He was sad because of his simplicity. Though always ready to help his countrymen, and greatly respected by the Italian emigrants wherever he lived, in his exile he called it, he could not conceal from himself that they cared nothing for the wrongs of downtrodden nations. They listened to his tales of war readily, but seemed to ask themselves what he had got out of it after all. There was nothing that they could see. We wanted nothing, we suffered for the love of all humanity, he cried out furiously sometimes, and the powerful voice, the blazing eyes, the shaking of the white mane, the brown sinewy hand pointing upwards as if to call heaven to witness, impressed his hearers. After the old man had broken off abruptly with a jerk of the head and a movement of the arm, meaning clearly, but what's the good of talking to you, they nudged each other. There was in old Giorgio an energy of feeling, a personal quality of conviction, something they called terribilita, an old lion, they used to say of him. Some slight incidents, a chance word, would set him off, talking on the beach to the Italian fisherman of Maldonado, in the little shop he kept afterwards, in Valparaiso, to his countrymen customers. 
of an evening suddenly in the cafe at one end of the Casa Fiola, the other was reserved for the English engineers, to the select clientele of engine drivers and foremen of the railway shops. With their handsome, bronzed, lean faces, shiny black ringlets, glistening eyes, broad-chested, bearded, sometimes a tiny gold ring in the lobe of the ear, the aristocracy of the railway works listened to him, turning away from their cards or dominoes. Here and there a fair-haired Basque studied his hand, meantime, waiting without protest. No native of Costaguana intruded there. This was the Italian stronghold. Even the Sulaco policemen on a night patrol let their horses pace softly by, bending low in the saddle to glance through the window at the heads in a fog of smoke, and the drone of old Giorgio's declamatory narrative seemed to sink behind them into the plain. Only now and then the assistant of the chief of police, some broad-faced, brown little gentleman with a great deal of Indian in him, would put in an appearance. Leaving his man outside with the horses, he advanced with a confident sly smile and without a word up to the long trestle table. He pointed to one of the bottles on the shelf. Giorgio, thrusting his pipe into his mouth abruptly, served him in person. Nothing would be heard but the slight jingle of the spurs. His glass emptied, he would take a leisurely, scrutinising look all round the room, go out and ride away slowly, circling towards the town. End of part first. The Silver of the Mine. Chapter 4. Part first of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad. The Silver of the Mine, Chapter 5 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Part 1st, The Silver of the Mine, Chapter 5 In this way only was the power of the local authorities vindicated amongst the great body of strong-limbed foreigners who dug the earth, blasted the rocks, drove the engines for the progressive and patriotic undertaking in these very words, eighteen months before, the excellentissimo Signor Don Vincente Ribiera, the dictator of Costaguana, had described the National Central Railway in his great speech at the turning of the first sod. He had come on purpose to Sulaco, and there was a one o'clock dinner party, a convite offered by the OSN company on board the Juno after the function on shore. Captain Mitchell had himself steered the cargo lighter, all draped with flags, which, in tow of the Juno's steam launch, took the Excellentissimo from the jetty to the ship. Everybody of note in Sulaco had been invited. The one or two foreign merchants, all the representatives of the old Spanish families then in town, the great owners of the estates on the plain, grave, courteous, simple men, caballeros of pure descent, with small hands and feet, conservative, hospitable and kind. The Occidental province was their stronghold. Their Blanco party had triumphed now. It was their presidential dictator, a Blanco of the Blancos, who sat smiling urbanely between the representatives of two friendly foreign powers. They had come with him from Santa Marta to countenance by their presence the enterprise in which the capital of their countries was engaged. The only lady of that company was Mrs Gould, the wife of Don Carlos, the administrator of the San Tome silver mine. The ladies of Sulaco were not advanced enough to take part in the public life to that extent. They had come out strongly at the great ball at the Intendencia the evening before, but Mrs Gould alone had appeared, a bright spot in the group of black coats behind the President Dictator, on the crimson cloth-covered stage erected under a shady tree on the shore of the harbour, where the ceremony of turning the first sod had taken place. She had come off in the cargo lighter, full of notabilities, sitting under the flutter of gay flags, in the place of honour by the side of Captain Mitchell, who steered, and her clear dress gave the only truly festive note to the sombre gathering in the long, gorgeous saloon of the Juno. The head of the chairman of the railway board, from London, 
handsome and pale in a silvery mist of white hair and clipped beard, hovered near her shoulder, attentive, smiling and fatigued. The journey from London to Santa Marta in mailboats and the special carriages of the Santa Marta coastline, the only railway so far, had been tolerable, even pleasant, quite tolerable. But the trip over the mountains to Salaco was another sort of experience, in an old diligencia over impassable roads skirting awful precipices. We have been upset twice in one day on the brink of very deep ravines, he was telling Mrs Gould in an undertone. And when we arrived here at last, I don't know what we should have done without your hospitality. What an out-of-the-way place Sulaco is, and for a harbour, too, astonishing. Ah, but we are very proud of it. It used to be historically important. The highest ecclesiastical court for two viceroyalties sat here in the olden times, she instructed him with animation. I am impressed. I didn't mean to be disparaging. You seem very patriotic. The place is lovable, if only by its situation. Perhaps you don't know what an old resident I am. How old, I wonder, he murmured, looking at her with a slight smile. Mrs Gould's appearance was made youthful by the mobile intelligence of her face. We can't give you your ecclesiastical court back again, but you shall have more steamers, a railway, a telegraph cable, a future in the great world which is worth infinitely more than any amount of ecclesiastical past. You shall be brought in touch with something far greater than two vice royalties. But I had no notion that a place on a sea coast could remain so isolated from the world. If it had been a thousand miles inland now, most remarkable. Has anything ever happened here for a hundred years before today? While he talked in a slow, humorous tone, she kept her little smile. Agreeing, ironically, she assured him that certainly not, nothing ever happened in Sulaco. Even the revolutions, of which there had been two in her time, had respected the repose of the place. Their course ran in the more populous southern parts of the Republic, and the great valley of Santa Marta, which was like one great battlefield of the parties, with the possession of the capital for a prize and an outlet to another ocean. They were more advanced over there. Here in Sulaco they heard only the echoes of these great questions, and, of course, their official world changed each time, coming to them over their rampart of mountains, which he himself had traversed in an old diligencia with such a risk to life and limb. The chairman of the railway had been enjoying her hospitality for several days, and he was really grateful for it. It was only since he had left Santa Marta that he had utterly lost touch with the feeling of European life on the background of his exotic surroundings. In the capital he had been the guest of the legation, and had been kept busy negotiating with the members of Don Vicente's government, cultured men, men to whom the conditions of civilised business were not unknown. What concerned him most of the time was the acquisition of land for the railway. In the Santa Marta Valley, where there was already one line in existence, the people were tractable, and it was only a matter of price. A commission had been nominated to fix the values, and the difficulty resolved itself into the judicious influencing of the commissioners. But in Sulaco, the Occidental province for whose very development the railway was intended, there had been trouble. It had been lying for ages, ensconced behind its natural barriers, repelling modern enterprise by the precipices of its mountain range, by its shallow harbour opening into the everlasting calms of a gulf full of clouds, by the benighted state of mind of the owners of its fertile territory, all these aristocratic old Spanish families, all those Don Ambrosios this and Don Fernandos that, who seemed actually to dislike and distrust the coming of the railway over their lands. It had happened that some of the surveying parties scattered all over the province had been warned off with threats of violence, in other cases, outrageous pretensions as to price had been raised. But the man of railways prided himself on being equal to every emergency. Since he was met by the inimical sentiment of blind conservatism in Sulaco, he would meet it by sentiment too, before taking his stand on his right alone. 
The government was bound to carry out its part of the contract with the board of the new railway company, even if it had to use force for the purpose. But he desired nothing less than an armed disturbance in the smooth working of his plans. They were much too vast and far-reaching, and too promising to leave a stone unturned. And so he imagined to get the President Dictator over there on a tour of ceremonies and speeches, culminating in a great function at the turning of the first sod by the harbour shore. After all, he was their own creature, that Don Vincente. He was the embodied triumph of the best elements in the state. These were facts, and unless facts meant nothing, Sir John argued to himself, such a man's influence must be real, and his personal action would produce the conciliatory effect he required. He had succeeded in arranging the trip with the help of a very clever advocate who was known in Santa Marta as the agent of the Gould Silver Mine, the biggest thing in Sulaco and even in the whole Republic. It was, indeed, a fabulously rich mine. Its so-called agent, evidently a man of culture and ability, seemed without official position to possess an extraordinary influence in the highest government spheres. He was able to assure Sir John that the President Dictator would make the journey. He regretted, however, in the course of the same conversation, that General Montero insisted upon going too. General Montero, whom the beginning of the struggle had found an obscure army captain employed on the wild eastern frontier of the state, had thrown in his lot with the Ribiera party at a moment when special circumstances had given that small adhesion a fortuitous importance. The fortunes of war served him marvellously, and the victory of Rio Seco, after a day of desperate fighting, put a seal to his success. At the end he emerged general, minister of war and the military head of the Blanco party, although there was nothing aristocratic in his descent. Indeed, it was said that he and his brother, orphans, had been brought up by the munificence of a famous European traveller in whose servants their father had lost his life. Another story was that their father had been nothing but a charcoal burner in the woods and their mother a baptised Indian woman from the far interior. However that might be, the Costaguana press was in the habit of styling Montero's forest march from his commandancia to join the Blanco forces at the beginning of the Troubles the most heroic military exploit of modern times. About the same time, too, his brother had turned up from Europe, where he had gone, apparently, as secretary to a consul. Having, however, collected a small band of outlaws, he showed some talent as guerrilla chief and had been rewarded at the pacification by the post of military commandant of the capital. The minister of war then accompanied the dictator. The board of the OSN company, working hand in hand with the railway people for the good of the Republic, had on this important occasion instructed Captain Mitchell to put the mailboat Juno at the disposal of the distinguished party. Don Vincente, journeying south from Santa Marta, had embarked at Caita, the principal port of Costaguana, and came to Sulaco by sea but the chairman of the railway company had courageously crossed the mountains in a ramshackle diligencia, mainly for the purpose of meeting his engineer-in-chief engaged in the final survey of the road. For all the indifference of a man of affairs to nature, whose hostility can always be overcome by the resources of finance, he could not help being impressed by his surroundings during his halt at the surveying camp established at the highest point his railway was to reach. He spent the night there, arriving just too late to see the last dying glow of sunlight upon the snowy flank of Higuerota. Pillared masses of black basalt framed like an open portal, a portion of the white field lying aslant against the west. In the transparent air of the high altitudes everything seemed very near, steeped in a clear stillness as in an imponderable liquid, and with his ear ready to catch the first sound of the expected diligencia, the engineer-in-chief, at the door of a hut of rough stones, had contemplated the changing hues on the enormous side of the mountain, thinking that, in this sight, 
as in a piece of inspired music, there could be found together the utmost delicacy of shaded expression and a stupendous magnificence of effect. Sir John arrived too late to hear the magnificent and inaudible strain sung by the sunset amongst the high peaks of the Sierra. It had sung itself out into the breathless pause of deep dusk before, climbing down the forewheel of the diligencia with stiff limbs, he shook hands with the engineer. They gave him his dinner in a stone hut like a cubical boulder with no door or windows in its two openings. A bright fire of sticks brought on muleback from the first valley below, burning outside, sent in a wavering glare, and two candles in tin candlesticks, lighted, it was explained to him, in his honour, stood on a sort of rough camp table at which he sat on the right hand of the chief. He knew how to be amiable, and the young men of the engineering staff, for whom the surveying of the railway track had the glamour of the first steps on the path of life, sat there too, listening modestly, with their smooth faces tanned by the weather, and very pleased to witness so much affability in so great a man. Afterwards, late at night, pacing to and fro outside, he had a long talk with his chief engineer. He knew him well of old. This was not the first undertaking in which their gifts, as elementally different as fire and water, had worked in conjunction. From the contact of these two personalities, who had not the same vision of the world, there was generated a power for the world's service, a subtle force that could set in motion mighty machines, men's muscles, and awaken also in human breast an unbounded devotion to the task. Of the young fellows at the table to whom the survey of the track was like the tracing of the path of life, more than one would be called to meet death before the work was done. But the work would be done. The force would be almost as strong as faith. Not quite, however. In the silence of the sleeping camp upon the moonlit plateau forming the top of the pass like the floor of a vast arena surrounded by the basalt walls of precipices, two strolling figures in thick ulsters stood still and the voice of the engineer pronounced distinctly the words We can't move mountains. Sir John, raising his head to follow the pointing gesture, felt the full force of the words. The white Higuerata soared out of the shadows of rock and earth like a frozen bubble under the moon. All was still, till nearby, behind the wall of a corral for the camp animals, built roughly of loose stones in the form of a circle, a pack mule stamped his forefoot and blew heavily twice. The engineer-in-chief had used the phrase in answer to the chairman's tentative suggestion that the tracing of the line could, perhaps, be altered in deference to the prejudices of the Sulaco landowners. The chief engineer believed that the obstinacy of men was the lesser obstacle. Moreover, to combat that, they had the great influence of Charles Gould, whereas tunnelling under Higuerotta would have been a colossal undertaking. Ah, yes, Gould. What sort of man is he? Sir John had heard much of Charles Gould in Santa Marta and wanted to know more. The engineer-in-chief assured him that the administrator of the San Tome silver mine had an immense influence over all these Spanish dons. He had also one of the best houses in Sulaco, and the Gould hospitality was beyond all praise. They received me as if they had known me for years, he said. The little lady is kindness personified. I stayed with them for a month. He helped me to organise the surveying parties. His practical ownership of the San Tome silver mine gives him a special position. He seems to have the ear of every provincial authority, apparently, and, as I said, he can wind all the hidalgos of the province round his little finger. If you follow his advice, the difficulties will fall away because he wants the railway. Of course, you must be careful in what you say. He's English, and besides, he must be immensely wealthy. The Holroyd house is in with him in that mine, so you may imagine. He interrupted himself as, from before one of the little fires burning outside the low wall of the corral, arose the figure of a man wrapped in a poncho up to the neck. The saddle which he had been using for a pillow made a dark patch on the ground against the red glow of embers. 
I shall see Holroyd myself on my way back through the state, said Sir John. I've ascertained that he, too, wants the railway. The man, who, perhaps disturbed by the proximity of the voices, had arisen from the ground, struck a match to light a cigarette. The flame showed a bronzed, black-whiskered face, a pair of eyes gazing straight, then rearranging his wrappings, he sank full length and laid his head again on the saddle. That's our campmaster, whom I must send back to Salaco. now we are going to carry our survey into the Santa Marta Valley, said the engineer. A most useful fellow lent to me by Captain Mitchell of the OSN Company. It was very good of Mitchell. Charles Gould told me I couldn't do better than take advantage of the offer. He seemed to know how to rule all these muleteers and peons. We had not the slightest trouble with our people. He shall escort your diligentsia right into Salaco with some of our railway peons. The road is bad. To have him at hand may save you an upset or two. He promised me to take care of your person all the way down as if you were his father. This camp master was the Italian sailor whom all the Europeans in Salaco, following Captain Mitchell's mispronunciation, were in the habit of calling Nostromo. And indeed, taciturn and ready, he did take excellent care of his charge at the bad parts of the road, as Sir John himself acknowledged to Mrs Gould afterwards. End of Part First The Silver of the Mine Chapter 5Part first of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad, The Silver of the Mine, Chapter 6, Section 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part first, The Silver of the Mine, Chapter 6, Section 1. At that time Nostromo had been already long enough in the country to raise to the highest pitch Captain Mitchell's opinion of the extraordinary value of his discovery. Clearly he was one of those invaluable subordinates whom, to possess, is a legitimate cause of boasting. Captain Mitchell plumed himself upon his eye for men, but he was not selfish, and in the innocence of his pride was already developing that mania for lending you my capataz de cargadores, which was to bring Nostromo into personal contact, sooner or later, with every European in Sulaco as a sort of universal factotum, a prodigy of efficiency in his own sphere of life. The fellow is devoted to me, body and soul, Captain Mitchell was given to affirm, and though nobody perhaps could have explained why it should be so, it was impossible, on a survey of their relation, to throw doubt on that statement, unless indeed one were a bitter, eccentric character like Dr. Monaghan, for instance, whose short, hopeless laugh expressed somehow an immense mistrust of mankind. Not that Dr. Monaghan was a prodigal either of laughter or of words. He was bitterly taciturn when at his best. At his worst, people feared the open scornfulness of his tongue. Only Mrs. Gould could keep his unbelief in men's motives within due bounds. But even to her, on an occasion not connected with Nostromo, and in a tone which for him was gentle, even to her he had once said, Really, it is most unreasonable to demand that a man should think of other people so much better than he is able to think of himself. And Mrs Gould had hastened to drop the subject. There were strange rumours of the English doctor. Years ago, in the time of Gutzman Bento, he had been mixed up, it was whispered, in a conspiracy which was betrayed and, as people expressed it, drowned in blood. His hair had turned grey. His hairless seamed face was of a brick dust colour. The large check pattern of his flannel shirt and his old stained Panama hat were an established defiance to the conventionalities of Sulaco. Had it not been for the immaculate cleanliness of his apparel, he might have been taken for one of those shiftless Europeans that are a moral eyesore to the respectability of a foreign colony in almost every exotic part of the world. The young ladies of Sulaco adorning with clusters of pretty faces the balconies along the street of the Constitution, when they saw him pass with his limping gait and bowed head, a short linen jacket drawn on carelessly over the flannel check shirt, would remark to each other, Here is the senior doctor going to call on Donna Amelia. He has got his little coat on. 
the inference was true. Its deeper meaning was hidden from their simple intelligence. Moreover, they expended no store of thought on the doctor. He was old, ugly, learned, and a little loco, mad, if not a bit of a sorcerer, as the common people suspected him of being. The little white jacket was in reality a concession to Mrs Gould's humanising influence. The doctor, with his habit of sceptical, bitter speech, had no other means of showing his profound respect for the character of the woman who was known in the country as the English Senora. He presented this tribute very seriously indeed. It was no trifle for a man of his habits. Mrs Gould felt that too perfectly. She would never have thought of imposing upon him this marked show of deference. She kept her old Spanish house, one of the finest specimens in Sulaco, open for the dispensation of the small graces of existence. She dispensed them with simplicity and charm because she was guided by an alert perception of values. She was highly gifted in the art of human intercourse, which consists in delicate shades of self-forgetfulness and in the suggestion of universal comprehension. Charles Gould, the Gould family, established in Costaguana for three generations, always went to England for their education and for their wives, imagined that he had fallen in love with a girl's sound common sense like any other man. But these were not exactly the reasons why, for instance, the whole surveying camp, from the youngest of the young men to their mature chief, should have found occasion to allude to Mrs Gould's house so frequently amongst the high peaks of the Sierra. She would have protested that she had done nothing for them, with a low laugh and a surprised widening of her grey eyes, had anybody told her how convincingly she was remembered on the edge of the snow line above Sulaco. But directly, with a little capable air of setting her wits to work, she would have found an explanation. Of course, it was such a surprise for these boys to find any sort of welcome here, and I suppose they are homesick. I suppose everybody must be always just a little homesick. She was always sorry for homesick people. Born in the country, as his father before him, spare and tall, with a flaming moustache, a neat chin, clear blue eyes, auburn hair, and a thin, fresh red face, Charles Gould looked like a new arrival from over the sea. His grandfather had fought in the cause of independence under Bolivar in that famous English legion which on the battlefield of Carabobo had been saluted by the great liberator as saviours of his country. One of Charles Gould's uncles had been the elected president of that very province of Sulaco, then called a state, in the days of federation, and afterwards had been put up against the wall of a church and shot by the order of the barbarous unionist general Gutzman Bento. It was the same Gutzman Bento who, becoming later perpetual president, famed for his ruthless and cruel tyranny, readied his apotheosis in the popular legend of a sanguinary land-haunting spectre whose body had been carried off by the devil in person from the brick mausoleum in the nave of the Church of Assumption in Santa Marta. Thus, at least, the priests explained its disappearance to the barefooted multitude that streamed in, awestruck, to gaze at the hole in the side of the ugly box of bricks before the great altar. Gutzman Bento of cruel memory had put to death great numbers of people besides Charles Gould's uncle, but with a relative martyred in the cause of aristocracy, the Sulaco oligarchs, this was the phraseology of Gutzman Bento's time, now they were called Blancos and had given up the federal idea, which meant the families of pure Spanish descent, considered Charles as one of themselves. With such a family record, no one could be more of a Costaguanero than Don Carlos Gould, but his aspect was so characteristic that in the talk of the common people he was just the Inglés, the Englishman of Sulaco. He looked more English than a casual tourist, a sort of heretic pilgrim, however, quite unknown in Sulaco. He looked more English than the last arrived batch of young railway engineers, than anybody out of the hunting field pictures in the numbers of punch reaching his wife's drawing room two months or so after date. It astonished you to hear him talk Spanish, Castilian as the natives say, or the Indian dialect of the country people so naturally. His accent had never been English, 
But there was something so indelible in all these ancestral ghouls, liberators, explorers, coffee planters, merchants, revolutionists of Costa Guana, that he, the only representative of the third generation in a continent possessing its own style of horsemanship, went on looking thoroughly English even on horseback. This is not said of him in a mocking spirit of the Llaneros, men of the Great Plains, who think that no one in the world knows how to sit a horse but themselves. Charles Gould, to use the suitably lofty phrase, rode like a centaur. Riding for him was not a special form of exercise. It was a natural faculty, as walking straight is to all men sound of mind and limb. But all the same, when cantering beside the rutty ox-cart track to the mine, he looked in his English clothes and with his imported saddlery as though he had come this moment to Costaguana at his easy, swift passo trotte straight out of some green meadow at the other side of the world. His way would lie along the old Spanish road, the Camino Real of popular speech, the only remaining vestige of a fact and name left by that royalty old Giorgio Viola hated and whose very shadow had departed from the land for the big equestrian statue of Charles IV at the entrance of the Almada, towering white against the trees, was only known to the folk from the country and to the beggars of the town that slept on the steps around the pedestal as the horse of stone. The other Carlos, turning off to the left with a rapid clatter of hoofs on the disjointed pavement, Don Carlos Gould in his English clothes, looked as incongruous but much more at home than the kingly cavalier reigning in his steed on the pedestal above the sleeping leperos, with his marble arm raised towards the marble rim of a plumed hat. The weather-stained effigy of the mounted king, with its vague suggestion of a saluting gesture, seemed to present an inscrutable breast to the political changes which had robbed it of its very name. But neither did the other horseman, well known to the people, keen and alive, on his well-shaped, slate-coloured beast with a white eye, wear his heart on the sleeve of his English coat. His mind preserved its steady poise, as if sheltered in the passionless stability of private and public decencies at home in Europe. He accepted with a like calm the shocking manner in which the Sulaco ladies smothered their faces with pearl powder till they looked like white plaster casts with beautiful living eyes, the peculiar gossip of the town and the continuous political changes, the constant saving of the country, which to his wife seemed a puerile and bloodthirsty game of murder and rapine played with terrible earnestness by depraved children. In the early days of her Costaguana life, the little lady used to clench her hands with exasperation at not being able to take the public affairs of the country as seriously as the incidental atrocity of methods deserved. She saw in them a comedy of naive pretences, but hardly anything genuine except her own appalled indignation. Charles, very quiet and twisting his long moustaches, would decline to discuss them at all. Once, however, he observed to her gently, My dear, you seem to forget that I was born here. These few words made her pause as if they had been a sudden revelation. Perhaps the mere fact of being born in the country did make a difference. She had a great confidence in her husband that had always been very great. He had struck her imagination from the first by his unsentimentalism, by that very quietude of mind which she had erected in her thought as a sign of perfect competency in the business of living. Don José Avellanos, their neighbour across the street, a statesman, a poet, a man of culture, who had represented his country at several European courts, and had suffered untold indignities as a state prisoner in the time of the tyrant Gutzman Bento, used to declare in Donna Amelia's drawing-room that Carlos had all the English qualities of character with a truly patriotic heart. Mrs Gould, raising her eyes to her husband's thin, red and tan face, could not detect the slightest quiver of a feature at what he must have heard said of his patriotism. Perhaps he had just dismounted on his return from the mine. He was English enough to disregard the hottest hours of the day. Basilio, in a livery of white linen and a red slash, had squatted for a moment behind his heels to unstrap the heavy, blunt spurs in the patio, and then the senor administrator would go up the staircase into the gallery. 
rows of plants in pots ranged on the balustrade between the pilasters of the arches screened the corredor with their leaves and flowers from the quadrangle below, whose paved space is the true hearthstone of a South American house, where the quiet hours of domestic life are marked by the shifting of light and shadow on the flagstones. Senor Avellanos was in the habit of crossing the patio at five o'clock almost every day. Don Jose chose to come over at tea time because the English rite at Donna Emilia's house reminded him of the time he lived in London as Minister Plenipotentiary to the court of St. James. He did not like tea and, usually rocking his American chair, his neat little shiny boots crossed on the footrest, he would talk on and on with a sort of complacent virtuosity, wonderful in a man of his age, while he held the cup in his hands for a long time. His close-cropped head was perfectly white, his eyes coal black. On seeing Charles Gould step into the sala, he would nod provisionally and go on to the end of the oratorial period. Only then he would say, Carlos, my friend, you have ridden from San Tomé in the heat of the day. Always the true English activity, no? What? He drank up all the tea at once in one draught. This performance was invariably followed by a slight shudder and a low, involuntary brrr, which was not covered by the hasty exclamation, Excellent! Then, giving up the empty cup into his young friend's hand, extended with a smile, he continued to expatiate upon the patriotic nature of the San Tomé mine for the simple pleasure of talking fluently, it seemed, while his reclining body jerked backwards and forwards in a rocking chair of the sort exported from the United States. The ceiling of the largest drawing room of the Casa Gould extended its white level far above his head. The loftiness dwarfed the mixture of heavy, straight-backed Spanish chairs of brown wood with leathern seats, and European furniture, low and cushioned all over, like squat little monsters gorged to bursting with steel springs and horsehair. There were knick-knacks on little tables, mirrors let into the wall above marble consoles, square spaces of carpet under the two groups of armchairs, each presided over by a deep sofa, smaller rugs scattered all over the floor of red tiles. Three windows from the ceiling down to the ground opening on a balcony and flanked by the perpendicular folds of the dark hangings. The stateliness of ancient days lingered between the four high smooth walls, tinted a delicate primrose colour, and Mrs Gould, with her little head and shining coils of hair, sitting in a cloud of muslin and lace before a slender mahogany table, resembled a fairy posed lightly before dainty filters dispensed out of vessels of silver and porcelain. Mrs Gould knew the history of the San Tomé mine. Worked in the early days mostly by means of lashes on the backs of slaves, its yield had been paid for in its own weight of human bones. Whole tribes of Indians had perished in the exploitation, and then the mine was abandoned, since with this primitive method it had ceased to make a profitable return, no matter how many corpses were thrown into its moor. Then it became forgotten. It was rediscovered after the War of Independence. An English company obtained the right to work it, and found so rich a vein that neither the exactions of successive governments, nor the periodical raids of recruiting officers upon the population of paid miners they had created, could discourage their perseverance. But in the end, during the long turmoil of pronunciamentos that followed the death of the famous Gutzmann Bento, the native miners, incited to revolt by the emissaries sent out from the capital, had risen upon their English chiefs and murdered them to a man. The decree of confiscation, which appeared immediately afterwards in the Diario Oficial, published in Santa Marta, began with the words, Justly incensed at the grinding oppression of foreigners, actuated by sordid motives of gain, rather than by love for a country where they come impoverished to seek their fortunes, the mining population of San Tomé, etc. And ended with the declaration, the chief of the state has resolved to exercise to the full his power of clemency. 
the mind which by every law, international, human and divine, reverts now to the government as national property, shall remain closed till the sword drawn for the sacred defence of liberal principles has accomplished its mission of securing the happiness of our beloved country. And for many years, this was the last of the San Tome mine. What advantage that government had expected from the spoliation, it is impossible to tell now. Costaguana was made with difficulty to pay a beggarly money compensation to the families of the victims, and then the matter dropped out of diplomatic dispatches. But afterwards another government bethought itself of that valuable asset. It was an ordinary Costaguana government, the fourth in six years, but it judged of its opportunities sanely. It remembered the San Tomé mine with a secret conviction of its worthlessness in their own hands, but with an ingenious insight into the various uses a silver mine can be put to, apart from the sordid process of extracting the metal from under the ground. The father of Charles Gould, for a long time one of the most wealthy merchants of Costaguana, had already lost a considerable part of his fortune in forced loans to the successive governments. He was a man of calm judgment who never dreamt of pressing his claims, and when, suddenly, the perpetual concession of the San Tomé mine was offered to him in full settlement, his alarm became extreme. He was versed in the ways of governments. Indeed, the intention of this affair, though no doubt deeply meditated in the closet, lay open on the surface of the document presented urgently for his signature. The third and most important clause stipulated that the concession holder should pay at once to the government five years' royalties on the estimated output of the mine. Mr Gould, Sr. defended himself from this fatal favour with many arguments and entreaties, but without success. He knew nothing of mining. He had no means to put his concession on the European market. The mine, as a working concern, did not exist. The buildings had been burnt down, the mining plant had been destroyed, the mining population had disappeared from the neighbourhood years and years ago, the very road had vanished under a flood of tropical vegetation as effectually as if swallowed by the sea, and the main gallery had fallen in within a hundred yards from the entrance. It was no longer an abandoned mine, it was a wild, inaccessible and rocky gorge of the Sierra, where vestiges of charred timber, some heaps of smashed bricks, and a few shapeless pieces of rusty iron could have been found under the matted mass of thorny creepers covering the ground. Mr Gould Sr. did not desire the perpetual possession of that desolate locality. In fact, the mere vision of it arising before his mind in the still watches of the night had the power to exasperate him into hours of hot and agitated insomnia. It so happened, however, that the finance minister of the time was a man to whom, in years gone by, Mr Gould had, unfortunately, declined to grant some small pecuniary assistance, basing his refusal on the ground that the applicant was a notorious gambler and cheat, besides being more than half suspected of a robbery with violence on a wealthy ranchero in a remote country district where he was actually exercising the function of a judge. Now, after reaching his exalted position, that politician had proclaimed his intention to repay evil with good to Senor Gould, the poor man. He affirmed and reaffirmed this resolution in the drawing-rooms of Santa Marta in a soft and implacable voice, and with such malicious glances that Mr Gould's best friends advised him earnestly to attempt no bribery to get the matter dropped. It would have been useless. Indeed, it would not have been a very safe proceeding. Such was also the opinion of a stout, loud-faced lady of French extraction, the daughter, she said, of an officer of high rank, officier supérieur de l'armée, who was accommodated with lodgings within the walls of a secularised convent next door to the Ministry of Finance. That florid person, when approached on behalf of Mr Gould in a proper manner and with a suitable present, shook her head despondently. She was good-natured, and her despondency was genuine. She imagined she could not take money in consideration of something she could not accomplish. 
The friend of Mr Gould, charged with the delicate mission, used to say afterwards that she was the only honest person closely or remotely connected with the government he had ever met. No go, she had said with a cavalier, husky intonation which was natural to her, and using turns of expression more suitable to a child of parents unknown than to the orphan daughter of a general officer. No, it's no go. Pas moyen, mon garçon. C'est dommage, tout de même. Ah, zut, je ne vole pas mon monde. Je ne suis pas ministre. Moi, vous pouvez emporter votre petit sac. For a moment, biting her calm and lip, she deplored inwardly the tyranny of the rigid principles governing the sale of her influence in high places. Then, significantly and with a touch of impatience, Allez, she added, Aidez bien à votre bonhomme, entendez-vous, qu'il faut travailler la pilule. After such a warning, there was nothing for it but to sign and pay. Mr. Gould had swallowed the pill and it was as though it had been compounded of some subtle poison that acted directly on his brain. He became at once mind-ridden, and as he was well read in light literature, it took to his mind the form of the old man of the sea fastened upon his shoulders. He also began to dream of vampires. Mr Gould exaggerated to himself the disadvantage of his new position because he viewed it emotionally. His position in Costaguana was no worse than before, but man is a desperately conservative creature, and the extravagant novelty of this outrage upon his purse distressed his sensibilities. Everybody around him was being robbed by the grotesque and murderous bands that played their game of governments and revolutions after the death of Gutzman Bento. His experience had taught him that, however short the plunder might fall of their legitimate expectations, no gang in possession of the presidential palace would be so incompetent as to suffer itself to be baffled by the want of a pretext. The first casual colonel of the barefooted army of scarecrows that came along was able to expose with force and precision to any mere civilian his titles to a sum of ten thousand dollars, the while his hope would be immutably fixed upon a gratuity at any rate of no less than a thousand. Mr Gould knew that very well, and armed with resignation had waited for better times. But to be robbed under the forms of legality and business was intolerable to his imagination. Mr Gould, the father, had one fault in his sagacious and honourable character. He attached too much importance to form, It is a failing common to mankind whose views are tinged by prejudices. There was for him in that affair a malignancy of perverted justice which, by means of a moral shock, attacked his vigorous physique. It will end by killing me, he used to affirm many times a day. And in fact, since that time, he began to suffer from fever, from liver pains, and mostly from a worrying inability to think of anything else the finance minister would have formed no conception of the profound subtlety of his revenge. Even Mr Gould's letters to his 14-year-old boy Charles, then away in England for his education, came at last to talk of practically nothing but the mine. He groaned over the injustice, the persecution, the outrage of that mine. He occupied whole pages in the exposition of the fatal consequences attaching to the possession of that mind from every point of view, with every dismal inference, with words of horror at the apparently eternal character of that curse. For the concession had been granted to him and his descendants for ever. He implored his son never to return to Costaguana, never to claim any part of his inheritance there, because it was tainted by the infamous concession, never to touch it, never to approach it, to forget that America existed and pursue a mercantile career in Europe. And each letter ended with bitter self-reproaches for having stayed too long in that cavern of thieves, intriguers and brigands. To be told repeatedly that one's future is blighted because of the possession of a silver mine is not, at the age of fourteen, a matter of prime importance as to its main statement, but in its form it is calculated to excite a certain amount of wonder and attention. In course of time the boy, at first only puzzled by the angry Jeremiads but rather sorry for his dad, began to turn the matter over in his mind in such moments as he could spare from play and study. 
In about a year, he had evolved from the lecture of the letters a definite conviction that there was a silver mine in the Sulaco province of the Republic of Costaguana, where poor Uncle Harry had been shot by soldiers a great many years before. There was also, connected closely with that mine, a thing called the Iniquitous Gould Concession, apparently written on a paper which his father desired ardently to tear and fling into the faces of presidents, members of judicature and ministers of state. And this desire persisted, though the names of these people, he noticed, seldom remained the same for a whole year together. This desire, since the thing was iniquitous, seemed quite natural to the boy, though why the affair was iniquitous he did not know. Afterwards, with advancing wisdom, he managed to clear the plain truth of the business from the fantastic intrusions of the old man of the sea, vampires and ghouls, which had lent to his father's correspondence the flavour of a gruesome Arabian night's tale. In the end, the growing youth attained to as close an intimacy with the San Tome mine as the old man who wrote these plaintive and enraged letters on the other side of the sea, He had been made several times already to pay heavy fines for neglecting to work the mine, he reported, besides other sums extracted from him on account of future royalties, on the ground that a man with such a valuable concession in his pocket could not refuse his financial assistance to the government of the Republic. The last of his fortune was passing away from him against worthless receipts, he wrote in a rage whilst he was being pointed out as an individual who had known how to secure enormous advantages from the necessities of his country. The young man in Europe grew more and more interested in that thing which could provoke such a tumult of words and passion. He thought of it every day, but he thought of it without bitterness. It might have been an unfortunate affair for his poor dad, and the whole story threw a queer light upon the social and political life of Costaguana, The view he took of it was sympathetic to his father, yet calm and reflective. His personal feelings had not been outraged, and it is difficult to resent with proper and durable indignation the physical or mental anguish of another organism, even if that other organism is one's own father. By the time he was twenty, Charles Gould's had, in his turn, fallen under the spell of the San Tome mine but it was another form of enchantment, more suitable to his youth, into whose magic formula there entered hope, vigour and self-confidence instead of weary indignation and despair. Left after he was twenty to his own guidance, except for the severe injunction not to return to Costaguana, he had pursued his studies in Belgium and France with the idea of qualifying for a mining engineer. But this scientific aspect of his labours remained vague and imperfect in his mind. Minds had acquired for him a dramatic interest. He studied their peculiarities from a personal point of view too, as one would study the varied characters of men. He visited them as one goes with curiosity to call upon remarkable persons. He visited minds in Germany, in Spain, in Cornwall. Abandoned workings had for him strong fascination. Their desolation appealed to him like the sight of human misery whose causes are varied and profound. They might have been worthless, but also they might have been misunderstood. His future wife was the first and perhaps the only person to detect this secret mood which governed the profoundly sensible, almost voiceless attitude of this man towards the world of material things. And at once her delight in him, lingering with half-open wings like those birds that cannot rise easily from a flat level, found a pinnacle from which to soar up into the skies. They had become acquainted in Italy, where the future Mrs Gould was staying with an old and pale aunt who, years before, had married a middle-aged, impoverished Italian marquis. She now mourned that man who had known how to give up his life to the independence and unity of his country, who had known how to be as enthusiastic in his generosity as the youngest of those who fell for that very cause of which old Giorgio Viola was a drifting relic, as a broken spar is suffered to float away, disregarded after a naval victory. The Marchesa led a still, whispering existence, nun-like in her black robes and a white band over the forehead, in a corner of the first floor of an ancient and ruinous palace, 
whose big empty halls downstairs sheltered under their painted ceilings the harvests, the fowls, and even the cattle, together with the whole family of the tenant farmer. The two young people had met in Luca. After that meeting, Charles Gould visited no mines, though they went together in a carriage once to see some marble quarries, where the work resembled mining in so far that it also was the tearing of the raw material of treasure from the earth. Charles Gould did not open his heart to her in any set speeches. He simply went on acting and thinking in her sight. This is the true method of sincerity. One of his frequent remarks was, I think sometimes that poor father takes a wrong view of that saint Tome business. And they discussed that opinion long and earnestly, as if they could influence a mind across half the globe. But in reality they discussed it because the sentiment of love can enter into any subject and live ardently in remote phrases. For this natural reason these discussions were precious to Mrs Gould in her engaged state. Charles feared that Mr Gould, senior, was wasting his strength and making himself ill by his efforts to get rid of the concession. I fancy that this is not the kind of handling it requires, he mused aloud as if to himself. And when she wondered, frankly, that a man of character should devote his energies to plotting and intrigues, Charles would remark with a gentle concern that understood her wonder, You must not forget that he was born there. She would set her quick mind to work upon that and then make the inconsequent retort, which he accepted as perfectly sagacious, because in fact it was so. Well, and you, you were born there too. He knew his answer. That's different. I've been away ten years. Dad never had such a long spell, and it was more than thirty years ago. She was the first person to whom he opened his lips after receiving the news of his father's death. It has killed him, he said. He had walked straight out of town with the news straight out before him in the noonday sun on the white road, and his feet had brought him face to face with her in the hall of the ruined palazzo, a room magnificent and naked, with here and there a long strip of damask, black with damp and age, hanging down on a bare panel of the wall. It was furnished with exactly one gilt armchair with a broken back, and an octagon columnar stand bearing a heavy marble vase ornamented with sculpted masks and garlands of flowers and cracked from top to bottom. Charles Gould was dusty with the white dust of the road lying on his boots, on his shoulders, on his cap with two peaks. Water dripped from under it all over his face and he grasped a thick oaken cudgel in his bare right hand. She went very pale under the roses of her big straw hat gloved, swinging a clear sunshade, caught just as she was going out to meet him at the bottom of the hill where three poplars stand near the wall of a vineyard. It has killed him, he repeated. He ought to have had many years yet. We are a long-lived family. She was too startled to say anything. He was contemplating with a penetrating and motionless stare the cracked marble urn as though he had resolved to fix its shape forever in his memory. It was only when, turning suddenly to her, he blurted out twice, I've come to you, I've come straight to you, without being able to finish his phrase, that the great pitifulness of that lonely and tormented death in Costaguana came to her with the full force of its misery. He caught hold of her hand, raised it to his lips, and at that she dropped her parasol to pat him on the cheek, murmured, Poor boy and began to dry her eyes under the downward curve of her hat-brim, very small in her simple white frock, almost like a lost child crying in the degraded grandeur of the noble hall, while he stood by her, again perfectly motionless in the contemplation of the marble urn. Afterwards they went out for a long walk, which was silent, till he exclaimed suddenly, Yes, but if he had only grappled with it in a proper way and then they stopped. Everywhere there were long shadows lying on the hills, on the roads, on the enclosed fields of olive trees, the shadows of poplars, of wide chestnuts, of farm buildings, of stone walls, and in mid-air the sound of a bell, thin and alert, was like the throbbing pulse of the sunset glow. 
Her lips were slightly parted, as though in surprise that he should not be looking at her with his usual expression. His usual expression was unconditionally approving and attentive. He was, in his talks with her, the most anxious and deferential of dictators, an attitude that pleased her immensely. It affirmed her power without detracting from his dignity. That slight girl with her little feet, little hands, little face, attractively overweighted by great coils of hair, with a rather large mouth whose mere parting seemed to breathe upon you the fragrance of frankness and generosity, had the fastidious soul of an experienced woman. She was, before all things and all flatteries, careful of her pride in the object of her choice. But now he was actually not looking at her at all, and his expression was tense and irrational, as is natural in a man who elects to stare at nothing past a young girl's head. Well, yes, it is iniquitous. They corrupted him thoroughly, the poor old boy. Oh, why wouldn't he let me go back to him? But now I shall know how to grapple with this. After pronouncing these words with immense assurance, he glanced down at her and at once fell a prey to distress, incertitude and fear. The only thing he wanted to know now, he said, was whether she did love him enough, whether she would have the courage to go with him so far away. He put these questions to her in a voice that trembled with anxiety, for he was a determined man. She did. She would. And immediately the future hostess of all the Europeans in Sulaco had the physical experience of the earth falling away from under her. It vanished completely, even to the very sound of the bell. When her feet touched the ground again, the bell was still ringing in the valley. She put her hands up to her hair, breathing quickly, and glanced up and down the stony lane. It was reassuringly empty. Meantime, Charles, stepping with one foot into a dry and dusty ditch, picked up the open parasol which had bounded away from them with a martial sound of drum taps. He handed it to her soberly, a little crestfallen. They turned back, and after she had slipped her hand on his arm, the first words he pronounced were, It's lucky that we should be able to settle in a coast town. You've heard its name. It is Salako. I am so glad poor father did get that house. He bought a big house there years ago, in order that there should always be a Casa Gould in the principal town of what used to be called the Occidental Province. I lived there once as a small boy with my dear mother for a whole year, while poor father was away in the United States on business. You shall be the new mistress of the Casa Gould. And later, in the inhabited corner of the palazzo, above the vineyards, the marble hills, the pines and olives of Luca, he also said, The name of Gould has always been highly respected in Sulaco. My uncle Harry was chief of the state for some time, and has left a great name amongst the first families. By this I mean the pure Creole families, who take no part in the miserable farce of government. Uncle Harry was no adventurer. In Costaguana we Goulds are no adventurers. He was of the country and he loved it, but he remained essentially an Englishman in his ideas. He made use of the political cry of his time, it was federation, but he was no politician. He simply stood up for social order out of pure love for rational liberty and from his hate of oppression. There was no nonsense about him. He went to work in his own way because it seemed right, just as I feel I must lay hold of that mine. In such words he talked to her because his memory was very full of the country of his childhood, his heart of his life with that girl, and his mind of the St. Tome concession. He added that he would have to leave her for a few days to find an American, a man from San Francisco, who was still somewhere in Europe. A few months before he had made his acquaintance in an old historic German town situated in a mining district. The American had his womankind with him, but seemed lonely while they were sketching all day long the old doorways and the turreted corners of the medieval houses. Charles Gould had with him the inseparable companionship of the mine. The other man was interested in mining enterprises, knew something of Costaguana, and was no stranger to the name of Gould. They had talked together with some intimacy, which was made possible by the difference of their ages. 
Charles wanted now to find that capitalist of shrewd mind and accessible character. His father's fortune in Costaguana, which he had supposed to be still considerable, seemed to have melted in the rascally crucible of revolutions. Apart from some ten thousand pounds deposited in England, there appeared to be nothing left except the house in Sulaco, a vague right of forest exploitation in a remote and savage district, and the San Tome concession, which had attended his poor father to the very brink of the grave. He explained those things. It was late when they parted. She had never before given him such a fascinating vision of herself, all the eagerness of youth for a strange life, for great distances, for a future in which there was an air of adventure, of combat. A subtle thought of redress and conquest had filled her with an intense excitement which she returned to the giver with a more open and exquisite display of tenderness. He left her to walk down the hill, and directly he found himself alone he became sober. That irreparable change a death makes in the course of our daily thoughts can be felt in a vague and poignant discomfort of the mind. It hurt Charles Gould to feel that never more, by no efforts of will, would he be able to think of his father in the same way he used to think of him when the poor man was alive. His breathing image was no longer in his power. This consideration, closely affecting his own identity, filled his breast with a mournful and angry desire for action. In this, his instinct was unerring. Action is consolatory. It is the enemy of thought and the friend of flattering illusions. Only in the conduct of our action can we find the sense of mastery over the fates. For this action, the mind was obviously the only field. It was imperative sometimes to know how to disobey the solemn wishes of the dead. He resolved firmly to make his disobedience as thorough, by way of atonement, as it well could be. The mind had been the cause of an absurd moral disaster, its working must be made a serious and moral success. He owed it to the dead man's memory. Such were the, properly speaking, emotions of Charles Gould. His thoughts ran upon the means of raising a large amount of capital in San Francisco or elsewhere, and incidentally there occurred to him also the general reflection that the counsel of the departed must be an unsound guide. Not one of them could be aware beforehand what enormous changes the death of any given individual may produce in the very aspect of the world. End of part first, The Silver of the Mine, chapter 6, section 1. Part first of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad, The Silver of the Mine, chapter 6, section 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part First, The Silver of the Mine. Chapter 6, Section 2. The latest phase in the history of the mine, Mrs Gould knew from personal experience. It was, in essence, the history of her married life. The mantle of the Gould's hereditary position in Sulaco had descended amply upon her little person, but she would not allow the peculiarities of the strange garment to weigh down the vivacity of her character, which was the sign of no mere mechanical sprightliness, but of an eager intelligence. It must not be supposed that Mrs Gould's mind was masculine. A woman with a masculine mind is not a being of superior efficiency, she is simply a phenomenon of imperfect differentiation, interestingly barren and without importance. Donna Amelia's intelligence, being feminine, led her to achieve the conquest of Sulaco simply by lighting the way for her unselfishness and sympathy. She could converse charmingly, but she was not talkative. The wisdom of the heart, having no concern with the erection or demolition of theories any more than with the defence of prejudices, has no random words at its command. The words it pronounces have the value of acts of integrity, tolerance and compassion. A woman's true tenderness, like the true virility of man, is expressed in action of a conquering kind. The ladies of Sulaco adored Mrs Gould. 
They still look upon me as something of a monster, Mrs Gould had said pleasantly to one of the three gentlemen from San Francisco she had to entertain in her new Salaco house, just about a year after her marriage. They were her first visitors from abroad, and they had come to look at the San Tome mine. She jested most agreeably, they thought, and Charles Gould, besides knowing thoroughly what he was about, had shown himself a real hustler. These facts caused them to be well disposed towards his wife. An unmistakable enthusiasm, pointed by a slight flavour of irony, made her talk of the mine absolutely fascinating to her visitors, and provoked them to grave and indulgent smiles in which there was a good deal of deference. Perhaps had they known how much she was inspired by an idealistic view of success, they would have been amazed at the state of her mind as the Spanish-American ladies had been amazed at the tireless activity of her body. She would, in her own words, have been, for them, something of a monster. However, the Goulds were, in essentials, a reticent couple, and their guests departed without the suspicion of any other purpose but simple profit in the working of a silver mine. Mrs Gould had out her own carriage with two white mules to drive them down to the harbour, whence the series was to carry them off into the Olympus of plutocrats. Captain Mitchell had snatched at the occasion of leave-taking to remark to Mrs Gould in a low, confidential mutter, This marks an epoch. Mrs Gould loved the patio of her Spanish house. A broad flight of stone steps was overlooked silently from a niche in the wall by a Madonna in blue robes, with the crowned child sitting on her arm. Subdued voices ascended in the early mornings from the paved well of the quadrangle, with the stamping of horses and mules led out in pairs to drink at the cistern. A tangle of slender bamboo stems drooped its narrow, blade-like leaves over the square pool of water, and the fat coachman sat muffled up on the edge, holding lazily the ends of halters in his hand. Barefooted servants passed to and fro, issuing from dark, low doorways below. Two laundry girls with baskets of washed linen, the baker with a tray of bread made for the day, Leonarda, her own camarista, bearing high up, swung from her hand, raised above her raven-black head, a bunch of starched underskirts dazzlingly white in the slant of sunshine. Then the old porter would hobble in, sweeping the flagstones, and the house was ready for the day. All the lofty rooms on three sides of the quadrangle opened into each other and into the corridor, with its wrought iron railings and a border of flowers, whence, like the lady of the medieval castle, she could witness from above all the departures and arrivals of the casa, to which the sonorous arched gateway lent an air of stately importance. She had watched her carriage roll away with the three guests from the north. She smiled. Their three arms went up simultaneously to their three hats. Captain Mitchell, the fourth, in attendance, had already begun a pompous discourse. Then she lingered. She lingered, approaching her face to the cluster of flowers here and there, as if to give time to her thoughts to catch up with her slow footsteps along the straight vista of the corridor. A fringed Indian hammock from Aroa, gay with coloured featherwork, had been swung judiciously in a corner that caught the early sun, for the mornings are cool in Salako. The cluster of Flor de Noche Buena blazed in great masses before the open glass doors of the reception rooms. A big green parrot, brilliant like an emerald in a cage that flashed like gold, screamed out ferociously, Viva Costa Guana! then called twice mellifluously, Leonada! Leonada! in imitation of Mrs Gould's voice, and suddenly took refuge in immobility and silence. Mrs Gould reached the end of the gallery and put her head through the door of her husband's room. Charles Gould, with one foot on a low wooden stool, was already strapping his spurs. He wanted to hurry back to the mine. Mrs Gould, without coming in, glanced about the room. One tall, broad bookcase with glass doors was full of books, but in the other, without shelves and lined with red bays, were arranged firearms, Winchester carbines, revolvers, a couple of shotguns, and even two pairs of double-barrelled holster pistols. 
Between them by itself, upon a strip of scarlet velvet, hung an old cavalry sabre, once the property of Don Enrique Gould, the hero of the Occidental province, presented by Don José Avellanos, the hereditary friend of the family. Otherwise, the plastered white walls were completely bare, except for a watercolour sketch of the San Tomé mountain, the work of Donna Emilia herself. In the middle of the red-tiled floor stood two long tables littered with plans and papers, a few chairs, and a glass showcase containing specimens of ore from the mine. Mrs Gould, looking at all these things in turn, wondered aloud why the talk of these wealthy and enterprising men discussing the prospects, the working and the safety of the mine rendered her so impatient and uneasy, whereas she could talk of the mine by the hour with her husband with unwearied interest and satisfaction. And dropping her eyelids expressively, she added, What do you feel about it, Charlie? Then, surprised at her husband's silence, she raised her eyes, opened wide, as pretty as pale flowers. He had done with the spurs, and, twisting his moustache with both hands horizontally, he contemplated her from the height of his long legs with a visible appreciation of her appearance. The consciousness of being thus contemplated pleased Mrs Gould. They are considerable men, he said. I know, but have you listened to their conversation? They don't seem to have understood anything they have seen here. They have seen the mine. They have understood that to some purpose, Charles Gould interjected in defence of the visitors. And then his wife mentioned the name of the most considerable of the three. He was considerable in finance and in industry. His name was familiar to many millions of people. He was so considerable that he would never have travelled so far away from the centre of his activity if the doctors had not insisted, with veiled menaces, on his taking a long holiday. Mr Holroyd's sense of religion, Mrs Gould pursued, was shocked and disgusted at the tawdriness of the dressed-up saints in the cathedral, the worship, he called it, of wood and tinsel. But it seemed to me that he looked upon his own God as a sort of influential partner who gets his share of profits in the endowment of churches. That's a sort of idolatry. He told me he endowed churches every year, Charlie. No end of them, said Mr Gould, marvelling inwardly at the mobility of her physiognomy. All over the country he's famous for that sort of munificence. Oh, he didn't boast, Mrs Gould declared scrupulously. I believe he's really a good man, but so stupid. A poor chula who offers a little silver arm or leg to thank his God for a cure is as rational and more touching. He's at the head of immense silver and iron interests, Charles Gould observed. Ah, yes, the religion of silver and iron. He's a very civil man, though he looked awfully solemn when he first saw the Madonna on the staircase, who's only wood and paint but he said nothing to me. My dear Charlie, I heard those men talk among themselves. Can it be that they really wish to become, for an immense consideration, drawers of water and hewers of wood to all the countries and nations of the earth? A man must work to some end, Charles Good said vaguely. Mrs Gould, frowning, surveyed him from head to foot. With his riding breeches, leather leggings, an article of apparel never before seen in Costaguana, a Norfolk coat of grey flannel and those great flaming moustaches, he suggested an officer of cavalry turned gentleman farmer. This combination was gratifying to Mrs Gould's tastes. How thin the poor boy is, she thought. He overworks himself. But there was no denying that his fine-drawn, keen red face and his whole long-limbed, lank person had an air of breeding and distinction and Mrs Gould relented. I only wondered what you felt, she murmured gently. During the last few days, as it happened, Charles Gould had been kept too busy thinking twice before he spoke to have paid much attention to the state of his feelings. But theirs was a successful match, and he had no difficulty in finding his answers. The best of my feelings are in your keeping, my dear, he said lightly and there was so much truth in that obscure phrase that he experienced towards her at the moment a great increase of gratitude and tenderness. 
Mrs. Gould, however, did not seem to find this answer in the least obscure. She brightened up delicately. Already he had changed his tone. But there are facts. The worth of the mine as a mine is beyond doubt. It shall make us very wealthy. The mere working of it is a matter of technical knowledge, which I have, which ten thousand other men in the world have. But its safety, its continued existence as an enterprise, giving a return to men, to strangers, comparative strangers, who invest money in it, is left altogether in my hands. I have inspired confidence in a man of wealth and position. You seem to think this perfectly natural, do you? Well, I don't know. I don't know why I have, but it is a fact. This fact makes everything possible, because without it I would never have thought of disregarding my father's wishes. I would never have disposed of the concession as a speculator disposes of a valuable right to a company, for cash and shares to grow rich eventually if possible, but at any rate to put some money at once in his pocket. No, even if it had been feasible, which I doubt, I would not have done so. Poor father did not understand. He was afraid I would hang on to the ruinous thing waiting for just some such chance and waste my life miserably. That was the true sense of his prohibition, which we have deliberately set aside. They were walking up and down the corridor. Her head just reached to his shoulders. His arm, extended downwards, was about her waist. His spurs jingled slightly. He had not seen me for ten years. He did not know me. He parted from me for my sake, and he would never let me come back. He was always talking in his letters of leaving Costaguana, of abandoning everything and making his escape, but he was too valuable a prey. They would have thrown him into one of their prisons at the first suspicion. His spurred feet clinked slowly. He was bending over his wife as they walked. The big parrot, turning its head askew, followed their pacing figures with a round, unblinking eye. He was a lonely man. Ever since I was ten years old he used to talk to me as if I had been grown up. When I was in Europe he wrote to me every month, ten, twelve pages, every month of my life for ten years, and after all he did not know me. Just think of it, ten whole years away, the years I was growing up into a man. He could not know me. Do you think he could? Mrs Gould shook her head negatively, which was just what her husband had expected from the strength of the argument. But she shook her head negatively, only because she thought that no one could know her child, really know him for what he was but herself. The thing was obvious, it could be felt, it required no argument. And poor Mr Gould, Senior, who had died too soon to ever hear of their engagement, remained too shadowy a figure for her to be credited with knowledge of any sort whatever. No, he did not understand. In my view, this mine could never have been a thing to sell. Never. After all his misery, I simply could not have touched it for money alone, Charles Gould pursued, and she pressed her head to his shoulder approvingly. These two young people remembered the life which had ended wretchedly just when their own lives had come together in that splendour of hopeful love, which to the most sensible minds appears like a triumph of good over all the evils of the earth. A vague idea of rehabilitation had entered the plan of their life, that it was so vague as to elude the support of argument made it only the stronger. It had presented itself to them at the instant when the woman's instinct of devotion and the man's instinct of activity received from the strongest of illusions their most powerful impulse. The very prohibition imposed the necessity of success. It was as if they had been morally bound to make good their vigorous view of life against the unnatural error of weariness and despair. If the idea of wealth was present to them, it was only in so far as it was bound with that other success. Mrs Gould, an orphan from early childhood and without fortune, brought up in an atmosphere of intellectual interests, had never considered the aspects of great wealth. They were too remote and she had not learned that they were desirable. On the other hand, she had not known anything of absolute want. Even the very poverty of her aunt, the Marchesa, had nothing intolerable to a refined mind. It seemed in accord with a great grief. It had the austerity of a sacrifice offered to a noble ideal. Thus, even the most legitimate touch of materialism was wanting in Mrs Gould's character. 
the dead man of whom she thought with tenderness, because he was Charlie's father, and with some impatience, because he had been weak, must be put completely in the wrong. Nothing else would do to keep their prosperity without a stain on its only real, on its immaterial side. Charles Gould, on his part, had been obliged to keep the idea of wealth well to the fore, but he brought it forward as a means, not as an end. Unless the mine was good business, it could not be touched. He had to insist on that aspect of the enterprise. It was his lever to move men who had capital, and Charles Gould believed in the mine. He knew everything that could be known of it. His faith in the mine was contagious, though it was not served by a great eloquence. But businessmen are frequently as sanguine and imaginative as lovers. They are affected by a personality much oftener than people would suppose, and Charles Gould, in his unshaken assurance, was absolutely convincing. Besides, it was a matter of common knowledge to the men to whom he addressed himself that mining in Costaguana was a game that could be made considerably more than worth the candle. The men of affairs knew that very well. The real difficulty in touching it was elsewhere. Against that there was an implication of calm and implacable resolution in Charles Gould's very voice. Men of affairs venture sometimes on acts that the common judgment of the world would pronounce absurd, They make their decisions on apparently impulsive and human grounds. Very well, had said the considerable personage to whom Charles Gould, on his way out through San Francisco, had lucidly exposed his point of view. Let us suppose that the mining affairs of Sulaco are taken in hand. There would then be in it first the house of Holroyd, which is all right, then Mr Charles Gould, a citizen of Costaguana, who is also all right, and lastly the government of the Republic. So far, this resembles the first start of the Atacame nitrate fields, where there was a financing house, a gentleman of the name of Edwards, and a government, or rather two governments, two South American governments. And you know what came of it. War came of it. Devastating and prolonged war came of it, Mr Gould. However, here we possess the advantage of having only one South American government hanging around for plunder out of the deal. It is an advantage. But then there are degrees of badness, and that government is the Costaguana government. Thus spoke the considerable personage, the millionaire and dower of churches on a scale befitting the greatness of his native land, the same to whom the doctor used the language of horrid and veiled menaces. He was a big-limbed, deliberate man whose quiet burliness lent to an ample silk-faced frock-coat a superfine dignity. His hair was iron grey, his eyebrows were still black, and his massive profile was the profile of a Caesar's head on an old Roman coin, but his parentage was German and Scotch and English, with remote strains of Danish and French blood, giving him the temperament of a Puritan and an insatiable imagination of conquest. He was completely unbending to his visitor because of the warm introduction the visitor had brought from Europe and because of an irrational liking for earnestness and determination wherever met to whatever end directed. The Costaguana government shall play its hand for all it's worth and don't you forget it, Mr Gould. Now, what is Costaguana? It is the bottomless pit of 10% loans and other fool investments. European capital has been flung into it with both hands for years, not ours, though. We in this country know just about enough to keep indoors when it rains. We can sit and watch. Of course, some day we shall step in. We are bound to. But there's no hurry. Time itself has got to wait on the greatest country in the whole of God's universe. We shall be giving the word for everything. Industry, trade, law, journalism, art politics and religion, from Cape Horn clear over to Smith Sound and beyond, too, if anything worth taking hold of turns up at the North Pole. And then we shall have the leisure to take in hand the outlying islands and continents of the earth. We shall run the world's business, whether the world likes it or not. The world can't help it, and neither can we, I guess. By this he meant to express his faith in destiny in words suitable to his intelligence, which was unskilled in the presentation of general ideas. His intelligence was nourished on facts, 
and Charles Gould, whose imagination had been permanently affected by the one great fact of a silver mine, had no objection to this theory of the world's future. If it had seemed distasteful for a moment, it was because the sudden statement of such vast eventualities dwarfed almost to nothingness the actual matter in hand. He and his plans and all the mineral wealth of the Occidental province appeared suddenly robbed of every vestige of magnitude. The sensation was disagreeable, but Charles Gould was not dull. Already he felt that he was producing a favourable impression. The consciousness of that flattering fact helped him to a vague smile, which his big interlocutor took for a smile of discreet and admiring assent. He smiled quietly too, and immediately Charles Gould, with that mental agility mankind will display in defence of a cherished hope, reflected that the very apparent insignificant of his aim would help him to success. His personality and his mind would be taken up because it was a matter of no great consequence, one way or another, to a man who referred his action to such a prodigious destiny. And Charles Gould was not humiliated by this consideration, because the thing remained as big as ever for him. Nobody else's vast conception of destiny could diminish the aspect of his desire for the redemption of the San Tome mine. In comparison to the correctness of his aim, definite in space and absolutely attainable within a limited time, the other man appeared for an instant as a dreamy idealist of no importance. The great man, massive and benignant, had been looking at him thoughtfully. When he broke the short silence, it was to remark that concessions flew about thick in the air of Costaguana. Any simple soul that just yearned to be taken in could bring down a concession at the first shot. Our consuls get their mouths stopped with them, he continued with a twinkle of genial scorn in his eyes. But in a moment he became grave. A conscientious, upright man that cares nothing for boodle and keeps clear of their intrigues, conspiracies and factions soon gets his passport. See that, Mr Gould? Persona non grata. That's the reason our government is never properly informed. On the other hand, Europe must be kept out of this continent, and for proper interference on our part, the time is not yet ripe, I dare say. But we here, we are not this country's government, neither are we simple souls. Your affair is all right. The main question for us is whether the second partner, and that's you, is the right sort to hold his own against the third and unwelcome partner, which is one or another of the high and mighty robber gangs that run the Costaguana government. What do you think, Mr Gould, eh? He bent forward to look steadily into the unflinching eyes of Charles Gould, who, remembering the large box full of his father's letters, put the accumulated scorn and bitterness of many years into the tone of his answer. As far as the knowledge of these men and their methods and their politics is concerned, I can answer for myself. I have been fed on that sort of knowledge since I was a boy. I am not likely to fall into mistakes from excess of optimism. Not likely, eh? That's all right. Tact and a stiff upper lip is what you'll want, and you could bluff a little on the strength of your backing. Not too much, though. We will go with you as long as the thing runs straight, but we won't be drawn into any large trouble. This is the experiment which I am willing to make. There is some risk and we will take it, but if you can't keep up your end, we will stand our loss, of course, and then we'll let the thing go. This mine can wait, it has been shut up before, as you know. You must understand that under no circumstances will we consent to throw good money after bad. Thus the great personage had spoken then, in his own private office, in a great city where other men, very considerable in the eyes of a vain populace, waited with alacrity upon a wave of his hand. And rather more than a year later, during his unexpected appearance in Sulaco, he had emphasised his uncompromising attitude with a freedom of sincerity permitted to his wealth and influence. He did this with the less reserve, perhaps, because the inspection of what had been done, and more still the way in which successive steps had been taken, had impressed him with the conviction that Charles Gould was perfectly capable of keeping up his end. This young fellow, he thought to himself, may yet become a power in the land. This thought flattered him, 
for hitherto the only account of this young man he could give to his intimates was, my brother-in-law met him in one of these one-horse old German towns near some mines and sent him on to me with a letter. He's one of the Costaguana Goulds, purebred Englishmen, but all born in the country. His uncle went into politics, was the last provincial president of Sulaco, and got shot after a battle. His father was a prominent businessman in Santa Marta, tried to keep clear of their politics, and died ruined after a lot of revolutions. And that's your Costaguana in a nutshell. Of course, he was too great a man to be questioned as to his motives, even by his intimates. The outside world was at liberty to wonder respectfully at the hidden meaning of his actions. He was so great a man that his lavish patronage of the purer forms of Christianity, which in its native form of church-building amused Mrs Gould, was looked upon by his fellow citizens as the manifestation of a pious and humble spirit. But in his own circles of the financial world, the taking up of such a thing as the San Tome mine was regarded with respect indeed, but rather as a subject for discreet jocularity. It was a great man's caprice. In the great Holroyd building, an enormous pile of iron, glass and blocks of stone at the corner of two streets, cobwebbed aloft by the radiation of telegraph wires, the heads of principal departments exchanged humorous glances which meant that they were not let into the secrets of the San Tome business. The Costaguana mail, it was never large, one fairly heavy envelope, was taken unopened straight into the great man's room, and no instructions dealing with it had ever been issued thence. The office whispered that he answered personally, and not by dictation either, but actually writing in his own hand with pen and ink, and it was to be supposed taking a copy in his own private press copy book, inaccessible to profane eyes. Some scornful young men, insignificant pieces of minor machinery in that eleven-storey high workshop of great affairs, expressed frankly their private opinion that the great chief had done at last something silly and was ashamed of his folly. Others, elderly and insignificant, but full of romantic reverence for the business that had devoured their best years, used to mutter darkly and knowingly that this was a portentous sign, that the Holroyd connection meant by and by to get hold of the whole Republic of Costaguana, lock, stock and barrel. But in fact the hobby theory was the right one. It interested the great man to attend personally to the San Tome mine. It interested him so much that he allowed this hobby to give a direction to the first complete holiday he had taken for quite a startling number of years. He was not running a great enterprise there, no mere railway board or industrial corporation. He was running a man. A success would have pleased him very much on refreshingly novel grounds, but on the other side of the same feeling it was incumbent upon him to cast it off utterly at the first sign of failure. A man may be thrown off. The papers had unfortunately trumpeted all over the land his journey to Costaguana. If he was pleased at the way Charles Gould was going on, he infused an added grimness into his assurances of support. Even at the very last interview, half an hour or so before he rolled out of the patio, hat in hand behind Mrs Gould's white mules, he had said in Charles Gould's room, you go ahead in your own way, and I shall know how to help you as long as you hold your own. But you may rest assured that in a given case we shall know how to drop you in time. To this, Charles Gould's only answer had been, You may begin sending out the machinery as soon as you like. And the great man had liked this imperturbable assurance. The secret of it was that to Charles Gould's mind these uncompromising terms were agreeable. Like this, the mine preserved its identity, with which he had endowed it as a boy, and it remained dependent on himself alone. It was a serious affair, and he too took it grimly. Of course, he said to his wife, alluding to this last conversation with the departed guest, while they walked slowly up and down the corridor, followed by the irritated eye of the parrot, Of course, a man of that sort can take up a thing or drop it when he likes, he will suffer from no sense of defeat. He may have to give in or he may have to die tomorrow, but the great silver mine and iron interest will survive and some day will get hold of Costaguana, along with the rest of the world. They had stopped near the cage. 
The parrot, catching the sound of a word belonging to his vocabulary, was moved to interfere. Parrots are very human. Viva Costa Guana! he shrieked with intense self-assertion and instantly ruffled up his feathers, assuming the air of puffed-up somnolence behind the glittering wires. And do you believe that, Charlie? Mrs Gould asked. This seems to me most awful materialism and... My dear, it's nothing to me, interrupted her husband in a reasonable tone. I make use of what I see. What's it to me whether his talk is the voice of destiny or simply a bit of claptrap eloquence? There's a good deal of eloquence of one sort or another produced in both Americas. The air of the new world seems favourable to the art of declamation. Have you forgotten how dear Avellanos can hold forth for hours here? Oh, but that's different, protested Mrs Gould, almost shocked. The allusion was not to the point. Don Jose was a dear good man who talked very well and was enthusiastic about the greatness of the San Tome mine. How can you compare them, Charles? she exclaimed reproachfully. He has suffered, and yet he hopes. The working competence of men, which he never questioned, was very surprising to Mrs Gould, because upon so many obvious issues they showed themselves strangely muddle-headed. Charles Gould, with a careworn calmness which secured for him at once his wife's anxious sympathy, assured her that he was not comparing. He was an American himself, after all, and perhaps he could understand both kinds of eloquence, if it were worth while to try, he added grimly. But he had breathed the air of England longer than any of his people had done for three generations, and really he begged to be excused. His poor father could be eloquent too, and he asked his wife whether she remembered a passage in one of his father's last letters, where Mr Gould had expressed the conviction that God looked wrathfully at these countries, or else he would let some ray of hope fall through a rift in the appalling darkness of intrigue, bloodshed and crime that hung over the Queen of Continents. Mrs Gould had not forgotten. You read it to me, Charlie, she murmured. It was a striking pronouncement. How deeply your father must have felt its terrible sadness. He did not like to be robbed. It exasperated him, said Charles Gould. But the image will serve well enough. What is wanted here is law, good faith, order, security. Anyone can declaim about these things, but I pin my faith to material interests. Only let the material interests once get a firm footing and they are bound to impose the conditions on which alone they can continue to exist. That's how your money-making is justified here in the face of lawlessness and disorder. It is justified because the security which it demands must be shared with an oppressed people. A better justice will come afterwards. That's your ray of hope. His arm pressed her slight form closer to his side for a moment. And who knows whether in that sense even the San Tome mine may not become that little rift in the darkness which poor father despaired of ever seeing. She glanced up at him with admiration. He was competent. He had given a vast shape to the vagueness of her unselfish ambitions. Charlie, she said, you are splendidly disobedient. He left her suddenly in the corredor to go and get his hat, a soft grey sombrero, an article of national costume which combined unexpectedly well with his English get-up. He came back, a riding whip under his arm, buttoning up a dogskin glove, his face reflected the resolute nature of his thoughts. His wife had waited for him at the head of the stairs, and before he gave her the parting kiss, he finished the conversation. What should be perfectly clear to us, he said, is the fact that there is no going back. Where could we begin life afresh? We are in now for all that there is in us. He bent over her upturned face very tenderly and a little remorsefully. Charles Gould was competent because he had no illusions. The Gould concession had to fight for life with such weapons as could be found at once in the mire of a corruption that was so universal as almost to lose its significance. He was prepared to stoop for his weapons. For a moment he felt as if the silver mine which had killed his father had decoyed him further than he meant to go and with the roundabout logic of emotions he felt that the worthiness of his life was bound up with success. There was no going back. End of Part First, The Silver of the Mine, Chapter 6, 
Section 2. Part First of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad. The Silver of the Mine, Chapter 7. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part First The Silver of the Mine, Chapter 7. Mrs. Gould was too intelligently sympathetic not to share that feeling. It made life exciting, and she was too much of a woman not to like excitement. But it frightened her too a little, and when Don José Avellanos, rocking in the American chair, would go so far as to say, Even, my dear Carlos, if you had failed, even if some untoward event were yet to destroy your work, which, God forbid, you would have deserved well of your country. Mrs. Gould would look up from the tea-table profoundly at her unmoved husband, stirring the spoon in the cup as though he had not heard a word. Not that Don José anticipated anything of the sort. He could not praise enough dear Carlos's tact and courage. His English, rock-like quality of character was his best safeguard, Don José affirmed, and turning to Mrs. Gould, As to you, Amelia, my soul, he would address her with the familiarity of his age and old friendship, you are as true a patriot as though you had been born in our midst. This might have been less or more than the truth. Mrs Gould, accompanying her husband all over the province in the search for labour, had seen the land with a deeper glance than a true-born Costaguanera could have done. In her travel-worn riding habit, her face powdered white like a plaster cast, with a further protection of a small silk mask during the heat of the day, she rode on a well-shaped, light-footed pony in the centre of a little cavalcade, Two mozzos de campo, picturesque in great hats, with spurred bare heels in white embroidered calzarenas, leather jackets and striped ponchos, rode ahead with carbines across their shoulders, swaying in unison to the pace of the horses. A tropilla of pack mules brought up the rear in charge of a thin brown muleteer, sitting his long-eared beast very near the tail, legs thrust far forward, the white brim of his hat set far back, making a sort of halo for his head. An old Costaguana officer, a retired senior major of humble origin, but patronised by the first families on account of his Blanco opinions, had been recommended to Don José for commissary and organiser of that expedition. The points of his grey moustache hung far below his chin, and riding on Mrs. Gould's left hand, he looked about with kindly eyes, pointing out the features of the country, telling the names of the little pueblos and of the estates, of the smooth-walled haciendas like long fortresses crowning the knolls above the level of the Sulaco Valley. It unrolled itself with green young crops, plains, woodland and gleams of water, park-like from the blue vapour of the distant Sierra to an immense quivering horizon of grass and sky, where big white clouds seemed to fall slowly into the darkness of their own shadows. Men ploughed with wooden ploughs and yoked oxen, small on a boundless expanse, as if attacking immensity itself. The mounted figures of vaqueros galloped in the distance, and the great herds fed with all their horned heads one way, in one single wavering line as far as I could reach across the broad potreros. A spreading cotton-wool tree shaded a thatched ranch by the road. The trudging files of burdened Indians taking off their hats would lift sad, mute eyes to the cavalcade raising the dust of the crumbling Camino Real made by the hands of their enslaved forefathers and Mrs. Gould, with each day's journey, seemed to come nearer to the soul of the land in the tremendous disclosure of this interior, unaffected by the slight European veneer of the coast towns, a great land of plain and mountain and people, suffering and mute, waiting for the future in a pathetic immobility of patience. She knew its sights and its hospitality, dispensed with a sort of slumbrous dignity in those great houses presenting long, blind walls and heavy portals to the wind-swept pastures. She was given the head of the tables, where masters and dependents sat in a simple and patriarchal state. 
The ladies of the house would talk softly in the moonlight under the orange trees of the courtyards, impressing upon her the sweetness of their voices and the something mysterious in the quietude of their lives. In the morning, the gentlemen, well mounted in braided sombreros and embroidered riding suits, with much silver on the trappings of their horses, would ride forth to escort the departing guests before committing them with grave goodbyes to the care of God at the boundary pillars of their estates. In all these households she could hear stories of political outrage, friends, relatives ruined, imprisoned, killed in the battles of senseless civil wars, barbarously executed in ferocious proscriptions, as though the government of the country had been a struggle of lust between bands of absurd devils let loose upon the land with sabres and uniforms and grandiloquent phrases. And on all the lips she found a weary desire for peace, the dread of officialdom with its nightmarish parody of administration without law, without security and without justice. She bore a whole two months of wandering very well. She had that power of resistance to fatigue which one discovers here and there in some quite frail-looking women with surprise, like a state of possession by a remarkably stubborn spirit. Don Pepe, the old Costaguana major, after much display of solicitude for the delicate lady, had ended by conferring upon her the name of the never-tired Signora. Mrs. Gould was indeed becoming a Costa Guanera. Having acquired in southern Europe a knowledge of true peasantry, she was able to appreciate the great worth of the people. She saw the man under the silent, sad-eyed beast of burden. She saw them on the road carrying loads, lonely figures upon the plain, toiling under great straw hats, with their white clothing flapping about their limbs in the wind. She remembered the villages by some group of Indian women at the fountain impressed upon her memory, by the face of some young Indian girl with a melancholy and sensual profile, raising an earthenware vessel of cool water at the door of a dark hut with a wooden porch cumbered with great brown jars. The solid wooden wheels of an ox-cart, halted with its shafts in the dust, showed the strokes of the axe, and a party of charcoal carriers, with each man's load resting above his head on the top of the low mud wall, slept stretched in a row within the strip of shade. The heavy stonework of bridges and churches left by the conquerors proclaimed the disregard of human labour, the tribute labour of vanished nations. The power of king and church was gone, but at the sight of some heavy, ruinous pile overtopping from a knoll the low mud walls of a village, Don Pepe would interrupt the tale of his campaigns to exclaim, Poor Costa Goana, before it was everything for the padres, nothing for the people, and now it is everything for those great politicos in Santa Marta, for negroes and thieves. Charles talked with the alcades, with the fiscales, with the principal people in towns and with the caballeros on the estates. The commandantes of the district offered him escorts, for he could show an authorization from the Salaco political chief of the day. How much the document had cost him in gold twenty-dollar pieces was a secret between himself, a great man in the United States, who condescended to answer the Salaco mail with his own hand, and a great man of another sort, with a dark olive complexion and shifty eyes, inhabiting then the palace of the Intendencia in Sulaco, and who piqued himself on his culture and Europeanism generally in a rather French style, because he had lived in Europe for some years, in exile, he said. However, it was pretty well known that just before this exile, he had incautiously gambled away all the cash in the customs house of a small port where a friend in power had procured for him the post of sub-collector. That youthful indiscretion had, amongst all other inconveniences, obliged him to earn his living for a time as a café waiter in Madrid but his talents must have been great, after all, since they had enabled him to retrieve his political fortune so splendidly. Charles Gould, exposing his business with an imperturbable steadiness, called him Excellency. 
the provincial excellency assumed a weary superiority, tilting his chair far back near an open window in the true Costaguana manner. The military band happened to be braying operatic selections on the plaza just then, and twice he raised his hand imperatively for silence in order to listen to a favourite passage. Exquisite, delicious, he murmured, while Charles Gould waited, standing by with inscrutable patience. Lucia, Lucia di Lammermoor, I am passionate for music, it transports me. Ha, the divine, ha, Mozart, see, divine. What is it you were saying? Of course, rumours had reached him already of the newcomer's intentions. Besides, he had received an official warning from Santa Marta. His manner was intended simply to conceal his curiosity and impress his visitor. But after he had locked up something valuable in the drawer of a large writing desk in a distant part of the room, he became very affable and walked back to his chair smartly. If you intend to build villages and assemble a population near the mine, you shall require a decree of the Minister of the Interior for that, he suggested in a business-like manner. I have already sent a memorial, said Charles Gould steadily, and I reckon now confidently upon your Excellency's favourable conclusions. The Excellency was a man of many moods. With the receipt of the money, a great mellowness had descended upon his simple soul. Unexpectedly, he fetched a deep sigh. Ah, Don Carlos, what we want is advanced men like you in the province. The lethargy, the lethargy of these aristocrats, the want of public spirit, the absence of all enterprise. I, with my profound studies in Europe, you understand... With one hand thrust into his swelling bosom, he rose and fell on his toes, and for ten minutes, almost without drawing breath, went on hurling himself intellectually to the assault of Charles Gould's polite silence. And when, stopping abruptly, he fell back into his chair, it was as though he had been beaten off from a fortress. To save his dignity, he hastened to dismiss this silent man with a solemn inclination of the head and the words pronounced with moody, fatigued condescension. You may depend upon my enlightened goodwill as long as your conduct as a good citizen deserves it. He took up a paper fan and began to cool himself with a consequential air, while Charles Gould bowed and withdrew. Then he dropped the fan at once, and stared with an appearance of wonder and perplexity at the closed door for quite a long time. At last he shrugged his shoulders as if to assure himself of his disdain. Gold, dull, no intellectuality, red hair, a true Englishman. He despised him. His face darkened. What meant this unimpressed and frigid behaviour? He was the first of the successive politicians sent out from the capital to rule the Occidental province, whom the manner of Charles Gould in official intercourse was to strike as offensively independent. Charles Gould assumed that if the appearance of listening to deplorable balderdash must form part of the price he had to pay for being left unmolested, the obligation of uttering balderdash personally was by no means included in the bargain. He drew the line there. To these provincial autocrats, before whom the peaceable population of all classes had been accustomed to tremble, the reserve of that English-looking engineer caused an uneasiness which swung to and fro between cringing and truculence. Gradually, all of them discovered that, no matter what party was in power, that man remained in most effective touch with the higher authorities in Santa Marta. This was a fact and it accounted perfectly for the Goulds being by no means so wealthy as the engineer-in-chief on the new railway could legitimately suppose. Following the advice of Don José Avellanos, who was a man of good counsel, though rendered timid by his horrible experiences of Gutzmann Bento's time, Charles Gould had kept clear of the capital. But in the current gossip of the foreign residents there he was known, with a good deal of seriousness underlying the irony, by the nickname of King of Sulaco. 
an advocate to the Costaguana Bar, a man of reputed ability and good character, member of the distinguished Moraga family possessing extensive estates in the Salaco Valley, was pointed out to strangers with a shade of mystery and respect as the agent of the San Tome mine, political, you know. He was tall, black-whiskered and discreet. It was known that he had easy access to ministers and that the numerous Costaguana generals were always anxious to dine at his house. Presidents granted him audience with facility. He corresponded actively with his maternal uncle, Don José Avellanos, but his letters, unless those expressing formally his dutiful affection, were seldom entrusted to the Costaguana post office. There the envelopes are opened indiscriminately with the frankness of a brazen and childish impudence characteristic of some Spanish-American governments. But it must be noted that about the time of the reopening of the San Tome mine, the muleteer who had been employed by Charles Gould in his preliminary travels on the Campo added his small train of animals to the thin stream of traffic carried over the mountain passes between the Santa Marta upland and the valley of Sulaco. There are no travellers by that arduous and unsafe route unless under very exceptional circumstances, and the state of inland trade did not visibly require additional transport facilities, but the man seemed to find his account in it. A few packages were always found for him whenever he took the road. Very brown and wooden, in goatskin breeches with the hair outside, he sat near the tail of his own smart mule, his great hat turned against the sun, an expression of blissful vacancy on his long face, humming day after day a love song in a plaintive key or, without a change of expression, letting out a yell at his small tropilla in front. A round little guitar hung high up on his neck, and there was a place scooped out artistically in the wood of one of his pack saddles where a tightly rolled piece of paper could be slipped in, the wooden plug replaced, and the coarse canvas nailed on again. When, in Sulaco, it was his practice to smoke and doze all day long, as though he had no care in the world, on a stone bench outside the doorway of the Casa Gould and facing the windows of the Avellanos house. Years and years ago his mother had been chief laundry woman in that family, very accomplished in the matter of clear starching. He himself had been born on one of their haciendas, His name was Bonifacio, and Don José, crossing the street about five o'clock to call on Donna Amelia, always acknowledged his humble salute by some movement of hand or head. The porters of both houses conversed lazily with him in tones of grave intimacy. His evenings he devoted to gambling, and to calls in a spirit of generous festivity upon the Pandoro girls in the more remote side streets of the town. But he, too, was a discreet man. End of Part First The Silver of the Mine Chapter 7《Part First of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad The Silver of the Mine Chapter 8 Section 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part 1 The Silver of the Mine Chapter 8, Section 1 Those of us whom business or curiosity took to Sulaco in these years before the first advent of the railway can remember the steadying effect of the San Tome mine upon the life of that remote province. The outward appearances had not changed then as they have changed since, as I am told, with cable cars running along the streets of the Constitution and carriage roads far into the country to Rinson and other villages, where the foreign merchants and the Ricos generally have their modern villas and a vast railway goods yard by the harbour which has a quayside, a long range of warehouses and quite serious organised labour troubles of its own. Nobody had ever heard of labour troubles then. The cargadores of the port formed, indeed, an unruly brotherhood of all sorts of scum with a patron saint of their own. They went on strike regularly, every bullfight day, a form of trouble that even Nostromo, at the height of his prestige, could never cope with efficiently. But the morning after each fiesta, before the Indian market women had opened their mat parasols on the plaza, 
when the snows of Higarata gleamed pale over the town on a yet black sky, the appearance of a phantom-like horseman mounted on a silver-grey mare solved the problem of labour without fail. His steed paced the lanes of the slums and the weed-grown enclosures within the old ramparts, between the black lightless cluster of huts like cow bars, like dog kennels. The horseman hammered with the butt of a heavy revolver at the doors of low pulperias, of obscene lean-to sheds sloping against the tumble-down piece of a noble wall at the wooden sides of dwellings so flimsy that the sound of snores and sleepy mutters within could be heard in the pauses of the thundering clatter of his blows. He called out men's names menacingly from the saddle, once, twice. The drowsy answers, grumpy, conciliating, savage, jocular or deprecating, came out into the silent darkness in which the horseman sat still, and presently a dark figure would flit out, coughing in the still air. Sometimes a low-toned woman cried through the window hole softly, He's coming directly, Signor." and the horseman waited silent on a motionless horse. But if perchance he had to dismount, then, after a while, from the door of that hovel or of that pulperia, with a ferocious scuffle and stifled imprecations, a cargador would fly out head first and hands abroad to sprawl under the forelegs of the silver-grey mare, who only pricked forward her sharp little ears. She was used to that work and the man, picking himself up, would walk away hastily from Nostromo's revolver, reeling a little along the street and snarling low curses. At sunrise, Captain Mitchell, coming out anxiously in his night attire onto the wooden balcony running the whole length of the OSN Company's lonely building by the shore, would see the lighters already underway, figures moving busily about the cargo cranes, Perhaps here the invaluable Nostromo, now dismounted and in the check shirt and red sash of a Mediterranean sailor, bawling orders from the end of the jetty in a stentorian voice. A fellow in a thousand. The material apparatus of perfected civilization, which obliterates the individuality of old towns under the stereotyped conveniences of modern life, had not intruded as yet. But over the worn-out antiquity of Sulaco, so characteristic with its stuccoed houses and barred windows, with the great yellowy-white walls of abandoned convents behind the rows of sombre green cypresses, that fact, very modern in its spirit, the San Tome mine, had already thrown its subtle influence. It had altered, too, the outward character of the crowds on feast days on the plaza before the open portal of the cathedral by the number of white ponchos with a green stripe affected as holiday wear by the San Tome miners. They had also adopted white hats with green cord and braid, articles of good quality which could be obtained in the storehouse of the administration for very little money. A peaceable cholo wearing these colours, unusual in Costaguana, was somehow very seldom beaten to within an inch of his life on a charge of disrespect for the town police. Neither ran he much risk of being suddenly lassoed on the road by a recruiting party of lanceros, a method of voluntary enlistment looked upon as almost legal in the Republic. Old villagers were known to have volunteered for the army in that way, but, as Don Pepe would say with a hopeless shrug to Mrs Gould, what would you, poor people, pobrecitos, pobrecitos, but the state must have its soldiers. Thus professionally spoke Don Pepe, the fighter, with pendant moustaches, a nut-brown lean face, and a clean run of a cast-iron jaw, suggesting the type of a cattle-herd horseman from the great Llanos of the south. If you will listen to an old officer of payas, senores, was the exordium of all his speeches in the aristocratic club of Sulaco, where he was admitted on account of his past services to the extinct cause of federation. The club, dating from the days of the proclamation of Costaguana's independence, boasted many names of liberators amongst its first founders. Suppressed arbitrarily innumerable times by various governments, with memories of proscriptions and of at least one wholesale massacre of its members, 
sadly assembled for a banquet by the order of a zealous military commandante. Their bodies were afterwards stripped naked and flung into the plaza out of the windows by the lowest scum of the populace. It was again flourishing at that period peacefully. It extended to strangers the large hospitality of the cool big rooms of its historic quarters in the front part of a house, once the resident of a high official of the holy office. The two wings shut up, crumbled behind the nailed doors, and what may be described as a grove of young orange trees grown in the unpaved patio concealed the utter ruin of the back part facing the gate. You turned in from the street as if entering a secluded orchard, where you came upon the foot of a disjointed staircase, guarded by a moss-stained effigy of some saintly bishop, mitred and staffed, and bearing the indignity of a broken nose meekly, with his fine stone hands crossed on his breast. The chocolate-coloured faces of servants with mops of black hair peeped at you from above. The click of billiard balls came to your ears and descending the steps you would perhaps see in the first sala, very stiff upon a straight-backed chair in a good light, Don Pepe moving his long moustaches as he spelt his way at arm's length through an old St. Tomata newspaper. His horse, a stony-hearted but persevering black brute with a hammer head, you would have seen in the street dozing motionless under an immense saddle, with its nose almost touching the curbstone of the sidewalk. Don Pepe, when down from the mountain, as the phrase often heard in Sulaco went, could also be seen in the drawing-room of the Casa Gould. He sat with modest assurance at some distance from the tea-table. With his knees close together and a kindly twinkle of drollery in his deep-set eyes, he would throw his small and ironic pleasantries into the current of conversation. There was in that man a sort of sane, humorous shrewdness, and a vein of genuine humanity so often found in simple old soldiers of proved courage who have seen much desperate service. Of course he knew nothing whatever of mining, but his employment was of a special kind. He was in charge of the whole population in the territory of the mine, which extended from the head of the gorge to where the cart track from the foot of the mountain enters the plain, crossing a stream over a little wooden bridge painted green green, the colour of hope, being also the colour of the mine. It was reported in Salaco that up there, at the mountain, Don Pepe walked about precipitous paths, girt with a great sword and in a shabby uniform with tarnished bullion epaulets of a senior major. Most miners, being Indians with big wild eyes, addressed him as Taita, father, as these barefooted people of Costaguana will address anybody who wears shoes. But it was Basilio, Mr Gould's own mozzo and the head servant of the casa, who, in all good faith and from a sense of propriety, announced him once in the solemn words, El Señor Gobernador has arrived. Don José Avellanos, then in the drawing-room, was delighted beyond measure at the aptness of the title with which he greeted the old major banteringly as soon as the latter's soldierly figure appeared in the doorway. Don Pepe only smiled in his long moustaches as much as to say, you might have found a worse name for an old soldier. And El Señor Gobernado he had remained, with his small jokes upon his function and upon his domain, where he affirmed with humorous exaggeration to Mrs Gould, no two stones could come together anywhere without the gobernador hearing the click, signora. And he would tap his ear with the tip of his forefinger knowingly. Even when the number of the miners alone rose to over six hundred, he seemed to know each of them individually, all the innumerable Jose's, Manuel's, Ignacio's, from the villages Primero, Segundo or Tercero, there were three mining villages, under his government. He could distinguish them not only by their flat, joyless faces, which to Mrs Gould look all alike, as if run into the same ancestral mould of suffering and patience, but apparently also by the infinitely graduated shades of reddish-brown, of blackish-brown, of coppery-brown backs, as the two shifts, stripped to linen drawers and leather skull-caps, mingled together with a confusion of naked limbs, of shouldered picks, swinging lamps, 
in a great shuffle of sandaled feet on the open plateau before the entrance of the main tunnel. It was a time of pause. The Indian boys leaned idly against the long line of little cradle wagons standing empty. The screeners and oar breakers squatted on their heels, smoking long cigars. The great wooden chute slanting over the edge of the tunnel plateau was silent, and only the ceaseless violent rush of water in the open flumes could be heard, murmuring fiercely, with the splash and rumble of revolving turbine wheels and the thudding march of the stamps pounding to powder the treasure rock on the plateau below. The heads of gangs distinguished by brass medals hanging on their bare breasts marshalled their squads, and at last the mountain would swallow one half of the silent crowd, while the other half would move off in long files down the zigzag paths leading to the bottom of the gorge. It was deep and Far below, a thread of vegetation winding between the blazing rock faces resembled a slender green cord in which three lumpy knots of banana patches, palm-leaf roots and shady trees marked the village one, village two, village three, housing the miners of the Gould Concession. Whole families had been moving from the first towards the spot of the Higarota range, whence the rumour of work and safety had spread over the pastoral campo, forcing its way also, even as the waters of a high flood, into the nooks and crannies of the distant blue walls of the Sierras. Father first, in a pointed straw hat, then the mother with the bigger children, generally also a diminutive donkey, all under burdens except the leader himself, or perhaps some grown girl, the pride of the family, stepping barefooted and straight as an arrow with braids of raven hair, a thick, haughty profile and no load to carry but the small guitar of the country and a pair of soft leather sandals tied together on her back. At the sight of such parties strung out on the cross-trails between the pastures or camped by the side of the royal road, travellers on horseback would remark to each other, More people going to the St. Tome mine. We shall see others tomorrow. And spurring on in the dusk, they would discuss the great news of the province, the news of the San Tome mine. A rich Englishman was going to work it, and perhaps not an Englishman, Kent Sabe, a foreigner with much money. Oh yes, it had begun. A party of men who had been to Sulaco with a herd of black bulls for the next corrida had reported that from the porch of the Posada in Ranson, only a short league from the town, the lights of the mountain were visible, twinkling above the trees. And there was a woman seen riding a horse sideways, not in the chair seat, but upon a sort of saddle, and a man's hat on her head. She walked about, too, on foot, up the mountain paths. A woman engineer, it seemed she was. What an absurdity! Impossible, senor. Si, si, una americana del norte. Ah, well, if your worship is informed, una americana, it need be something of that sort. And they would laugh a little with astonishment and scorn, keeping a wary eye on the shadows of the road, for one is liable to meet bad men when travelling late on the campo. And it was not only the men that Don Pepe knew so well, but he seemed able, with one attentive, thoughtful glance, to classify each woman, girl, or growing youth of his domain. It was only the small fry that puzzled him sometimes. He and the padre could be seen frequently side by side, meditative and gazing across the street of a village at a lot of sedate brown children, trying to sort them out, as it were, in low, consulting tones or else they would together put searching questions as to the parentage of some small, staid urchin met wandering, naked and grave, along the road with a cigar in his baby mouth, and perhaps his mother's rosary, purloined for purposes of ornamentation, hanging in a loop of beads low down on his rotund little stomach. The spiritual and temporal pastors of the mind flock were very good friends, With Dr. Monigham, the medical pastor, who had accepted the charge from Mrs. Gould and lived in the hospital building, they were on not-so-intimate terms. But no one could be on intimate terms with El Senor Doctor, who, with his twisted shoulders, drooping head, sardonic mouth and sidelong bitter glance, was mysterious and uncanny. 
The other two authorities worked in harmony. Father Roman, dried up, small, alert, wrinkled, with big round eyes, a sharp chin and a great snuff-taker, was an old campaigner too. He had shriven many simple souls on the battlefields of the Republic, kneeling by the dying on hillsides, in the long grass, in the gloom of the forests, to hear the last confession with the smell of gunpowder smoke in his nostrils, the rattle of muskets, the hum and spatter of bullets in his ears. And where was the harm if at the presbytery they had a game with a pack of greasy cards in the early evening, before Don Pepe went his last rounds to see that all the watchmen of the mine, a body organised by himself, were at their posts? For that last duty before he slept, Don Pepe did actually gird his old sword on the veranda of an unmistakable American white frame house, which Father Roman called the Presbytery. Nearby, a long, low, dark building, steeple-roofed like a vast barn with a wooden cross over the gable, was the miner's chapel. There, Father Roman said Mass every day before a sombre altarpiece representing the resurrection, the grey slab of the tombstone balanced on one corner, a figure soaring upwards, long-limbed and livid, in an oval of pallid light, and a helmeted brown legionary smitten down right across the bituminous foreground. This picture, my children, muy linda e maravillosa, Father Roman would say to some of his flock, which you behold here through the munificence of the wife of a senor administrador, has been painted in Europe, a country of saints and miracles, and much greater than our Costaguana. And he would take a pinch of snuff with unction. But when once an inquisitive spirit desired to know in what direction this Europe was situated, whether up or down the coast, Father Roman, to conceal his perplexity, became very reserved and severe. No doubt it is extremely far away, but ignorant sinners like you of the San Tome mine should think earnestly of everlasting punishment instead of inquiring into the magnitude of the earth with its countries and populations altogether beyond your understanding. With a good night, Padre, and good night, Don Pepe, the gobernador would go off holding up his sabre against his side, his body bent forward with a long, plodding stride in the dark. The jocularity proper to an innocent card game for a few cigars or a bundle of yerba was replaced at once by the stern duty mood of an officer setting out to visit the outposts of an encamped army. One loud blast of the whistle that hung from his neck provoked instantly a great shrilling of responding whistles mingled with the barking of dogs that would calm down slowly at last, away up at the head of the gorge. And in the stillness to Serenos, on guard by the bridge, would appear walking noiselessly towards him. On one side of the road, a long frame building, the store, would be closed and barricaded from end to end. Facing it, another white frame house, still longer, and with a veranda, the hospital, would have lights in the two windows of Dr. Monningham's quarters. Even the delicate foliage of a clump of pepper trees did not stir, so breathless would be the darkness warmed by the radiation of the overheated rocks. Don Pepe would stand still for a moment with the two motionless serenos before him, and abruptly high up on the sheer face of the mountain, dotted with single torches like drops of fire fallen from the two great blazing clusters of lights above, the ore shoots would begin to rattle the great clattering, shuffling noise, gathering speed and weight, would be caught up by the walls of the gorge and sent upon the plain in a growl of thunder. The Pasadero in Rinson swore that on calm nights, by listening intently, he could catch the sound in his doorway as of a storm in the mountains. To Charles Gould's fancy, it seemed that the sound must reach the uttermost limits of the province, Riding at night towards the mine, it would meet him at the edge of a little wood just beyond Rinson. There was no mistaking the growling mutter of the mountain pouring its stream of treasure under the stamps, and it came to his heart with the peculiar force of a proclamation thundered forth over the land and the marvellousness of an accomplished fact fulfilling an audacious desire. He had heard this very sound in his imagination on that far-off evening when his wife and himself, 
after a tortuous ride through a strip of forest, had reined in their horses near the stream and had gazed for the first time upon the jungle-grown solitude of the gorge. The head of a palm rose here and there. In a high ravine round the corner of the San Tome mountain, which is square like a blockhouse, the thread of a slender waterfall flashed bright and glassy through the dark green of the heavy fronds of tree ferns. Don Pepe, in attendance, rode up and, stretching his arm up the gorge, had declared with mock solemnity, Behold the very paradise of snakes, Signora. And then they had wheeled their horses and ridden back to sleep that night at Rinson. The alcalde, an old skinny moreno, a sergeant of Gutsman Bento's time, had cleared respectfully out of his house with his three pretty daughters to make room for the foreign Signora and their worships, the Caballeros. All he asked Charles Gould, whom he took for a mysterious and official person, to do for him was to remind the supreme government, el gobierno supreme, of a pension amounting to about a dollar a month to which he believed himself entitled. It had been promised to him, he affirmed, straightening his bent back martially, many years ago for my valour in the wars with the wild indios when a young man, senor. The waterfall existed no longer. The tree ferns that had luxuriated in its spray had died around the dried up pool, and the high ravine was only a big trench half filled up with the refuse of excavations and tailings. The torrent, dammed up above, sent its water rushing along the open flumes of scooped tree trunks striding on trestle legs to the turbines working the stamps on the lower plateau, the Mesa Grande of the San Tome mine. Only the memory of the waterfall, with its amazing fernery, like a hanging garden above the rocks of the gorge, was preserved in Mrs Gould's watercolour sketch. She had made it hastily one day from a cleared patch in the bushes, sitting in the shade of a roof of straw erected for her on three rough poles under Don Pepe's direction. Mrs Gould had seen it all from the beginning. The clearing of the wilderness, the making of the road, the cutting of new paths up the cliff face of San Tome. For weeks together she had lived on the spot with her husband, and she was so little in Sulaco during that year that the appearance of the Gould carriage on the Alameda would cause a social excitement. From the heavy family coaches full of stately senoras and black-eyed senoritas rolling solemnly in the shaded alley, White hands were waved towards her with animation in a flutter of greetings. Donna Emilia was down from the mountain. But not for long. Donna Emilia would be gone up to the mountain in a day or two, and her sleek carriage mules would have an easy time of it for another long spell. She had watched the erection of the first frame house put up on the lower mesa for an office and Don Pepe's quarters. She heard with a thrill of thankful emotion the first wagon-load of all rattle down the then only chute. She had stood by her husband's side, perfectly silent, and gone cold all over with excitement at the instant when the first battery of only fifteen stamps was put in motion for the first time. On the occasion when the fires under the first set of retorts in their shed had glowed far into the night, she did not retire to rest on the rough cadre set up for her in the as-yet-bare frame-house till she had seen the first spongy lump of silver yielded to the hazards of the world by the dark depths of the Gould concession. She had laid her unmercenary hands with an eagerness that made them tremble upon the first silver ingot turned out still warm from the mould and by her imaginative estimate of its power she endowed that lump of metal with a justificative conception, as though it were not a mere fact but something far-reaching and impalpable, like the true expression of an emotion or the emergence of a principle. Don Pepe, extremely interested too, looked over her shoulder with a smile that, making longitudinal folds on his face, caused it to resemble a leathern mask with a benignantly diabolic expression. Would not the muchachos of Hernandez like to get hold of this insignificant object that looks, por Dios, very much like a piece of tin, he remarked jocularly. Hernandez, the robber, 
had been an inoffensive small ranchero kidnapped with circumstances of peculiar atrocity from his home during one of the civil wars and forced to serve in the army. There his conduct as soldier was exemplary till, watching his chance, he killed his colonel and managed to get clear away. With a band of deserters who chose him for their chief, he had taken refuge beyond the wild and waterless Bolson de Tonoro. The haciendas paid him blackmail in cattle and horses. Extraordinary stories were told of his powers and of his wonderful escapes from capture. He used to ride single-handed into the villages and the little towns on the campo, driving a pack mule before him, with two revolvers in his belt, go straight to the shop or store, select what he wanted, and ride away unopposed because of the terror his exploits and his audacity inspired. Poor country people he usually left alone. The upper class were often stopped on the roads and robbed, but any unlucky official that fell into his hands was sure to get a severe flogging. The army officers did not like his name to be mentioned in their presence. His followers, mounted on stolen horses, laughed at the pursuit of the regular cavalry sent to hunt them down, and whom they took pleasure to ambush most scientifically in the broken ground of their own fastness. Expeditions had been fitted out. A price had been put upon his head. Even attempts had been made, treacherously of course, to open negotiations with him without in the slightest way affecting the even tenor of his career. At last, in true Costaguana fashion, the fiscal of Tonoro, who was ambitious of the glory of having reduced the famous Hernandez, offered him a sum of money and a safe conduct out of the country for the betrayal of his band. But Hernandez evidently was not of the stuff of which the distinguished military politicians and conspirators of Costaguana are made. This clever but common device, which frequently works like a charm in putting down revolutions, failed with the chief of vulgar salteadores. It promised well for the fiscal at first, but ended very badly for the squadron of lanceros posted by the fiscal's directions in a fold of the ground into which Hernandez had promised to lead his unsuspecting followers. They came, indeed, at the appointed time, but creeping on their hands and knees through the bush, and only let their presence be known by a general discharge of firearms which emptied many saddles. The troopers who escaped came riding very hard into Tonoro. It is said that their commanding officer, who, being better mounted, rode far ahead of the rest, afterwards got into a state of despairing intoxication and beat the ambitious fiscal severely with a flat of his sabre in the presence of his wife and daughters for bringing this disgrace upon the national army. The highest civil official of Tonoro, falling to the ground in a swoon, was further kicked all over the body and roweled with sharp spurs about the neck and face because of the great sensitiveness of his military colleagues. This gossip of the inland campo, so characteristic of the rulers of the country with its story of oppression, inefficiency, fatuous methods, treachery and savage brutality, was perfectly known to Mrs Gould. That it should be accepted with no indignant comment by people of intelligence, refinement and character as something inherent in the nature of things was one of the symptoms of degradation that had the power to exasperate her almost to the verge of despair. Still looking at the ingot of silver, she shook her head at Don Pepe's remark. If it had not been for the lawless territory of your government, Don Pepe, many an outlaw now with Hernandez would be living peaceably and happy by the honest work of his hands. Senora, cried Don Pepe with enthusiasm, it is true. It is as if God had given you the power to look into the very breasts of people. You have seen them working around you, Donna Amelia, meek as lambs, patient like their own burrows, brave like lions. I have led them to the very muzzles of guns, I who stand here before you, Signora. In the time of Paez, who was full of generosity and in courage only approached by the uncle of Don Carlos here, as far as I know. No wonder there are bandits in the campo when there are none but thieves, swindlers and sanguinary macaques to rule us in Santa Marta. However, all the same... A bandit is a bandit, and we shall have a dozen good straight Winchesters to ride with the silver down to Sulaco. 
Mrs Gould's ride with the first silver escort to Sulaco was the closing episode of what she called my camp life, before she had settled in her town life permanently, as was proper and even necessary for the wife of the administrator of such an important institution as the San Tome mine. For the San Tome mine was to become an institution, a rallying point for everything in the province that needed order and stability to live. Security seemed to flow upon this land from the mountain gorge. The authorities of Sulaco had learned that the San Tome mine could make it worth their while to leave things and people alone. This was the nearest approach to the rule of common sense and justice Charles Gould felt it possible to secure at first. In fact, the mine, with its organisation, its population growing, fiercely attached to their position of privileged safety, with its armoury, with its Dom Pepe, with its armed body of Serenos, where, it was said, many an outlaw and deserter, and even some members of Hernandez's band had found a place. The mine was a power in the land. As a certain prominent man in Santa Marta had exclaimed with a hollow laugh once when discussing the line of action taken by the Sulaco authorities at a time of political crisis, You call these men government officials? They never... They are officials of the mine, officials of the concession, I tell you. The prominent man, who was then a person in power with a lemon-coloured face and a very short and curly, not to say woolly, head of hair, went so far in his temporary discontent as to shake his yellow fist under the nose of his interlocutor and shriek, Yes, all, silence, all, I tell you, the political jefe, the chief of the police, the chief of the customs, the general, all, all are the officials of that gould. Thereupon an intrepid but low and argumentative murmur would flow on for a space in the ministerial cabinet, and the prominent man's passion would end in a cynical shrug of the shoulders. After all, he seemed to say, what did it matter, as long as the minister himself was not forgotten during his brief day of authority? But all the same, the unofficial agent of the San Tome mine, working for a good cause, had his moments of anxiety, which were reflected in his letters to Don José Avellanos, his maternal uncle. No sanguinary macaque from Santa Marta shall set foot on that part of Costaguana which lies beyond the San Tome Bridge, Don Pepe used to assure Mrs. Gould, except, of course, as an honoured guest, for a senor administrator is a deep politico. But to Charles Gould in his own room, the old major would remark with a grim and soldierly cheeriness, we are all playing our heads at this game. Don José Avellanos would mutter, Imperio min imperio, Emilia, my soul, with an air of profound self-satisfaction which somehow, in a curious way, seemed to contain a queer admixture of bodily discomfort. But that perhaps could only be visible to the initiated. And for the initiated it was a wonderful place, this drawing-room of the Casa Gould, with its momentary glimpse of the master, El Señor Administrador, older, harder, mysteriously silent, with the lines deepened on his English, ruddy, out-of-doors complexion, flitting on his thin cavalryman's legs across the doorways, either just back from the mountain or with jingling spurs and riding whip under his arm, on the point of starting for the mountain. Then Don Pepe, modestly marshal in his chair, the Llano, who seemed somehow to have found his martial jocularity, his knowledge of the world and his manner perfect for his station, in the midst of savage armed contest with his kind. Avellanos, polished and familiar, the diplomatist with his loquacity covering much caution and wisdom in delicate advice, with his manuscript of a historical work on Costaguana, entitled Fifty Years of Misrule, which... At present he thought it was not prudent, even if it were possible, to give to the world. These three, and also Donna Amelia amongst them, gracious, small and fairy-like, before the glittering tea-set, with one common master thought in their heads, with one common feeling of a tense situation, with one ever-present aim to preserve the inviolable character of the mine at every cost. And there was also to be seen Captain Mitchell, a little apart, near one of the long windows, with an air of old-fashioned, neat old bachelorhood about him, slightly pompous, in a white waistcoat, a little disregarded and unconscious of it, 
utterly in the dark and imagining himself to be in the thick of things. The good man, having spent a clear thirty years of his life on the high seas before getting what he called a shore billet, was astonished at the importance of transactions, other than related to shipping, which take place on dry land. Almost every event out of the usual daily course marked an epoch for him, or else was history, unless with his pomposity, struggling with the discomforted droop of his rubicund, rather handsome face, set off by snow-white, close hair and short whiskers, he would mutter, Ah, that, that, sir, was a mistake. End of Part First The Silver of the Mine Chapter 8 Section 1「Part First of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad The Silver of the Mine Chapter 8 Section 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Part First The Silver of the Mine Chapter 8 Section 2 The reception of the first consignment of San Tomé Silver for shipment to San Francisco in one of the OSN Company's mailboats had, of course, marked an epoch for Captain Mitchell. The ingots, packed in boxes of stiff oxhide with plaited handles, small enough to be carried easily by two men, were brought down by the serenos of the mine walking in careful couples along the half-mile or so of steep zigzag paths to the foot of the mountain. There they would be loaded into a string of two-wheeled carts, resembling roomy coffers with a door at the back, and harnessed tandem with two mules each, waiting under the guard of armed and mounted serenos. Don Pepe padlocked each door in succession, and at the signal of his whistle, the string of carts would move off, closely surrounded by the clank of spur and carbine, with jolts and cracking of whips, with a sudden deep rumble over the boundary bridge, into the land of thieves and sanguinary macaques, Don Pepe defined that crossing. Hats bobbing in the first light of the dawn on the heads of cloaked figures, Winchesters on hip, bridle hands protruding lean and brown from under the falling folds of the ponchos. The convoy skirting a little wood along the mine trail between the mud huts and low walls of Rinson increased its pace on the Camino Real, Mules urged to speed, escort galloping, Don Carlos riding alone ahead of a dust storm affording a vague vision of long ears of mules, of fluttering little green and white flags stuck upon each cart, of raised arms in a mob of sombreros with the white gleam of ranging eyes, and Don Pepe hardly visible in the rear of that rattling dust trail with a stiff seat and impassive face, rising and falling rhythmically on an ewe-necked, silver-bitted black brute with a hammerhead. The sleepy people in the little clusters of huts in the small ranches near the road recognised by the headlong sound the charge of the San Tomé silver escort toward the crumbling wall of the city on the Campo side. They came to the doors to see it dash by over ruts and stones with a clatter and clank and cracking of whips with the reckless rush and precise driving of a field battery hurrying into action and the solitary English figure of the Senor Administrator riding far ahead in the lead. In the fenced roadside paddocks, loose horses galloped wildly for a while. The heavy cattle stood up breast deep in the grass, lowing mutteringly at the flying noise. A meek Indian villager would glance back once and hasten to shove his loaded little donkey bodily against a wall out of the way of the San Tome silver escort going to the sea. A small knot of chilly leperos under the stone horse of the Almeida would mutter, Caramba, on seeing it take a wide curve at a gallop and dart into the empty street of the Constitution. For it was considered the correct thing, the only proper style, by the mule drivers of the San Tome mine, to go through the waking town from end to end without a check in the speed, as if chased by a devil. The early sunshine glowed on the delicate primrose, pale pink, pale blue fronts of the big houses with all their gates shut yet, and no face behind the iron bars of the windows. In the whole sunlit range of empty balconies along the street, only one white figure would be visible high up above the clear pavement, the wife of the Senor Administrador, 
leaning over to see the escort go by to the harbour, a mass of heavy fair hair twisted up negligently on her little head, and a lot of lace about the neck of her muslin wrapper. With a smile to her husband's single, quick, upward glance, she would watch the whole thing stream past below her feet with an orderly uproar, till she answered by a friendly sign the salute of the galloping Don Pepe, the stiff, deferential inclination with a sweep of the hat below the knee. The string of padlocked carts lengthened. The size of the escort grew bigger as the years went on. Every three months an increasing stream of treasure swept through the streets of Sulaco on its way to the strong room in the OSN Company's building by the harbour, there to await shipment to the north. Increasing in volume and of immense value also, for, as Charles Gould told his wife once with some exultation, there had never been seen anything in the world to approach the vein of the Gould concession. For them both, each passing of the escort under the balconies of the Casa Gould was like another victory gained in the conquest of peace for Sulaco. No doubt the initial action of Charles Gould had been helped at the beginning by a period of comparative peace, which occurred just about that time, and also by the general softening of manners as compared with the epochs of civil wars whence had emerged the iron tyranny of Gutzman Bento of fearful memory. In the contests that broke out at the end of his rule, which had kept peace in the country for a whole fifteen years, there was more fatuous imbecility, plenty of cruelty and suffering still, but much less of the old-time fierce and blindly ferocious political fanaticism. It was all more vile, more base, more contemptible and infinitely more manageable in the very outspoken cynicism of motives. It was more clearly a brazen-faced scramble for a constantly diminishing quantity of booty, since all enterprise had been stupidly killed in the land. Thus it came to pass that the province of Sulaco, once the field of cruel party vengeances, had become in a way one of the considerable prizes of political career. The great of the earth in Santa Marta reserved the posts in the old Occidental state to those nearest and dearest to them, nephews, brothers, husbands of favourite sisters, bosom friends, trusty supporters, or prominent supporters of whom perhaps they were afraid. It was the blessed province of great opportunities and of largest salaries, for the San Tome mine had its own unofficial pay list, whose items and amounts, fixed in consultation by Charles Gould and Senor Avellanos, were known to a prominent businessman in the United States, who for twenty minutes or so in every month gave his undivided attention to Sulaco affairs. At the same time, the material interests of all sorts, backed up by the influence of the San Tome mine, were quietly gathering substance in that part of the Republic. If, for instance, the Sulaco collectorship was generally understood in the political world of the capital to open the way to the Ministry of Finance, and so on for every official post, then, on the other hand, the despondent business circles of the Republic had come to consider the Occidental province as the promised land of safety, especially if a man managed to get on good terms with the administration of the mine. Charles Gould, excellent fellow, absolutely necessary to make sure of him before taking a single step. Get an introduction to him for Moraga, you can, the agent of the King of Sulaco, don't you know? No wonder, then, that Sir John, coming from Europe to smooth the path for his railway, had been meeting the name, and even the nickname, of Charles Gould at every turn in Costaguana. The agent of the San Tome administration in Santa Marta, a polished, well-informed gentleman, Sir John thought him, had certainly helped so greatly in bringing about the presidential tour that he began to think that there was something in the faint whispers hinting at the immense occult influence of the Gould concession. What was currently whispered was this, that the San Tome administration had, in part, at least financed the last revolution, which had brought into a five-year dictatorship Don Vincente Ribiera, a man of culture and of unblemished character, invested with a mandate of reform by the best elements of the state. Serious, well-informed men seemed to believe the fact, 
to hope for better things, for the establishment of legality, of good faith and order in public life. So much the better then, thought Sir John. He worked always on a great scale. There was a loan to the state, and a project for systematic colonisation of the Occidental province, involved in one vast scheme with the construction of the National Central Railway. Good faith, order, honesty, peace, were badly wanted for this great development of material interests. Anybody on the side of these things, and especially if able to help, had an importance in Sir John's eyes. He had not been disappointed in the King of Sulaco. The local difficulties had fallen away, as the engineer-in-chief had foretold they would, before Charles Gould's mediation. Sir John had been extremely fated in Sulaco, next to the President Dictator, a fact which might have accounted for the evident ill-humour General Montero displayed at lunch, given on board the Juno just before she was to sail, taking away from Sulaco the President Dictator and the distinguished foreign guests in his train. The Excellentissimo, the hope of honest men, as Don Jose had addressed him in a public speech delivered in the name of the Provincial Assembly of Sulaco, sat at the head of the long table, Captain Mitchell positively stony-eyed and purple in the face with the solemnity of this historical event, occupied the foot as the representative of the OSN company in Sulaco, the hosts of that informal function, with the captain of the ship and some minor officials from the shore around him. Those cheery, swarthy little gentlemen cast jovial side glances at the bottles of champagne beginning to pop behind the guests' backs in the hands of the ship's stewards. The amber wine creamed up to the rims of the glasses. Charles Gould had his place next to a foreign envoy, who, in a listless undertone, had been talking to him fitfully of hunting and shooting. The well-nourished pale face, with an eyeglass and drooping yellow moustache, made the Seigneur Administrador appear by contrast twice as sunbaked, more flaming red, a hundred times more intensely and silently alive. Don José Avellanos touched shoulders with the other foreign diplomat, a dark man with a quiet, watchful, self-confident demeanour and a touch of reserve. All etiquette being laid aside on the occasion, General Montero was the only one there in full uniform, so stiff with embroideries in front that his broad chest seemed protected by a cuirass of gold. Sir John at the beginning had got away from high places for the sake of sitting near Mrs Gould. The great financier was trying to express to her his grateful sense of her hospitality and of his obligation to her husband's enormous influence in this part of the country. When she interrupted him by a low hush, the president was going to make an informal pronouncement. The Excellentissimo was on his legs. He said only a few words, evidently deeply felt, and meant perhaps mostly for Avellanos, his old friend, as to the necessity of unremitting effort to secure the lasting welfare of the country emerging after this last struggle, he hoped, into a period of peace and material prosperity. Mrs Gould, listening to the mellow, slightly mournful voice, looking at this rotund, dark, spectacle face, at the short body, a beast to the point of infirmity, thought that this man of delicate and melancholy mind, physically almost a cripple, coming out of his retirement into a dangerous strife at the call of his fellows, had the right to speak with the authority of his self-sacrifice. And yet she was made uneasy. He was more pathetic than promising this first civilian chief of the state Costaguana had ever known, pronouncing glass in hand his simple watchwords of honesty, peace, respect for law, political good faith abroad and at home, the safeguards of national honour. He sat down. During the respectful, appreciative buzz of voices that followed the speech, General Montero raised a pair of heavy, drooping eyelids and rolled his eyes with a sort of uneasy dullness from face to face. The military backwoods hero of the party, though secretly impressed by the sudden novelties and splendours of his position, he had never been on board a ship before and had hardly ever seen the sea except from a distance, 
understood by a sort of instinct the advantage his surly, unpolished attitude of a savage fighter gave him amongst all these refined Blanco aristocrats. But why was it that nobody was looking at him, he wondered to himself angrily. He was able to spell out the print of newspapers and knew that he had performed the greatest military exploit of modern times. My husband wanted the railway, Mrs Gould said to Sir John in the general murmur of resumed conversations. All this brings nearer the sort of future we desire for the country, which has waited for it in sorrow long enough, God knows. But I will confess that the other day, during my afternoon drive, when I suddenly saw an Indian boy ride out of a wood with the red flag of a surveying party in his hand, I felt something of a shock. The future means change, an utter change. And yet, even here there are simple and picturesque things that one would like to preserve. Sir John listened, smiling. But it was his turn now to hush Mrs Gould. General Montero is going to speak, he whispered, and almost immediately added in comic alarm, Heavens, he's going to propose my own health, I believe. General Montero had risen with a jingle of steel scabbard and a ripple of glitter on his gold-embroidered breast. A heavy sword hilt appeared at his side above the edge of the table. In this gorgeous uniform with his bull neck, his hooked nose flattened on the tip upon a blue-black dyed moustache, he looked like a disguised and sinister vaquero. The drone of his voice had a strangely rasping, soulless ring. He floundered, lowering through a few vague sentences, then suddenly raising his big head and his voice together, burst out harshly. The honour of the country is in the hands of the army. I assure you I shall be faithful to it. He hesitated till his roaming eyes met Sir John's face, upon which he fixed a lurid, sleepy glance, and the figure of the lately negotiated loan came into his mind. He lifted his glass. I drink to the health of the man who brings us a million and a half of pounds. He tossed off his champagne and sat down heavily with a half-surprised, half-bullying look all round the faces, in the profound, as if appalled, silence which succeeded the felicitous toast. Sir John did not move. I don't think I am called upon to rise, he murmured to Mrs Gould. That sort of thing speaks for itself. But Don José Avellanos came to the rescue with a short oration in which he alluded pointedly to England's good will towards Costaguana. A good will, he continued significantly, of which I, having been in my time accredited to the court of St. James, am able to speak with some knowledge. Only then Sir John thought fit to respond, which he did gracefully in bad French, punctuated by bursts of applause and the hear-hears of Captain Mitchell, who was able to understand a word now and then. Directly he had done, the financier of railways turned to Mrs. Gould. You were good enough to say that you intended to ask me for something, he reminded her gallantly. What is it? Be assured that any request from you would be considered in the light of a favour to myself. She thanked him by a gracious smile. Everybody was rising from the table. Let us go on deck, she proposed, where I'll be able to point out to you the very object of my request. An enormous national flag of Costaguana, diagonal red and yellow with two green palm trees in the middle, floated lazily at the main masthead of the Juno. A multitude of fireworks being let off in their thousands at the water's edge in honour of the President kept up a mysterious crepitating noise half round the harbour. Now and then a lot of rockets swishing upwards invisibly detonated overhead with only a puff of smoke in the bright sky. Crowds of people could be seen between the town gate and the harbour, under the bunches of multicoloured flags fluttering on tall poles. Faint bursts of military music would be heard suddenly, and the remote sound of shouting. A knot of ragged negroes at the end of the wharf kept on loading and firing a small iron cannon time after time. A greyish haze of dust hung thin and motionless against the sun. Don Vincente Ribiera made a few steps under the deck awning, leaning on the arm of Senor Avellanos. 
A wide circle was formed round him, where the mirthless smile of his dark lips and the sightless glitter of his spectacles could be seen turning amiably from side to side. The informal function arranged on purpose on board the Juno to give the President Dictator an opportunity to meet intimately some of his most notable adherents in Sulaco was drawing to an end. On one side, General Montero, his bald head covered now by a plumed cocked hat, remained motionless on a skylight seat, a pair of big gauntleted hands folded on the hilt of the sabre standing upright between his legs. The white plume, the coppery tint of his broad face, the blue-black of the moustache under the curved beak, the mass of gold on sleeves and breast, the high shining boots with enormous spurs, the working nostrils, the imbecile and domineering stare of the glorious victor of Rio Seco had in them something ominous and incredible, the exaggeration of a cruel caricature, the fatuity of solemn masquerading, the atrocious grotesqueness of some military idol of Aztec conception and European bedecking awaiting the homage of worshippers. Don Jose approached diplomatically this weird and inscrutable portent, and Mrs Gould turned her fascinated eyes away at last. Charles, coming up to take leave of Sir John, heard him say as he bent over his wife's hand, Certainly, of course, my dear Mrs. Gould, for a protégé of yours, not the slightest difficulty. Consider it done. Going ashore in the same boat with the Goulds, Don José Avellanos was very silent. Even in the Gould carriage he did not open his lips for a long time. The mules trotted slowly away from the wharf between the extended hands of the beggars, who for that day seemed to have abandoned in a body the portals of churches. Charles Gould sat on the back seat and looked away upon the plain. A multitude of booths made of green boughs, of rushes, of odd pieces of plank, eked out with bits of canvas, had been erected all over it for the sale of carne, of dulces, of fruit, of cigars. Over little heaps of glowing charcoal, Indian women, squatting on mats, cooked food in black earthen pots and boiled the water for the mate goods, which they offered in soft, caressing voices to the country people. A race course had been staked out for the vaqueros, and away to the left, from where the crowd was massed thickly about a huge temporary erection, like a circus tent of wood with a conical grass roof, came the resonant twanging of harp strings, the sharp ping of guitars, with the grave drumming throb of an Indian gombo pulsating steadily through the shrill choruses of the dancers. Charles Gould said presently, All this piece of land belongs now to the railway company. There will be no more popular feasts held here. Mrs Gould was rather sorry to think so. She took this opportunity to mention how she had just obtained from Sir John the promise that the house occupied by Giorgio Viola should not be interfered with. She declared she could never understand why the survey engineers ever talked of demolishing that old building. It was not in the way of the projected harbour branch of the line in the least. She stopped the carriage before the door to reassure at once the old Genoese who came out bareheaded and stood by the carriage step. She talked to him in Italian, of course, and he thanked her with a calm dignity. An old Garibaldino was grateful to her from the bottom of his heart for keeping the roof over the heads of his wife and children. He was too old to wander any more. And is it forever, Signora? he asked. For as long as you like. Bene, then the place must be named. It was not worth while before. He smiled ruggedly with a running together of wrinkles at the corners of his eyes. I shall set about the painting of the name tomorrow. And what is it going to be, Giorgio? Albergo d'Italia Una, said the old Garibaldino, looking away for a moment. More in memory of those who have died, he added, than for the country stolen from us soldiers of liberty by the craft of that accursed Piedmontese race of kings and ministers. Mrs Gould smiled slightly, and bending over a little, began to inquire about his wife and children. He had sent them into town on that day. The padrona was better in health. Many thanks to the signora for inquiring. 
People were passing in twos and threes, in whole parties of men and women attended by trotting children. A horseman mounted on a silver-grey mare drew rein quietly in the shade of the house after taking off his hat to the party in the carriage, who returned smiles and familiar nods. Old Viola, evidently very pleased with the news he had just heard, interrupted himself for a moment to tell him rapidly that the house was secured by the kindness of the English signora for as long as he liked to keep it. The other listened attentively but made no response. When the carriage moved on, he took off his hat again, a grey sombrero with a silver cord and tassels. The bright colours of a Mexican serape twisted on the cantle, the enormous silver buttons on the embroidered leather jacket, the row of tiny silver buttons down the seam of the trousers, the snowy linen, a silk sash with embroidered ends, the silver plates on the headstall and saddle proclaimed the unapproachable style of the famous Capitas de Cargadores, a Mediterranean sailor, got up with more finished splendour than any well-to-do young ranchero of the campo had ever displayed on a high holiday. It is a great thing for me, murmured old Giorgio, still thinking of the house, for now he had grown weary of change. The signora just said a word to the Englishman. The old Englishman who has enough money to pay for a railway? He is going off in an hour, remarked Nostromo carelessly. Buono viaggio, then. I've guarded his bones all the way from the Entrada Pass down to the plain and into Sulaco, as though he had been my own father. Old Giorgio only moved his head sideways absently. Nostromo pointed after the Gould's carriage, nearing the grass-grown gate in the old town wall that was like a wall of matted jungle. And I have sat alone at night with my revolver in the company's warehouse, time and again by the side of that other Englishman's heap of silver, guarding it as though it had been my own. Viola seemed lost in thought. It is a great thing for me, he repeated again, as if to himself. It is, agreed the magnificent Capitas de Cagadores calmly. Listen, Vecchio, go in and bring me out the cigar, but don't look for it in my room. There's nothing there. Viola stepped into the cafe and came out directly, still absorbed in his idea, and tendered him a cigar, mumbling thoughtfully in his moustache, children growing up and girls too. Girls! He sighed and fell silently. What, only one, remarked Nostromo, looking down with a sort of comic inquisitiveness at the unconscious old man. No matter, he added with a lofty negligence. One is enough till another is wanted. He lit it and let the match drop from his passive fingers. Giorgio Viola looked up and said abruptly, My son would have been just such a fine young man as you, Jean Battista, if he had lived. What, your son? But you are right, Padron. If he had been like me, he would have been a man. He turned his horse slowly and paced on between the booths, checking the mare almost to a standstill now and then for children, for the groups of people from the distant campo who stared after him with admiration. The company's lighter men saluted him from afar, and the greatly envied Capitas de Cargadores advanced amongst murmurs of recognition and obsequious greetings towards the huge circus-like erection. The throng thickened, the guitars tinkled louder, other horsemen sat motionless, smoking calmly above the heads of the crowd. It eddied and pushed before the doors of the high-roofed building, whence issued a shuffle and thumping of feet in time to the dance music, vibrating and shrieking with a racking rhythm, overhung by the tremendous, sustained, hollow roar of the gombo. The barbarous and imposing noise of the big drum that can madden a crowd and that even Europeans cannot hear without a strange emotion seemed to draw Nostromo on to its source, while a man, wrapped up in a faded, torn poncho, walked by his stirrup and buffeted right and left, begged his worship insistently for employment on the wharf. He whined, offering the Senor Capitaz half his daily pay for the privilege of being admitted to the swaggering fraternity of Cargadores. The other half would be enough for him, he protested. But Captain Mitchell's right-hand man, invaluable for our work, a perfectly incorruptible fellow, 
after looking down critically at the ragged Mozzo, shook his head without a word in the uproar going on around. The man fell back, and a little further on Nostromo had to pull up. From the doors of the dance hall men and women emerged tottering, streaming with sweat, trembling in every limb, to lean, panting, with staring eyes and parted lips, against the wall of the structure, where the harps and guitars played on with mad speed in an incessant roll of thunder. Hundreds of hands clapped in there, voices shrieked, and then all at once would sink low, chanting in unison the refrain of a love song with a dying fall. A red flower, flung with a good aim from somewhere in the crowd, struck the resplendent Capitaz on the cheek. He caught it as it fell, neatly, but for some time did not turn his head. When at last he condescended to look round, the throng near him had parted to make way for a pretty Moronita, her hair held up by a small golden comb, who was walking towards him in the open space. Her arms and neck emerged plump and bare from a snowy chemisette, the blue woollen skirt with all the fullness gathered in front, scanty on the hips and tight across the back, disclosed the provoking action of her walk. She came straight on and laid her hand on the mare's neck with a timid, coquettish look upwards out of the corner of her eyes. Carido, she murmured caressingly, why do you pretend not to see me when I pass? Because I don't love thee any more, said Nostromo deliberately, after a moment of reflective silence. The hand on the mare's neck trembled suddenly. She dropped her head before all the eyes in the wide circle formed round the generous, the terrible, the inconstant Capataz de Cargadores and his Morenita. Nostromo, looking down, saw tears beginning to fall down her face. Has it come then, ever beloved of my heart, she whispered. Is it true? No, said Nostromo, looking away carelessly. It was a lie. I love thee as much as ever. Is that true? she cooed joyously, her cheeks still wet with tears. It is true. True on the life? As true as that, but thou must not ask me to swear it on the Madonna that stands in thy room. And the Capitas laughed a little in response to the grins of the crowd. She pouted, very pretty, a little uneasy. No, I will not ask for that. I can see love in your eyes. She laid her hand on his knee. Why are you trembling like this from love? She continued, while the cavernous thundering of the gombo went on without a pause. But if you love her as much as that, you must give your Paquita a gold-mounted rosary of beads for the neck of her Madonna. No, said Nostromo, looking into her uplifted, begging eyes, which suddenly turned stony with surprise. No? Then what else will your worship give me on the day of the fiesta, she asked angrily, so as not to shame me before all these people? There is no shame for thee in getting nothing from thy lover for once? True, the shame is your worship's, my poor lovers, she flared up sarcastically. Laughs were heard at her anger, at her retort. What an audacious spitfire she was. The people, aware of this scene, were calling out urgently to others in the crowd. The circle round the silver-grey mare narrowed slowly. The girl went off a pace or two, confronting the mocking curiosity of the eyes, then flung back to the stirrup, tiptoeing, her enraged face turned up to Nostromo with a pair of blazing eyes. He bent low to her in the saddle. Juan, she hissed, I could stab thee to the heart. The dreaded Capitas de Cagadores, magnificent and carelessly public in his amours, flung his arm round her neck and kissed her spluttering lips. A murmur went round. A knife, he demanded at large, holding her firmly by the shoulder. Twenty blades flashed out together in the circle. A young man in holiday attire, bounding in, thrust one in Nostromo's hand and bounded back into the ranks, very proud of himself. Nostromo had not even looked at him. Stand on my foot, he commanded the girl, who suddenly, subdued, rose lightly, and when he had her up, encircling her waist, her face near to his, he pressed the knife into her little hand. 
No, Maranita, you shall not put me to shame, he said. You shall have your present, and so that everyone should know who is your lover today, you may cut all the silver buttons off my coat. There were shouts of laughter and applause at this witty freak, while the girl passed the keen blade and the impassive rider jingled in his palm the increasing hoard of silver buttons. He eased her to the ground with both her hands full. After whispering for a while with a very strenuous face, she walked away, staring haughtily, and vanished into the crowd. The circle had broken up, and the lordly Capitas de Cargadores, the indispensable man, the tried and trusty Nostromo, the Mediterranean soldier come ashore casually to try his luck in Costaguana, rode slowly towards the harbour. The Juno was just then swinging round, and even as Nostromo reined up again to look on, a flag ran up on the improvised flagstaff erected in an ancient and dismantled little fort at the harbour entrance. Half a battery of field guns had been hurried over there from the Sulaco barracks for the purpose of firing the regulation salutes for the President Dictator and the War Minister. As the mailboat headed through the pass, the badly timed reports announced the end of Don Vicente Ribeira's first official visit to Sulaco and for Captain Mitchell the end of another historic occasion. Next time, when the hope of honest men was to come that way, a year and a half later, it was unofficially, over the mountain tracks, fleeing after a defeat on a lame mule, to be only just saved by Nostromo from an ignominious death at the hands of a mob. It was a very different event, of which Captain Mitchell used to say, It was history, history, sir, and that fellow of mine, Nostromo, you know, was right in it, absolutely making history, sir. But this event, creditable to Nostromo, was to lead immediately to another which could not be classed either as history or as a mistake in Captain Mitchell's phraseology. He had another word for it. Sir, he used to say afterwards, that was no mistake. It was a fatality, a misfortune pure and simple, sir. And that poor fellow of mine was right in it, right in the middle of it, a fatality if ever there was one. And to my mind, he has never been the same man since. End of Part First, The Silver of the Mine Chapter 8, Section 2「Second of Nostromo » by Joseph Conrad « The Isabels » Chapter 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part Second – The Isabels – Chapter 1 Through good and evil report in the varying fortune of that struggle which Don Jose had characterised in the phrase «The fate of national honesty trembles in the balance», the Gould Concession, Imperium in Imperio, had gone on working. The square mountain had gone on pouring its treasure down the wooden chutes to the unresting batteries of stamps. The lights of San Tomé had twinkled night after night upon the great limitless shadows of the Campo. Every three months the silver escort had gone down to the sea as if neither the war nor its consequences could ever affect the ancient Occidental state, secluded beyond its high barrier of the Cordillera. All the fighting took place on the other side of that mighty wall of serrated peaks, lorded over by the white dome of Higuerota, and as yet unbreached by the railway, of which only the first part, the easy campo part from Salaco to the Ivy Valley at the foot of the pass, had been laid. Neither did the telegraph line cross the mountains yet. Its poles, like slender beacons on the plain, penetrated into the forest fringe of the foothills cut by the deep avenue of the track, and its wire ended abruptly in the construction camp at the white deal table supporting a morse apparatus in a long hut of planks with a corrugated iron roof overshadowed by gigantic cedar trees, the quarters of the engineer in charge of the advanced section. The harbour was busy too with the traffic in railway material and with the movements of troops along the coast. The OSN company found much occupation for its fleet. 
Costaguana had no navy, and apart from a few Coast Guard cutters, there were no national ships except a couple of old merchant steamers used as transports. Captain Mitchell, feeling more and more in the thick of history, found time for an hour or so during an afternoon in the drawing-room of the Casa Gould, where, with a strange ignorance of the real forces at work around him, he professed himself delighted to get away from the strain of affairs. He did not know what he would have done without his invaluable Nostromo, he declared. Those confounded Costaguana politics gave him more work, he confided to Mrs Gould, than he had bargained for. Don José Avellanos had displayed in the service of the endangered Ribiera government an organising activity and an eloquence of which the echoes reached even Europe. For, after the new loan to the Ribiera government, Europe had become interested in Costaguana. The sala of the provincial assembly in the municipal buildings of Sulaco, with its portraits of the liberators on the walls and an old flag of Cortes preserved in a glass case above the president's chair, had heard all these speeches, the early one containing the impassioned declaration, Militarism is the enemy, the famous one of the trembling balance, delivered on the occasion of the vote for the raising of a second Sulaco regiment in the defence of the reforming government, and when the provinces again displayed their old flags, proscribed in Gutzman Bento's time, there was another of those great orations when Don José greeted these old emblems of the War of Independence brought out again in the name of new ideals. The old idea of federalism had disappeared. For his part, he did not wish to revive old political doctrines. They were perishable. They died. But the doctrine of political rectitude was immortal. The Second Sulaco Regiment, to whom he was presenting this flag, was going to show its valour in a contest for order, peace, progress, for the establishment of national self-respect without which, he declared with energy, we are a reproach and a byword amongst the powers of the world. Don José Avellanos loved his country. He had served it lavishly with his fortune during his diplomatic career, and the later story of his captivity and Barbara's ill usage under Gutzman Bento was well known to his listeners. It was a wonder that he had not been a victim of the ferocious and summary executions which marked the course of that tyranny, for Gutzman had ruled the country with a sombre imbecility of political fanaticism. The power of supreme government had become, in his dull mind, an object of strange worship, as if it were some sort of cruel deity. It was incarnated in himself, and his adversaries, the Federalists, were the supreme sinners, objects of hate, abhorrence and fear, as heretics would be to a convinced inquisitor. For years he had carried about the tale of the army of pacification all over the country, a captive band of such atrocious criminals who considered themselves most unfortunate at not having been summarily executed. It was a diminishing company of nearly naked skeletons, loaded with irons, covered with dirt, with vermin, with raw wounds, all men of position, of education, of wealth, who had learned to fight amongst themselves for scraps of rotten beef thrown to them by soldiers, or to beg a negro cook for a drink of muddy water in pitiful accents. Don José Avellanos, clanking his chains amongst the others, seemed only to exist in order to prove how much hunger, pain, degradation and cruel torture a human body can stand without parting with the last spark of life. Sometimes interrogatories backed by some primitive method of torture were administered to them by a commission of officers hastily assembled in a hut of sticks and branches and made pitiless by the fear for their own lives. A lucky one or two of that spectral company of prisoners would perhaps be led tottering behind a bush to be shot by a file of soldiers. Always an army chaplain, some unshaven dirty man, girt with a sword and with a tiny cross embroidered in white cotton on the left breast of a lieutenant's uniform, would follow, cigarette in the corner of the mouth, wooden stool in hand, to hear the confession and give absolution. For the citizen saviour of the country, Gutzman Bento was called thus officially in petitions, was not averse from the exercise of rational clemency. 
The irregular report of the firing squad would be heard, followed sometimes by a single finishing shot. A little bluish cloud of smoke would float up above the green bushes, and the army of pacification would move on over the savannas, through the forests, crossing rivers, invading rural pueblos, devastating the haciendas of the horrid aristocrats, occupying the inland towns in the fulfilment of its patriotic mission, and leaving behind a united land wherein the evil taint of federalism could no longer be detected in the smoke of burning houses and the smell of spilt blood. Don José Avellanos had survived that time. Perhaps, when contemptuously signifying to him his release, the citizen saviour of the country might have thought this benighted aristocrat too broken in health and spirit and fortune to be any longer dangerous. Or perhaps it may have been a simple caprice. Gutzman Bento, usually full of fanciful fears and brooding suspicions, had sudden accesses of unreasonable self-confidence when he perceived himself elevated on a pinnacle of power and safety beyond the reach of mere mortal plotters. At such times, he would impulsively command the celebration of a solemn mass of thanksgiving, which would be sung in great pomp in the cathedral of Santa Marta by the trembling subservient archbishop of his creation. He heard it sitting in a gilt armchair placed before the high altar, surrounded by the civil and military heads of his government. The unofficial world of Santa Marta would crowd into the cathedral, for it was not quite safe for anybody of mark to stay away from these manifestations of presidential piety. Having thus acknowledged the only power he was at all disposed to recognise as above himself, he would scatter acts of political grace in a sardonic wantonness of clemency. There was no other way left now to enjoy his power but by seeing his crushed adversaries crawl impotently into the light of day out of the dark noisome selves of the Collegio. Their harmlessness fed his insatiable vanity, and they could always be got hold of again. It was the rule for all the women of their families to present thanks afterwards in a special audience. The incarnation of that strange god, El Gobierno Supremo, received them standing, cocked hat on head, and exhorted them in a menacing mutter to show their gratitude by bringing up their children in fidelity to the democratic form of government which I have established for the happiness of our country his front teeth having been knocked out in some accident of his former herdsman's life, his utterance was spluttering and indistinct. He had been working for Costaguana alone in the midst of treachery and opposition. Let it cease now, lest he should become weary of forgiving. Don José Avellanos had known this forgiveness. He was broken in health and fortune deplorably enough to present a truly gratifying spectacle to the supreme chief of democratic institutions. He retired to Salaco. His wife had an estate in that province and she nursed him back to life out of the house of death and captivity. When she died, their daughter, an only child, was old enough to devote herself to poor papa. Miss Avellanos, born in Europe and educated partly in England, was a tall, grave girl with a self-possessed manner, a wide white forehead, a wealth of rich brown hair and blue eyes. The other young ladies of Sulaco stood in awe of her character and accomplishments. She was reputed to be terribly learned and serious. As to pride, it was well known that all the Corbelans were proud and her mother was a Corbelan. Don José Avellanos depended very much upon the devotion of his beloved Antonia. He accepted it in the benighted way of men who, though made in God's image, are like stone idols without sense before the smoke of certain burnt offerings. He was ruined in every way, but a man possessed of passion is not a bankrupt in life. Don José Avellanos desired passionately for his country, peace, prosperity and as the end of the preface to Fifty Years of Misrule has it, an honourable place in the comity of civilised nations. In this last phrase, the minister plenipotentiary, cruelly humiliated by the bad faith of his government towards the foreign bondholders, stands disclosed in the patriot. 
The fatuous turmoil of greedy factions succeeding the tyranny of Gutsman Bento seemed to bring his desire to the very door of opportunity. He was too old to descend personally into the centre of the arena at Santa Marta, but the men who acted there sought his advice at every step. He himself thought that he could be most useful at a distance in Sulaco. His name, his connections, his former position, his experience commanded the respect of his class. The discovery that this man, living in dignified poverty in the Corbelan town residence, opposite the Casa Gould, could dispose of material means towards the support of the cause, increased his influence. It was his open letter of appeal that decided the candidature of Don Vincente Ribiera for the presidency. Another of those informal state papers drawn up by Don José, this time in the shape of an address from the province, induced that scrupulous constitutionalist to accept the extraordinary powers conferred upon him for five years by an overwhelming vote of Congress in Santa Marta. It was a specific mandate to establish the prosperity of the people on the basis of firm peace at home and to redeem the national credit by the satisfaction of all just claims abroad. On the afternoon the news of that vote had reached Sulaco by the usual roundabout postal way through Caeta and up the coast by steamer, Don José, who had been waiting for the mail in the Goulds' drawing room, got out of the rocking chair, letting his hat fall off his knees. He rubbed his silvery short hair with both hands, speechless with the excess of joy. Amelia, my soul, he had burst out, let me embrace you, let me... Captain Mitchell, had he been there, would no doubt have made an apt remark about the dawn of a new era. But if Don José thought something of the kind, his eloquence failed him on this occasion. The inspirer of that revival of the Blanco party tottered where he stood. Mrs Gould moved forward quickly and, as she offered her cheek with a smile to her old friend, managed very cleverly to give him the support of her arm he really needed. Don José had recovered himself at once, but for a time he could do no more than murmur, Oh, you two patriots, oh, you two patriots, looking from one to the other. Vague plans of another historical work, wherein all the devotions to the regeneration of the country he loved would be enshrined for the reverent worship of posterity, flitted through his mind. The historian who had enough elevation of soul to write of Gutsman Bento, Yet this monster, imbrued in the blood of his countrymen, must not be held unreservedly to the execration of future years. It appears to be true that he too loved his country. He had given it twelve years of peace, and absolute master of lives and fortunes as he was, he died poor. His worst fault, perhaps, was not his ferocity, but his ignorance. The man who could write thus of a cruel persecutor, the passage occurs in the history of Misrule, felt at the foreshadowing of success an almost boundless affection for his two helpers, for these two young people from over the sea. Just as years ago, calmly, from the conviction of practical necessity, stronger than any abstract political doctrine, Henry Gould had drawn the sword, so now, the times being changed, Charles Gould had flung the silver of the San Tomé into the fray. The Inglés of Sulaco, the Costaguana Englishman of the third generation, was as far from being a political intriguer as his uncle from a revolutionary swashbuckler. Springing from the instinctive uprightness of their natures, their action was reasoned. They saw an opportunity and used the weapon to hand. Charles Gould's position, a commanding position in the background of that attempt to retrieve the peace and the credit of the Republic, was very clear. At the beginning, he had had to accommodate himself to existing circumstances of corruption so naively brazen as to disarm the hate of a man courageous enough not to be afraid of its irresponsible potency to ruin everything it touched. It seemed to him too contemptible for hot anger, even. He made use of it with a cold, fearless scorn, manifested rather than concealed by the forms of stony courtesy which did away with much of the ignominy of the situation. At bottom, perhaps, he suffered from it, for he was not a man of cowardly illusions, but he refused to discuss the ethical view with his wife. He trusted that, though a little disenchanted, 
She would be intelligent enough to understand that his character safeguarded the enterprise of their lives as much or more than his policy. The extraordinary development of the mine had put a great power into his hands. To feel that prosperity always at the mercy of unintelligent greed had grown irksome to him. To Mrs Gould it was humiliating. At any rate, it was dangerous. In the confidential communications passing between Charles Gould, the King of Sulaco, and the head of the silver and steel interests far away in California, the conviction was growing that any attempt made by men of education and integrity ought to be discreetly supported. You may tell your friend Avayanos that I think so, Mr Holroyd had written at the proper moment from his inviolable sanctuary within the eleven-storey high factory of great affairs. And shortly afterwards, with a credit opened by the Third Southern Bank, located next door but one to the Holroyd building, the Ribierist party in Costaguana took a practical shape under the eye of the administrator of the San Tome mine. And Don Jose, the hereditary friend of the Gould family, could say, Perhaps, my dear Carlos, I shall not have believed in vain. End of Part Second The Isabels Chapter One Part Second of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad The Isabels Chapter Two This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part Second The Isabels Chapter Two after another armed struggle, decided by Montero's victory of Rio Seco, had been added to the tale of civil wars, the honest men, as Don Jose called them, could breathe freely for the first time in half a century. The five-year mandate law became the basis of that regeneration, the passionate desire and hope for which had been the elixir of everlasting youth for Don Jose Avellanos. And when it was suddenly and not quite unexpectedly endangered by that brute Montero, it was a passionate indignation that gave him a new lease of life, as it were. Already at the time of the President Dictator's visit to Sulaco, Moraga had sounded a note of warning from Santa Marta about the War Minister. Montero and his brother made the subject of an earnest talk between the Deputy President and the Nestor Inspirer of the party. But Don Vincente, a doctor of philosophy from the Cordova University, seemed to have an exaggerated respect for military ability, whose mysteriousness, since it appeared to be altogether independent of intellect, imposed upon his imagination. The victor of Rio Seco was a popular hero. His services were so recent that the president dictator quailed before the obvious charge of political ingratitude. Great regenerating transactions were being initiated, the fresh loan, a new railway line, a vast colonisation scheme. Anything that could unsettle the public opinion in the capital was to be avoided. Don Jose bowed to these arguments and tried to dismiss from his mind the gold-laced portent in boots, and with a sabre made meaningless now at last, he hoped, in the new order of things. Less than six months after the President Dictator's visit, Sulaco learned with stupefaction of the military revolt in the name of national honour. The Minister of War, in a barrack square allocution to the officers of the artillery regiment he had been inspecting, had declared the national honour sold to foreigners. The Dictator, by his weak compliance with the demands of the European powers, for the settlement of long outstanding money claims, had showed himself unfit to rule. A letter from Moraga explained afterwards that the initiative and even the very text of the incendiary allocution came in reality from the other Montero, the ex guerrillero, the Comandante de Plaza. The energetic treatment of Dr. Monningham, sent for in haste to the mountain, who came galloping three leagues in the dark, saved Don Jose from a dangerous attack of jaundice. After getting over the shock, Don Jose refused to let himself be prostrated. Indeed, better news succeeded at first. The revolt in the capital had been suppressed after a night of fighting in the streets. 
Unfortunately, both the Monteros had been able to make their escape south to their native province of Entremontes. The hero of the Forest March, the victor of Rio Seco, had been received with frenzied acclamation in Nicoya, the provincial capital. The troops in garrison there had gone to him in a body. The brothers were organising an army, gathering malcontents, sending emissaries primed with patriotic lies to the people and with promises of plunder to the wild llaneros. Even a Monterist press had come into existence, speaking oracularly of the secret promises of support given by our great sister republic of the north against the sinister land-grabbing designs of European powers, cursing in every issue the miserable Ribiera, who had plotted to deliver his country bound hand and foot for a prey to foreign speculators. Sulaco, pastoral and sleepy, with its opulent campo and the rich silver mine, heard the din of arms fitfully in its fortunate isolation. It was, nevertheless, in the very forefront of the defence with men and money, but the very rumours reached it circuitously, from abroad even, so much was it cut off from the rest of the Republic, not only by natural obstacles, but also by the vicissitudes of the war. The Monteristos were besieging Caeta, an important postal link, the overland couriers ceased to come across the mountains, and no muleteer would consent to risk the journey at last. Even Bonifacio on one occasion failed to return from Santa Marta, either not daring to start, or perhaps captured by the parties of the enemy raiding the country between the Cordillera and the capital. Monterist publications, however, found their way into the province, mysteriously enough, and also Monterist emissaries preaching death to aristocrats in the villages and towns of the Campo. Very early at the beginning of the trouble, Hernandez, the bandit, had proposed, through the agency of an old priest of a village in the wilds, to deliver two of them to the Ribierist authorities in Tonoro. They had come to offer him a free pardon and the rank of colonel from General Montero in consideration of joining the rebel army with his mounted band, no notice was taken at the time of the proposal. It was joined, as an evidence of good faith, to a partition praying the Sulaco Assembly for permission to enlist with all his followers in the forces then being raised in Sulaco for the defence of the five-year mandate of regeneration. The petition, like everything else, had found its way into Don Jose's hands. He had showed to Mrs Gould these pages of dirty greyish rough paper, perhaps looted in some village store, covered with the crabbed, illiterate handwriting of the old padre, carried off from his hut by the side of a mud-walled church to be the secretary of the dreaded Saltiador. They had both bent in the lamplight of the Gould drawing-room over the document containing the fierce and yet humble appeal of the man against the blind and stupid barbarity turning an honest ranchero into a bandit. A postscript of the priest stated that, but for being deprived of his liberty for ten days, he had been treated with humanity and the respect due to his sacred calling. He had been, it appears, confessing and absolving the chief and most of the band, and he guaranteed the sincerity of their good disposition. He had distributed heavy penances, no doubt in the way of litanies and fasts, but he argued shrewdly that it would be difficult for them to make their peace with God durably till they had made peace with men. Never before, perhaps, had Hernandez's head been in less jeopardy than when he petitioned humbly for permission to buy a pardon for himself and his gang of deserters by armed service. He could range afar from the wastelands protecting his fastness unchecked, because there were no troopers left in the whole province. The usual garrison of Sulaco had gone south to the war, with its brass band playing the Bolivar March on the bridge of one of the OSN company's steamers. The great family coaches drawn up along the shore of the harbour were made to rock on the high leathern springs by the enthusiasm of the senoras and the senoritas standing up to wave their lace handkerchiefs as lighter after lighter packed full of troops left the end of the jetty. Nostromo directed the embarkation, under the superintendence of Captain Mitchell, red-faced in the sun, conspicuous in a white waistcoat, representing the allied and anxious goodwill of all the material interests of civilization. 
General Barrios, who commanded the troops, assured Don José on parting that in three weeks he would have Montero in a wooden cage drawn by three pairs of oxen, ready for a tour through all the towns of the Republic. And then, Senora, he continued, bearing his curly, iron-grey head to Mrs. Gould in her landau, and then, Senora, we shall convert our swords into ploughshares and grow rich. Even I myself, as soon as this little business is settled, shall open a fundacion on some land I have on the Llanos and try to make a little money in peace and quietness. Senora, you know, all Costa Guana knows, what do I say? This whole South American continent knows that Pablo Barrios has had his fill of military glory. Charles Gould was not present at the anxious and patriotic send-off. It was not his part to see the soldiers embark. It was neither his part, nor his inclination, nor his policy. His part, his inclination and his policy were united in one endeavour to keep unchecked the flow of treasure he had started single-handed from the reopened scar in the flank of the mountain. As the mine developed, he had trained for himself some native help. There were foremen, artificers and clerks, with Don Pepe for the gobernador of the mining population. For the rest, his shoulders alone sustained the whole weight of the imperium in imperio, the great Gould concession, whose mere shadow had been enough to crush the life out of his father. Mrs Gould had no silver mine to look after. In the general life of the Gould Concession, she was represented by her two lieutenants, the doctor and the priest. But she fed her woman's love of excitement on events whose significance was purified to her by the fire of her imaginative purpose. On that day, she had brought the Avianos, father and daughter, down to the harbour with her. Amongst his other activities of that stirring time, Don José had become the chairman of a patriotic committee which had armed a great proportion of troops in the Sulaco command with an improved model of a military rifle. It had been just discarded for something still more deadly by one of the great European powers. How much of the market price for second-hand weapons was covered by the voluntary contributions of the principal families and how much came from those funds Don José was understood to command abroad, remained a secret which he alone could have disclosed. But the Ricos, as the populace called them, had contributed under the pressure of their Nestor's eloquence. Some of the more enthusiastic ladies had been moved to bring offerings of jewels into the hands of the man who was the life and soul of the party. There were moments when both his life and his soul seemed overtaxed by so many years of undiscouraged belief in regeneration. He appeared almost inanimate, sitting rigidly by the side of Mrs Gould in the Landau, with his fine old clean-shaven face of a uniform tint as if modelled in yellow wax, shaded by a soft felt hat, the dark eyes looking out fixedly. Antonio... The beautiful Andonia, as Miss Avianos was called in Sulaco, leaned back, facing them. And her full figure, the grave oval of her face with full red lips, made her look more mature than Mrs Gould, with her mobile expression and small, erect person under a slightly swaying sunshade. Whenever possible, Antonia attended her father. Her recognised devotion weakened the shocking effect of her scorn for the rigid conventions regulating the life of Spanish-American girlhood. And in truth, she was no longer girlish. It was said that she often wrote state papers from her father's dictation and was allowed to read all the books in his library. At the receptions, where the situation was saved by the presence of a very decrepit old lady, a relation of the Corbelans, quite deaf and motionless in an armchair, Antonia could hold her own in a discussion with two or three men at a time. Obviously she was not the girl to be content with peeping through a barred window at a cloaked figure of a lover ensconced in a doorway opposite, which is the correct form of Costaguana courtship. It was generally believed that with her foreign upbringing and foreign ideas, the learned and proud Antonia would never marry, unless indeed she married a foreigner from Europe or North America, now that Sulaco seemed on the point of being invaded by all the world. End of part second. The Isabels.
Chapter 2 Part 2nd of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad The Isabels Chapter 3 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Part 2nd The Isabels Chapter 3 when General Barrios stopped to address Mrs. Gould, Antonia raised negligently her hand, holding an open fan, as if to shade from the sun her head, wrapped in a light lace shawl. The clear gleam of her blue eyes, gliding behind the black fringe of eyelashes, paused for a moment upon her father, then travelled further to the figure of a young man of thirty at most, of medium height, rather thick-set, wearing a light overcoat, Bearing down with the open palm of his hand upon the knob of a flexible cane, he had been looking on from a distance. But directly he saw himself noticed, he approached quietly and put his elbow over the door of the lander. The shirt collar cut low in the neck, the big bow of his cravat, the style of his clothing from the round hat to the varnished shoes suggested an idea of French elegance, but otherwise he was the very type of a fair Spanish creole. The fluffy moustache and the short, curly, golden beard did not conceal his lips, rosy, fresh, almost pouting in expression. His full, round face was of that warm, healthy, creole white which is never tanned by its native sunshine. Martin de Coux was seldom exposed to the Costaguana sun under which he was born. His people had been long settled in Paris, where he had studied law, had dabbled in literature, had hoped now and then, in moments of exultation, to become a poet like that other foreigner of Spanish blood, José María Heredia. In other moments he had, to pass the time, condescended to write articles on European affairs for the Seminario, the principal newspaper in Santa Marta, which printed them under the heading From Our Special Correspondent, though the authorship was an open secret. Everybody in Costaguana, where the tale of compatriots in Europe is jealously kept, knew that it was the Sun de Coup, a talented young man, supposed to be moving in the higher spheres of society. As a matter of fact, he was an idle boulevardier, in touch with some smart journalists, made free of a few newspaper offices, and welcomed in the pleasure haunts of pressmen. This life, whose dreary superficiality is covered by the glitter of universal blag, like the stupid clowning of a harlequin by the spangles of a motley costume, induced in him a Frenchified but most un-French cosmopolitanism, in reality a mere barren indifferentism posing as intellectual superiority. Of his own country, he used to say to his French associates, imagine an atmosphere of opera buffa in which all the comic business of stage statesmen, brigands, etc., etc., all their farcical stealing, intriguing and stabbing is done in dead earnest. It is screamingly funny. The blood flows all the time and the actors believe themselves to be influencing the fate of the universe. Of course, government in general, any government anywhere, is a thing of exquisite comicality to a discerning mind, but really we Spanish-Americans do overstep the bounds. No man of ordinary intelligence can take part in the intrigues of une face macabre. However, these Ribierists, of whom we hear so much just now, are really trying in their own comical way to make the country habitable and even to pay some of its debts. My friends, you had better write up, Signor Rebiera, all you can in kindness to your own bondholders. Really, if what I am told in my letters is true, there is some chance for them at last. And he would explain with railing verve what Don Vincente Ribiera stood for, a mournful little man oppressed by his own good intentions, the significance of battles won, who Montero was, un grotesque vaniteur et feroce, and the manner of the new loan connected with railway development and the colonisation of vast tracts of land in one great financial scheme. And his French friends would remark that evidently this little fellow, Descoux, connaissait la question en a fond. An important Parisian review asked him for an article on the situation. It was composed in a serious tone and in a spirit of levity. Afterwards he asked one of his intimates, 
Have you read my thing about the regeneration of Costaguana? Un bon blague, hein? He imagined himself Parisian to the tips of his fingers. But far from being that, he was in danger of remaining a sort of nondescript dilettante all his life. He had pushed the habit of universal raillery to a point where it blinded him to the genuine impulses of his own nature. To be suddenly selected for the executive member of the Patriotic Small Arms Committee of Sulaco seemed to him the height of the unexpected, one of those fantastic moves of which only his dear countrymen were capable. It's like a tile falling on my head. I, I, executive member, it's the first I hear of it. What do I know of military rifles? Say funambulesque, he had exclaimed to his favourite sister. For the Decou family, except the old father and mother, used the French language amongst themselves. And you should see the explanatory and confidential letter, eight pages of it, no less. This letter, in Antonio's handwriting, was signed by Don José, who appealed to the young and gifted Costa Guanero on public grounds, and privately opened his heart to his talented godson, a man of wealth and leisure, with wide relations, and by his parentage in bringing up worthy of all confidence. Which means, Martin commented cynically to his sister, that I am not likely to misappropriate the funds or go blabbing to our chargé d'affaires here. The whole thing was being carried out behind the back of the war minister, Montero, a mistrusted member of the Ribiera government, but difficult to get rid of at once. He was not to know anything of it till the troops under Barrios's command had the new rifle in their hands. The president dictator, whose position was very difficult, was alone in the secret. How funny, commented Martin's sister and confidant, to which the brother, with an air of best Parisian blague, had retorted, It's immense! The idea of that chief of the state engaged with the help of private citizens in digging a mine under his own indispensable war minister. No, we are unapproachable! And he laughed immoderately. Afterwards, his sister was surprised at the earnestness and ability he displayed in carrying out his mission, which circumstances made delicate, and his want of special knowledge rendered difficult. She had never seen Martin take so much trouble about anything in his whole life. It amuses me, he had explained briefly. I am beset by a lot of swindlers trying to sell all sorts of gas pipe weapons. They are charming. They invite me to expensive luncheons. I keep up their hopes. It's extremely entertaining. Meanwhile, the real affair has been carried through in quite another quarter. When the business was concluded, he declared suddenly his intention of seeing the precious consignment delivered safely in Sulaco. The whole burlesque business, he thought, was worth following up to the end. He mumbled his excuses, tugging at his golden beard before the acute young lady who, after the first wide stare of astonishment, looked at him with narrowed eyes and pronounced slowly, I believe you want to see Antonia. What Antonia? asked the Costaguana Boulevardier in a vexed and disdainful tone. He shrugged his shoulders and spun round on his heel. His sister called out after him joyously, The Antonia used to know when she wore her hair in two plaits down her back. He had known her some eight years since, shortly before the Avianos had left Europe for good, as a tall girl of sixteen, youthfully austere, and of a character already so formed that she ventured to treat slightingly his pose of disabused wisdom. On one occasion, as though she had lost all patience, she flew out at him about the aimlessness of his life and the levity of his opinions. He was twenty then, an only son, spoiled by his adoring family. This attack disconcerted him so greatly that he had faltered in his affectation of amused superiority before that insignificant chit of a schoolgirl. But the impression left was so strong that ever since all the girlfriends of his sisters recalled to him Antonia Avellanos by some faint resemblance or by the great force of contrast. It was, he told himself, like a ridiculous fatality. And of course, in the news, the Decus received regularly from Costaguana the name of their friends, the Avellanos, cropped up frequently. The arrest and the abominable treatment of the ex-minister the dangers and hardships endured by the family, its withdrawal in poverty to Sulaco, the death of the mother. 
The Monterist pronunciamento had taken place before Martin Decoux reached Costa Guana. He came out in a roundabout way through Magellan Straits by the main line in the West Coast service of the OSN company. His precious consignment arrived just in time to convert the first feelings of consternation into a mood of hope and resolution. Publicly he was made much of by the familias principales. Privately Don José, still shaken and weak, embraced him with tears in his eyes. You have come out of yourself, no less could be expected from a decou. Alas, our worst fears have been realised, he moaned affectionately. And again he hugged his godson. This was indeed the time for men of intellect and conscience to rally round the endangered cause. It was then that Martin Decou, the adopted child of Western Europe, felt the absolute change of atmosphere. He submitted to being embraced and talked to without a word. He was moved in spite of himself by that note of passion and sorrow unknown on the more refined stage of European politics. But when the tall Antonia, advancing with her light step in the dimness of the big bare sala of the Avellanos house, offered him her hand in her emancipated way, and murmured, I am glad to see you here, Don Martin. He felt how impossible it would be to tell these two people that he had intended to go away by the next month's packet. Don Jose, meantime, continued his praises. Every accession added to public confidence, and besides, what an example to the young men at home from the brilliant defender of the country's regeneration, the worthy expounder of the party's political faith before the world. Everybody had read the magnificent articles in the famous Parisian Review. The world was now informed, and the author's appearance at this moment was like a public act of faith. Young Deku felt overcome by a feeling of impatient confusion. His plan had been to return by way of the United States through California, visit Yellowstone Park, see Chicago, Niagara, have a look at Canada, perhaps make a short stay in New York, a longer one in Newport, use his letters of introduction. The pressure of Antonia's hand was so frank, the tone of her voice was so unexpectedly unchanged in its approving warmth, that all he found to say after his low bow was, I am inexpressibly grateful for your welcome, but why need a man be thanked for returning to his native country? I am sure Donna Antonia does not think so. Certainly not, Signor, she said with that perfectly calm openness of manner which characterised all her utterances. But when he returns, as you return, one may be glad for the sake of both. Martin Decoux said nothing of his plans. He not only never breathed a word of them to anyone, but only a fortnight later asked the mistress of the Casa Gould, where he had, of course, obtained admission at once, leaning forward in his chair with an air of well-bred familiarity, whether she could not detect in him that day a marked change, an air he explained of more excellent gravity. At this, Mrs. Gould turned her face full towards him with the silent inquiry of slightly widened eyes and the merest ghost of a smile, an habitual movement with her which was very fascinating to men by something subtly devoted, finally self-forgetful in its lively readiness of attention. Because, Deku continued imperturbably, he felt no longer an idol encumberer of the earth, she was, he assured her, actually beholding at that moment the journalist of Sulaco. At once Mrs. Gould glanced towards Antonia, posed upright in the corner of a high, straight-backed Spanish sofa, a large black fan waving slowly against the curves of her fine figure, the tips of crossed feet peeping from under the hem of the black skirt. Decoux's eyes also remained fixed there, while in an undertone he added that Miss Savellanos was quite aware of his new and unexpected vocation, which in Costaguana was generally the specialty of half-educated negroes and wholly penniless lawyers. Then, confronting with a sort of urbane effrontery Mrs Gould's gaze, now turned sympathetically upon himself, he breathed out the words, Pro Patria. What had happened was that he had all at once yielded to Don Jose's pressing entreaties to take the direction of a newspaper that would voice the aspirations of the province. 
It had been Don Jose's old and cherished idea. The necessary plant, on a modest scale, and a large consignment of paper had been received from America some time before. The right man alone was wanted. Even Senor Moraga in Santa Marta had not been able to find one, and the matter was now becoming pressing. Some organ was absolutely needed to counteract the effect of the lies disseminated by the Monterist press, the atrocious calumnies, the appeals to the people calling upon them to rise with their knives in their hands and put an end once for all to the Blancos, to these Gothic remnants, to these sinister mummies, these impotent paralyticos who plotted with foreigners for the surrender of the lands and the slavery of the people. The clamour of this Negro liberalism frightened Senor Avellanos. A newspaper was the only remedy. And now that the right man had been found in Deku, great black letters appeared painted between the windows above the arcaded ground floor of a house on the plaza. It was next to Anzani's great emporium of boots, silks, ironware, muslins, wooden toys, tiny silver arms, legs, heads, hearts photo offerings, rosaries, champagne, women's hats, patent medicines, even a few dusty books in paper covers and mostly in the French language. The big black letters formed the words Officers of the Port Veneer. From these officers a single folded sheet of Martin's journalism issued three times a week and the sleek yellow Anzani, prowling in a suit of ample black and carpet slippers before the many doors of his establishment, greeted by a deep, sidelong inclination of his body the journalist of Sulaco, going to and fro on the business of his august calling. End of Part 2 The Isabels Chapter 3Part 2nd of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad The Isabels Chapter 4 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Part 2nd The Isabels Chapter 4 Perhaps it was in the exercise of his calling that he had come to see the troops depart. The poor veneer of the day after next would no doubt relate the event, but its editor, leaning his side against the landau, seemed to look at nothing. The front rank of the company of infantry, drawn up three deep across the shore end of the jetty when pressed too close, would bring their bayonets to the charge ferociously with an awful rattle, and then the crowd of spectators swayed back bodily, even under the noses of the big white mules. Notwithstanding the great multitude, there was only a low muttering noise, the dust hung in a brown haze, in which the horsemen, wedged in the throng here and there, towered from the hips upwards, gazing all one way over the heads. Almost every one of them had mounted a friend, who steadied himself with both hands, grasping his shoulders from behind, and the rims of their hats touching, made like one disc sustaining the cones of two pointed crowns with a double face underneath. A horse mozzo would bawl out something to an acquaintance in the ranks, or a woman would shriek suddenly the word Adios, followed by the Christian name of a man. General Barrios, in a shabby blue tunic and white pig-top trousers falling upon strange red boots, kept his head uncovered and stooped slightly, propping himself up with a thick stick. No! He had earned enough military glory to satiate any man he insisted to Mrs. Gould, trying at the same time to put an air of gallantry into his attitude. A few jetty hairs hung sparsely from his upper lip. He had a salient nose, a thin long jaw, and a black silk patch over one eye. His other eye, small and deep-set, twinkled erratically in all directions, aimlessly affable. The few European spectators, all men, who had naturally drifted into the neighbourhood of the Gould carriage, betrayed by the solemnity of their faces their impression that the general must have had too much punch, Swedish punch imported in bottles by Anzani, at the Amarilla Club before he had started with his staff on a furious ride to the harbour. But Mrs Gould bent forward, self-possessed, and declared her conviction that still more glory awaited the general in the near future. 
Signora, he remonstrated with great feeling, in the name of God, reflect, how can there be any glory for a man like me in overcoming that bold-headed imbostero with the dyed moustaches? Pablo Ignacio Barrios, son of a village alcalde, general of division, commanding-in-chief the Occidental Military District, did not frequent the higher society of the town. He preferred the unceremonious gatherings of men where he could tell jaguar hunt stories, boast of his powers with the lasso, with which he could perform extremely difficult feats of the sort no married man should attempt, as the saying goes amongst the laneros. Relate tales of extraordinary night rides, encounters with wild bulls, struggles with crocodiles, adventures in the great forests, crossings of swollen rivers. And it was not mere boastfulness that prompted the general's reminiscences, but a genuine love of that wild life which he had led in his young days before he turned his back forever on the thatched roof of the parental tolderia in the woods. Wandering away as far as Mexico, he had fought against the French by the side, as he said, of Juarez, and was the only military man of Costaguana who had ever encountered European troops in the field. That fact shed a great lustre upon his name till it became eclipsed by the rising star of Montero. All his life he had been an inveterate gambler. He alluded himself quite openly to the current story how once, during some campaign when in command of a brigade, he had gambled away his horse, pistols and accoutrements to the very epaulets playing Monty with his colonels the night before the battle. Finally, he had sent under escort his sword, a presentation sword with a gold hilt to the town in the rear of his position, to be immediately pledged for 500 pesetas with a sleepy and frightened shopkeeper. By daybreak, he had lost the last of that money too, when his only remark as he rose calmly was, Now let us go and fight to the death. From that time he had become aware that a general could lead his troops into battle very well with a simple stick in his hand. It has been my custom ever since, he would say. He was always overwhelmed with debts, even during the periods of splendour in his varied fortunes of a Costaguana general when he held high military commands. His gold-laced uniforms were almost always in pawn with some tradesman and at last, to avoid the incessant difficulties of costume caused by the anxious lenders, he had assumed a disdain of military trappings, an eccentric fashion of shabby old tunics, which had become like a second nature. But the faction Barrios joined needed to fear no political betrayal. He was too much of a real soldier for the ignoble traffic of buying and selling victories. A member of the foreign diplomatic body in Santa Marta had once passed a judgment upon him. Barrios is a man of perfect honesty and even of some talent for war, mais il manque de tenue. After the triumph of the Ribierists, he had obtained the reputedly lucrative Occidental command, mainly through the exertions of his creditors, the Santa Marta shopkeepers, all great politicians who moved heaven and earth in his interest publicly and privately besieged Senor Moraga, the influential agent of the San Tome mine, with the exaggerated lamentations that, if the general were passed over, we shall all be ruined. An incidental but favourable mention of his name in Mr Gould Senior's long correspondence with his son had something to do with his appointment too, but most of all, undoubtedly, his established political honesty. No one questioned the personal bravery of the tiger killer, as the populace called him. He was, however, said to be unlucky in the field, but this was to be the beginning of an era of peace. The soldiers liked him for his humane temper, which was like a strange and precious flower unexpectedly blooming on the hotbed of corrupt revolutions. And when he rode slowly through the streets during some military display, the contemptuous good humour of his solitary eye roaming over the crowds extorted the acclamations of the populace. The women of that class especially seemed positively fascinated by the long drooping nose, the peaked chin, the heavy lower lip, the black silk eye patch, and the band slanting rakishly over the forehead. 
His high rank always procured an audience of caballeros for his sporting stories, which he detailed very well with a simple, grave enjoyment. As to the society of ladies, it was irksome by the restraints it imposed without any equivalent as far as he could see. He had not perhaps spoken three times on the whole to Mrs Gould since he had taken up his high command, but he had observed her frequently riding with the Signor Administrador, and had pronounced that there was more sense in her little bridle hand than in all the female heads in Sulaco. His impulse had been to be very civil on parting to a woman who did not wobble in the saddle, and happened to be the wife of a personality very important to a man always short of money. He even pushed his attention so far as to desire the aide-de-camp at his side, a thick-set, short captain with a tartar physiognomy, to bring along a corporal with a file of men in front of the carriage, lest the crowd and its backward surges should incommode the mules of the signora. Then, turning to a small knot of silent Europeans, looking on within earshot, he raised his voice protectingly. Senores, have no apprehension. Go on quietly, making your fellow carry your railways, your telegraphs, your... Uh, there's enough wealth in Costaguana to pay for everything, or else you would not be here. Ha <laughs> ha! Don't mind this little Picardia of my friend Montero. In a little while you shall behold his dyed moustaches through the bars of a strong wooden cage. Si, senores, fear nothing. Develop the country. Work work. The little group of engineers received this exhortation without a word, and after waving his hand at them loftily, he addressed himself again to Mrs. Gould. That is what Don Jose says we must do. Be enterprising. Work, grow rich. To put Montero in the cage is my work, and when that insignificant piece of business is done, then, as Don Jose wishes us, we shall grow rich, one and all, like so many Englishmen, because it is money that saves the country, and... But a young officer, in a very new uniform, hurrying up from the direction of the jetty, interrupted his interpretation of Senor Avellanos's ideals. The general made a movement of impatience. The other went on talking to him insistently with an air of respect. The horses of the staff had been embarked, the steamer's gig was awaiting the general at the boat steps, and Barrios, after a fierce stare of his one eye, began to take leave. Don Jose roused himself for an appropriate phrase pronounced mechanically. The terrible strain of hope and fear was telling on him, and he seemed to husband the last sparks of his fire for these oratorical effects of which even the distant Europe was to hear. Antonia, her red lips firmly closed, averted her head behind the raised fan. And young Deku, though he felt the girl's eyes upon him, gazed away persistently, hooked on his elbow with a scornful and complete detachment. Mrs Gould heroically concealed her dismay at the appearance of men and events so remote from her racial conventions, dismay too deep to be uttered in words even to her husband. She understood his voiceless reserve better now. Their confidential intercourse fell not in moments of privacy, but precisely in public, when the quick meeting of their glances would comment upon some fresh turn of events. She had gone to his school of uncompromising silence, the only one possible, since so much that seemed shocking, weird and grotesque in the working out of their purposes had to be accepted as normal in this country. Decidedly, the stately Antonia looked more mature and infinitely calm. But she would never have known how to reconcile the sudden sinkings of her heart with an amiable mobility of expression. Mrs Gould smiled a goodbye at Barrios, nodded round to the Europeans, who raised their hats simultaneously with an engaging invitation. I hope to see you all presently at home. Then said nervously to Decoux, Get in, Don Martin, and heard him mutter to himself in French as he opened the carriage door, Le saut on est jeté. She heard him with a sort of exasperation. Nobody ought to have known better than himself that the first cast of dice had already been thrown long ago in a most desperate game. 
Distant acclamations, words of command yelled out, and a roll of drums on the jetty greeted the departing general. Something like a slight faintness came over her, and she looked blankly at Antonia's still face, wondering what would happen to Charlie if that absurd man failed. A la casa, Ignacio, she cried at the motionless broad back of the coachman, who gathered the reins without haste, mumbling to himself under his breath, Si la casa, si, si, Nina. The carriage rolled noiselessly on the soft track. The shadows fell long on the dusty little plain interspersed with dark bushes, mounds of turned-up earth, low wooden buildings with iron roofs of the railway company. The sparse row of telegraph poles strode obliquely clear of the town, bearing a single, almost invisible wire far into the great campo, like a slender, vibrating feeler of that progress, waiting outside for a moment of peace to enter and twine itself about the weary heart of the land. The café window of the Albergo d'Italia Una was full of sunburnt, whiskered faces of railwaymen. But at the other end of the house, the end of the Signori Inglesi, old Giorgio, at the door with one of his girls on each side, bared his bushy head as white as the snows of Higgerota. Mrs Gould stopped the carriage. She seldom failed to speak to her protégé. Moreover, the excitement, the heat and the dust had made her thirsty. She asked for a glass of water. Giorgio sent the children indoors for it and approached with pleasure expressed in his whole rugged countenance. It was not often that he had occasion to see his benefactress, who was also an Englishwoman, another title to his regard. He offered some excuses for his wife. It was a bad day with her. Her oppressions... He tapped his own broad chest. She could not move from her chair that day. Deku, ensconced in the corner of his seat, observed gloomily Mrs Gould's old revolutionist, and then, offhand, well, and what do you think of it all, Garibaldino? Old Giorgio, looking at him with some curiosity, said civilly that the troops had marched very well. One eyed Barrios and his officers had done wonders with the recruits in a short time. Those Indios only caught the other day had gone swinging past in double quick time, like Bersaglieri. They looked well fed too and had whole uniforms. Uniforms, he repeated with a half smile of pity. A look of grim retrospect stole over his piercing, steady eyes. It had been otherwise in his time, when men fought against tyranny in the forests of Brazil or on the plains of Uruguay, starving on half-raw beef without salt, half-naked, with often only a knife tied to a stick for a weapon. And yet we used to prevail against the oppressor, he concluded proudly. His animation fell. The slight gesture of his hand expressed discouragement. But he added that he had asked one of the sergeants to show him the new rifle. There was no such weapon in his fighting days, and if Barrios could not... Yes, yes, broke in Don Jose, almost trembling with eagerness. We are safe. The good Senor Viola is a man of experience, extremely deadly. Is it not so? You have accomplished your mission admirably, my dear Martin. Decou, lolling back moodily, contemplated old Viola. Ah, yes, a man of experience. But who are you for, really, in your heart? Mrs Gould leaned over to the children. Linda had brought out a glass of water on a tray with extreme care. Giselle presented her with a bunch of flowers gathered hastily. For the people, declared old Viola sternly. We are all for the people in the end. Yes, muttered old Viola savagely, and in the meantime they fight for you, blind, esclavos. At that moment, young Scarf of the railway staff emerged from the door of the part reserved for the Signori Inglesi. He had come down to headquarters from somewhere up the line on a light engine and had had just time to get a bath and change his clothes. He was a nice boy and Mrs Gould welcomed him. It's a delightful surprise to see you, Mrs Gould. I've just come down. Unusual luck. Missed everything, of course. This show is just over, and I hear there's been a great dance at Don Jose Lopez's last night. Is it true? 
The young patricians, Decoux began suddenly in his precise English, have indeed been dancing before they started off to the war with the great Pompey. Young Scarf stared, astounded. You haven't met before, Mrs Gould intervened. Mr Decoux, Mr Scarf. Ah, but we are not going to Farsalia, protested Don Jose with nervous haste, also in English. You should not jest like this, Martin. Antonia's breast rose and fell with a deeper breath. The young engineer was utterly in the dark. Great what? he muttered vaguely. Luckily Montero is not a Caesar, Decoux continued. Not the two Monteros put together would make a decent parody of a Caesar. He crossed his arms on his breast, looking at Senor Avellanos, who had returned to his immobility. It is only you, Don Jose, who are genuine old Roman, via Romanos, eloquent and inflexible. Since he had heard the name of Montero pronounced, young Scarf had been eager to express his simple feelings. In a loud and youthful tone, he hoped that this Montero was going to be licked once for all and done with. There was no saying what would happen to the railway if the revolution got the upper hand. Perhaps it would have to be abandoned. It would not be the first railway gone to pot in Costawana. You know, it's one of their so-called national things, he ran on, wrinkling up his nose as if the word had a suspicious flavour to his profound experience of South American affairs. And, of course, he chatted with animation, it had been such an immense piece of luck for him at his age to get appointed on the staff of a big thing like that, don't you know? It would give him the pull over a lot of chaps all through life, he asserted. Therefore, down with Montero, Mrs Gould. His artless grin disappeared slowly before the unanimous gravity of the faces turned upon him from the carriage. Only that old chap, Don Jose, presenting a motionless, waxy profile, stared straight on as if deaf. Scarf did not know the Avianos very well. They did not give balls, and Antonia never appeared at a ground-floor window, as some other young ladies used to do, attended by elder women, to chat with the caballeros on horseback in the calle. The stares of these creoles did not matter much, but what on earth had come to Mrs Gould? She said, go on, Ignacio, and gave him a slow inclination of the head. He heard a short laugh from that round-faced, Frenchified fellow. He coloured up to the eyes and stared at Giorgio Viola, who had fallen back with the children, hat in hand. I shall want the horse presently, he said with some asperity to the old man. Si, signor, there are plenty of horses, murmured the Garibaldino, smoothing absently with his brown hands the two heads, one dark with bronze glints, the other fair with a coppery ripple of the two girls by his side. The returning stream of sightseers raised a great dust on the road. Horsemen noticed the group. Go to your mother, he said. They are growing up as I am growing older, and there is nobody... He looked at the young engineer and stopped, as if awakened from a dream, then, folding his arms on his breast, took up his usual position, leaning back in the doorway with an upward glance fastened on the white shoulder of Higuerota far away. In the carriage, Martin Decoux, shifting his position as though he could not make himself comfortable, muttered as he swayed towards Antonia, I suppose you hate me. Then, in a loud voice, he began to congratulate Don Jose upon all the engineers being convinced Ribierists. The interest of all those foreigners was gratifying. You have heard this one. He is an enlightened well-wisher. It is pleasant to think that the prosperity of Costaguana is of some use to the world. He is very young, Mrs Gould remarked quietly. And so very wise for his age, retorted Decoux. But here we have the naked truth from the mouth of that child. You are right, Don Jose. The natural treasures of Costaguana are of importance to the progressive Europe represented by this youth, just as 300 years ago the wealth of our Spanish fathers was a serious object to the rest of Europe, as represented by the bold buccaneers. There is a curse of futility upon our character. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, chivalry and materialism, high-sounding sentiments and a supine morality, violent efforts for an idea and a sullen acquiescence in every form of corruption. 
We can vault a continent for our independence, only to become the passive prey of a democratic parody, the helpless victims of scoundrels and cutthroats. Our institutions are mockery, our laws are farce. A gutsman bento, our master. And we have sunk so low that when a man like you has awakened our conscience, a stupid barbarian of a Montero, great heavens, a Montero, becomes a deadly danger, and an ignorant, boastful indio like Barrios is our defender. But Don Jose, disregarding the general indictment as though he had not heard a word of it, took up the defence of Barrios. The man was competent enough for his special task in the plan of campaign. It consisted in an offensive movement with Caeta as base upon the flank of the revolutionist forces advancing from the south against Santa Marta, which was covered by another army with the president dictator in its midst. Don Jose became quite animated with a great flow of speech, bending forward anxiously under the steady eyes of his daughter. Deku, as if silenced by so much ardour, did not make a sound. The bells of the city were striking the hour of a ration when the carriage rolled under the old gateway facing the harbour like a shapeless monument of leaves and stones. The rumble of wheels under the sonorous arch was traversed by a strange piercing shriek and a coup from his back seat had a view of the people behind the carriage trudging along the road outside all turning their heads in sombreros and rebozos to look at a locomotive which rolled quickly out of sight behind Giorgio Viola's house under a white trail of steam that seemed to vanish in the breathless, hysterically prolonged scream of warlike triumph. And it was all like a fleeting vision, the shrieking ghost of a railway engine fleeing across the frame of the archway behind the startled movement of the people streaming back from a military spectacle with silent footsteps on the dust of the road. It was a material train returning from the campo to the palisaded yards. The empty cars rolled lightly on the single track. There was no rumble of wheels, no tremor of the ground. The engine driver, running past the Casa Viola with the salute of an uplifted arm, checked his speed smartly before entering the yard, and when the ear-splitting screech of the steam whistle for the brakes had stopped, a series of hard, battering shocks, mingled with the clanking of chain couplings, made a tumult of blows and shaken fetters under the vault of the gate. End of Part Second, The Isabels, Chapter Four Part Second of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad, The Isabels, Chapter Five, Section One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part Second, The Isabels, Chapter Five, Section One. The Gould carriage was the first to return from the harbour to the empty town. On the ancient pavement, laid out in patterns, sunk into ruts and holes. The portly Ignacio, mindful of the springs of the Parisian-built Landau, had pulled up to a walk, and Aku in his corner contemplated moodily the inner aspect of the gate. The squat, turreted sides held up between them a mass of masonry with bunches of grass growing at the top, and a grey, heavily scrolled armorial shield of stone above the apex of the arch, with the arms of Spain nearly smoothed out as if in readiness for some new device typical of the impending progress. The explosive noise of the railway trucks seemed to augment Decoux's irritation. He muttered something to himself, then began to talk aloud in curt, angry phrases thrown at the silence of the two women. They did not look at him at all, while Don Jose, with his semi-translucent, waxy complexion, overshadowed by the soft grey hat, swayed a little to the jolts of the carriage by the side of Mrs Gould. This sound puts a new edge on a very old truth. Decoux spoke in French, perhaps because of Ignacio on the box above him. The old coachman, with his broad back filling a short silver-braided jacket, had a big pair of ears, whose thick rim stood well away from his cropped head. Yes, the noise outside the city wall is new, but the principle is old. He ruminated his discontent for a while, then began afresh with a sidelong glance at Antonia. 
No, but just imagine our forefathers in Morians and corslets drawn up outside this gate, and a band of adventurers just landed from their ships in the harbour there. Thieves, of course, speculators too. Their expeditions, each one were the speculations of grave and reverend persons in England. That is history, as that absurd sailor Mitchell is always saying. Mitchell's arrangements for the embarkation of the troops were excellent, exclaimed Don Jose. That, that, oh, that's really the work of that Genoese seaman. But to return to my noises, there used to be in the old days the sound of trumpets outside that gate, war trumpets. I'm sure they were trumpets. I have read somewhere that Drake, who was the greatest of these men, used to dine alone in his cabin on board ship to the sound of trumpets. In those days this town was full of wealth. Those men came to take it. Now the whole land is like a treasure house, and all these people are breaking into it, whilst we are cutting each other's throats. The only thing that keeps them out is mutual jealousy, but they'll come to an agreement some day, and by the time we've settled our quarrels and become decent and honourable, there'll be nothing left for us. It has always been the same. We are a wonderful people, but it has always been our fate to be, he did not say robbed, but added after a pause, exploited. Mrs Gould said, oh, this is unjust. And Antonio interjected, don't answer him, Amelia, he is attacking me. You surely do not think I was attacking Don Carlos, Deku answered. And then the carriage stopped before the door of the Casa Gould. The young man offered his hand to the ladies. They went in first together. Don Jose walked by the side of Deku, and the gouty old porter tottered after them with some light wraps on his arm. Don Jose slipped his hand under the arm of the journalist of Sulaco. The porvenir must have a long and confident article upon Barrios and the irresistibleness of his army of Caeta. The moral effect should be kept up in the country. We must cable encouraging extracts to Europe and the United States to maintain a favourable impression abroad. Deku muttered, oh yes, we must comfort our friends, the speculators. The long, open gallery was in shadow with its screen of plants in vases along the balustrade, holding out motionless blossoms and all the glass doors of the reception rooms thrown open. A jingle of spurs died out at the further end. Basilio, standing aside against the wall, said in a soft tone to the passing ladies, The Senor Administrador is just back from the mountain. In the great sala, with its groups of ancient Spanish and modern European furniture, making as if different centres under the high white spread of the ceiling, the silver and porcelain of the tea service gleamed among a cluster of dwarf chairs, like a bit of a lady's boudoir, putting in a note of feminine and intimate delicacy. Don Jose, in his rocking chair, placed his hat on his lap, and Deku walked up and down the whole length of the room, passing between tables loaded with knick-knacks and almost disappearing behind the high backs of leathern sofas. He was thinking of the angry face of Antonia. He was confident that he would make his peace with her. He had not stayed in Salaco to quarrel with Antonia. Martin Deku was angry with himself. All he saw and heard going on around him exasperated the preconceived views of his European civilization. To contemplate revolutions from the distance of the Parisian boulevards was quite another matter. Here, on the spot, it was not possible to dismiss their tragic comedy with an expression, quelle farce. The reality of the political action, such as it was, seemed closer, and acquired poignancy by Antonia's belief in the cause. Its crudeness hurt his feelings. He was surprised at his own sensitiveness. I suppose I am more of a Costaguanero than I would have believed possible, he thought to himself. His disdain grew like a reaction of his scepticism against the action into which he was forced by his infatuation for Antonia. He soothed himself by saying he was not a patriot, but a lover. The ladies came in bareheaded and Mrs Gould sank low before the little tea table. Antonia took up her usual place at the reception hour, the corner of a leathern couch, with a rigid grace in her pose and a fan in her hand. Deku, swerving from the straight line of his march, came to lean over the high back of her seat. For a long time he talked into her ear from behind, softly, with a half-smile and an air of apologetic familiarity. 
Her fan lay half-grasped on her knees. She never looked at him. His rapid utterance grew more and more insistent and caressing. At last he ventured a slight laugh. No, really, you must forgive me. One must be serious sometimes. He paused. She turned her head a little. Her blue eyes glided slowly towards him, slightly upwards, mollified and questioning. You can't think I am serious when I call Montero a gran bastia every second day in the poor veneer. That is not a serious occupation. No occupation is serious, not even when a bullet through the heart is the penalty of failure. Her hand closed firmly on her fan. Some reason, you understand, I mean some sense may creep into thinking, some glimpse of truth, I mean some effective truth, for which there is no room in politics or journalism. I happen to have said what I thought, and you are angry. If you do me the kindness to think a little, you will see that I spoke like a patriot. She opened her red lips for the first time, not unkindly. Yes, but you never see the aim. Men must be used as they are. I suppose nobody is really disinterested, unless perhaps you, Don Martin. God forbid, it's the last thing I should like you to believe of me. He spoke lightly and paused. She began to fan herself with a slow movement without raising her hand. After a time, he whispered passionately, Antonia. She smiled and extended her hand after the English manner towards Charles Gould, who was bowing before her, while Decoux, with his elbows spread on the back of the sofa, dropped his eyes and murmured, Bonjour. The Senor Administrador of the San Tome mine bent over his wife for a moment. They exchanged a few words, of which only the phrase the greatest enthusiasm pronounced by Mrs. Gould could be heard. Yes, Deku began in a murmur, even he. This is sheer calumny, said Antonia, not very severely. You just ask him to throw his mind into the melting pot for the great cause, Deku whispered. Don Jose had raised his voice. He rubbed his hands cheerily. The excellent aspect of the troops and the great quantity of the new, deadly rifles on the shoulders of those brave men seemed to fill him with an ecstatic confidence. Charles Gould, very tall and thin before his chair, listened, but nothing could be discovered in his face except a kind and deferential attention. Meantime, Antonia had risen and, crossing the room, stood looking out of one of the three long windows giving on the street. Deku followed her. The window was thrown open, and he leaned against the thickness of the wall, the long folds of the damask curtain falling straight from the broad brass cornice hid him partly from the room. He folded his arms on his breast and looked steadily at Antonia's profile. The people returning from the harbour filled the pavements. The shuffle of sandals and a low murmur of voices ascended to the window. Now and then a coach rolled slowly along the disjointed roadway of the Cal de la Constitution. There were not many private carriages in Sulaco. At the most crowded hour on the Almeida they could be counted with one glance of the eye. The great family arcs swayed on high leathern springs full of pretty powdered faces in which the eyes looked intensely alive and black. And first Don Juste Lopez, the president of the provincial assembly, passed with his three lovely daughters, solemn in a black frock coat and stiff white tie, as when directing a debate from a high tribune. Though they all raised their eyes, Antonia did not make the usual greeting gesture of a fluttered hand, and they affected not to see the two young people, costaguaneros with European manners whose eccentricities were discussed behind the barred windows of the first families in Sulaco. And then the widowed Senora Gavilazo de Valdez rolled by, handsome and dignified, in a great machine in which she used to travel to and from her country house, surrounded by an armed retinue in leather suits and big sombreros with carbines at the bows of their saddles. She was a woman of most distinguished family, proud, rich and kind-hearted, her second son, Jaime, had just gone off on the staff of Barrios. The eldest, a worthless fellow of a moody disposition, filled Salaco with the noise of his dissipations and gambled heavily at the club. The two youngest boys, with yellow Ribierist cockades in their caps, sat on the front seat. She, too, affected not to see Senor Decoud talking publicly with Antonia in defiance of every convention. 
and he not even her novio as far as the world knew, though even in that case it would have been scandal enough. But the dignified old lady, respected and admired by the first families, would have been still more shocked if she could have heard the words they were exchanging. Did you say I lost sight of the aim? I have only one aim in the world. She made an almost imperceptible negative movement of her head, still staring across the street at the Avellanos' house, grey, marked with decay and with iron bars like a prison. And it would be so easy of attainment, he continued, this aim which, whether knowingly or not, I have always had in my heart ever since the day when you snubbed me so horribly once in Paris. You remember? A slight smile seemed to move the corner of the lip that was on his side. You know you were a very terrible person, a sort of Charlotte Corday in a schoolgirl's dress, a ferocious patriot. I suppose you would have stuck a knife into Gutzman Bento. She interrupted him. You do me too much honour. At any rate, he said, changing suddenly to a tone of bitter levity, you would have sent me to stab him without compunction. Ah, par exemple, she murmured in a shocked tone. Well, he argued mockingly, you do keep me here, writing deadly nonsense, deadly to me. It has already killed my self-respect. And you may imagine, he continued, his tone passing into light banter, that Montero, should he be successful, would get even with me in the only way such a brute can get even with a man of intelligence who condescends to call him a gran bestia three times a week. It's a sort of intellectual death, but there is no other one in the background for a journalist of my ability. If he is successful, said Antonia thoughtfully. You seem satisfied to see my life hang on a thread, Decoux replied with a broad smile. And the other Montero, the my trusted brother of the proclamation, the guerrillero, haven't I written that he was taking the guests' overcoats and changing plates in Paris at our legation in the intervals of spying on their refugees there in the time of Roja? He will wash out that sacred truth in blood, in my blood. Why do you look annoyed? This is simply a bit of the biography of one of our great men. What do you think he will do to me? There is a certain convent wall round the corner of the plaza opposite the door of the bull ring, you know, opposite the door with the inscription, Entrada de la Sombra. Appropriate, perhaps. That's where the uncle of our host gave up his Anglo-South American soul. And, note, he might have run away. A man who has fought with weapons may run away. You might have let me go with Barrios if you had cared for me. I would have carried one of those rifles in which Don Jose believes with the greatest satisfaction in the ranks of poor peons and Indios that know nothing either of reason or politics. The most forlorn hope in the most forlorn army on earth would have been safer than that for which you made me stay here. When you make war you may retreat, but not when you spend your time in inciting poor ignorant fools to kill and to die. His tone remained light, and, as if unaware of his presence, she stood motionless, her hands clasped lightly, the fan hanging down from her interlaced fingers. He waited for a while, and then, I shall go to the wall, he said with a sort of jocular desperation. Even that declaration did not make her look at him. Her head remained still, her eyes fixed upon the house of the Avellanos, whose chip pilasters, broken cornices, the whole degradation of dignity was hidden now by the gathering dusk of the street. In her whole figure, her lips alone moved, forming the words, Martin, you will make me cry. He remained silent for a minute, startled, as if overwhelmed by a sort of awed happiness, with the lines of the mocking smile still stiffened about his mouth and incredulous surprise in his eyes. The value of a sentence is in the personality which utters it, for nothing new can be said by man or woman, and those were the last words it seemed to him that could ever have been spoken by Antonia. He had never made it up with her so completely in all their intercourse of small encounters. But even before she had time to turn towards him, which he did slowly with a rigid grace, he had begun to plead, my sister is only waiting to embrace you. My father is transported with joy. I won't say anything of my mother. Our mothers were like sisters. There is the mailboat for the south next week. Let us go. That Moraga is a fool. A man like Montero is bribed. It's the practice of the country. It's tradition. It's politics. Read Fifty Years of Misrule. 
Leave poor Papa alone, Don Martin. He believes... I have the greatest tenderness for your father, he began hurriedly, but I love you, Antonia, and Moraga has miserably mismanaged this business. Perhaps your father did too, I don't know. Montero was bribable. Why, I suppose he only wanted his share of this famous loan for national development. Why didn't the stupid Santa Marta people give him a mission to Europe or something? He would have taken five years' salary in advance and gone on loafing in Paris, this stupid, ferocious India. The man, she said thoughtfully and very calm before this outburst, was intoxicated with vanity. We had all the information, not from Moraga only, from others too. There was his brother intriguing too. Oh, yes, he said, of course you know, you know everything. You read all the correspondence, you write all the papers, all those state papers that are inspired here in this room in blind deference to a theory of political purity. Hadn't you Charles Gould before your eyes, Ray de Salaco? He and his mine are the practical demonstration of what could have been done. Do you think he succeeded by his fidelity to a theory of virtue? And all those railway people with their honest work, of course their work is honest, but what if you cannot work honestly till the thieves are satisfied? Could he not, a gentleman, have told this Sir John What's-His-Name that Montero had to be bought off, he and all his Negro liberals hanging on to his gold-laced sleeve? He ought to have been bought off with his own stupid weight of gold, his weight of gold, I tell you, boots, sabre, spurs, cocked hat and all. She shook her head slightly. It was impossible, she murmured. He wanted the whole lot? What? She was facing him now in the deep recess of the window, very close and motionless. Her lips moved rapidly. Deku, leaning his back against the wall, listened with crossed arms and lowered eyelids. He drank the tones of her even voice and watched the agitated life of her throat as if waves of emotion had run from her heart to pass out into the air in her reasonable words. He also had his aspirations. He aspired to carry her away out of these deadly futilities of pronunciamentos and reforms. All this was wrong, utterly wrong, but she fascinated him. And sometimes the sheer sagacity of a phrase would break the charm, replace the fascination by a sudden unwilling thrill of interest. Some women hovered, as it were, on the threshold of genius, he reflected. They did not want to know or think or understand. Passion stood for all that, and he was ready to believe that some startlingly profound remark, some appreciation of character or a judgment upon an event, bordered on the miraculous. In the mature Antonia he could see with an extraordinary vividness the austere schoolgirl of the earlier days. She seduced his attention. Sometimes he could not restrain a murmur of assent. Now and then he advanced an objection quite seriously. Gradually they began to argue. The curtain half hid them from the people in the sala. Outside it had grown dark. From the deep trenches of shadow between the houses, lit up vaguely by the glimmer of street lamps, ascending the evening silence of Salaco, the silence of a town with few carriages, of unshod horses and a softly sandaled population. The windows of the Casa Gould flung their shining parallelograms upon the house of the Avianos. Now and then a shuffle of feet passed below with the pulsating red glow of a cigarette at the foot of the walls and the night air, as if cooled by the snows of Higarota, refreshed their faces. We Occidentals, said Martin Deku, using the usual term the provincials of Salaco applied to themselves, have been always distinct and separated. As long as we hold Caita, nothing can reach us. In all our troubles no army has marched over those mountains. A revolution in the central provinces isolates us at once. Look how complete it is now. The news of Barrios's movement will be cabled to the United States, and only in that way will it reach Santa Marta by the cable from the other seaboard. We have the greatest riches, the greatest fertility, the purest blood in our great families, the most laborious population. The Occidental province should stand alone. The early federalism was not bad for us. Then came this union which Don Henrique Gould resisted. It opened the road to tyranny and ever since the rest of Costaguana hangs like a millstone round our necks, the Occidental territory is large enough to make any man's country. Look at the mountains. Nature itself seems to cry to us, separate. She made an energetic gesture of negation. 
a silence fell. Oh yes, I know, it's contrary to the doctrine laid down in the history of fifty years, Miss Rule. I'm only trying to be sensible. But my sense seems always to give you cause for offence. Have I startled you very much with this perfectly reasonable aspiration? She shook her head. No, she was not startled, but the idea shocked her early convictions. Her patriotism was larger. She had never considered that possibility. It may yet be the means of saving some of your convictions, he said prophetically. She did not answer. She seemed tired. They leaned side by side on the rail of the little balcony, very friendly, having exhausted politics, giving themselves up to the silent feeling of their nearness in one of those profound pauses that fall upon the rhythm of passion. Towards the plaza end of the street, the growing coals in the braseros of the market women cooking their evening meal gleamed red along the edge of the pavement. A man appeared without a sound in the light of a street lamp, showing the coloured inverted triangle of his boarded poncho, square on his shoulders, hanging to a point below his knees. From the harbour end of the calle, a horseman walked his soft-stepping mount, gleaming silver-grey abreast each lamp under the dark shape of the rider. Behold the illustrious Capitas de Cagadores, said Decu gently, coming in all his splendour after his work is done. The next great man of Salaco after Don Carlos Gould. But he is good-natured, and let me make friends with him. Ah, indeed, said Antonio, how did you make friends? A journalist ought to have his finger on the popular pulse, and this man is one of the leaders of the populace. A journalist ought to know remarkable men, and this man is remarkable in his way. Ah, yes, said Antonio thoughtfully, it is known that this Italian has a great influence. The horseman had passed below them with a gleam of dim light on the shining broad quarters of the grey mare, on a bright heavy stirrup, on a long silver spur, but the short flick of yellowish flame in the dusk was powerless against the muffled-up mysteriousness of the dark figure with an invisible face concealed by a great sombrero. Decou and Antonia remained leaning over the balcony, side by side, touching elbows, with their heads overhanging the darkness of the street and the brilliantly lighted sala at their backs. This was a tete-a-tete of extreme impropriety, something of which in the whole extent of the Republic only the extraordinary Antonia could be capable, the poor motherless girl never accompanied with a careless father who had thought only of making her learned. Even Decoud himself seemed to feel that this was as much as he could expect of having her to himself till, till the revolution was over and he could carry her off to Europe, away from the endlessness of civil strife whose folly seemed even harder to bear than its ignominy. After one Montero there would be another, the lawlessness of a populace of all colours and races, barbarism, irremediable tyranny. As the great liberator Bolivar had said in the bitterness of his spirit, America is ungovernable, those who worked for her independence have ploughed the sea. He did not care, he declared boldly. He seized every opportunity to tell her that though she had managed to make a blanco journalist of him, he was no patriot. First of all, the word had no sense for cultured minds to whom the narrowness of every belief is odious. And secondly, in connection with the everlasting troubles of this unhappy country, it was hopelessly besmirched. It had been the cry of dark barbarism, the cloak of lawlessness, of crimes, of rapacity, of simple thieving. He was surprised at the warmth of his own utterance. He had no need to drop his voice. It had been low all the time, a mere murmur in the silence of dark houses with their shutters closed early against the night air, as is the custom of Sulaco. Only the sailor of the Casa Gould flung out defiantly the blaze of its four windows, the bright appeal of light in the whole dumb obscurity of the street and the murmur on the little balcony went on after a short pause. But we are labouring to change all that, Antonia protested. It is exactly what we desire. It is our object. It is the great cause. And the word you despise has stood also for sacrifice, for courage, for constancy, for suffering. Papa, who... Ploughing the sea, interrupted Decoud, looking down. 
who was below the sound of hasty and ponderous footsteps. "'Your uncle, the grand vicar of the cathedral, has just turned under the gate,' observed Decoud. "'He said mass for the troops in the plaza this morning.' They had built for him an altar of drums, you know, and they brought outside all the painted blocks to take the air. All the wooden saints stood militarily in a row at the top of the great flight of steps. They looked like a gorgeous escort attending the vicar general. I saw the great function from the windows of the poor veneer. He is amazing, your uncle, the last of the Corbelins. He glittered exceedingly in his vestments with a great crimson velvet cross down his back, and all the time our saviour Barrios sat in the Amarilla Club drinking punch at an open window. Esprit for our Barrios. I expected every moment your uncle to launch an excommunication there and then at the black eye patch in the window across the plaza, but not at all. Ultimately the troops marched off. Later Barrios came down with some of the officers and stood with his uniform all unbuttoned, discoursing at the edge of the pavement. Suddenly your uncle appeared, no longer glittering but all black at the cathedral door with that threatening aspect he has, you know, like a sort of avenging spirit. He gives one look, strides over straight at the group of uniforms and leads away the general by the elbow. He walked him for a quarter of an hour in the shade of a wall, never let go his elbow for a moment talking all the time with exultation and gesticulating with a long black arm. It was a curious scene. The officers seemed struck with astonishment. Remarkable man, your missionary uncle. He hates an infidel much less than a heretic and prefers a heathen many times to an infidel. He condescends graciously to call me a heathen sometimes, you know. Antonia listened with her hands over the balustrade, opening and shutting the fan gently and Decoud talked a little nervously, as if afraid that she would leave him at the first pause. The comparative isolation, the precious sense of intimacy, the slight contact of their arms, affected him softly, for now and then a tender inflection crept into the flow of his ironic murmurs. Any slight sign of favour from a relative of yours is welcome, Antonio. And perhaps he understands me after all. But I know him too, our Padre Corbelan. The idea of political honour, justice and honesty for him consists in the restitution of the confiscated church property. Nothing else could have drawn that fierce converter of savage Indians out of the wilds to work for the Ribierist cause. Nothing else but that wild hope. He would make a pronunciamento himself for such an object against any government if he could only get followers. What does Don Carlos Gould think of that? But of course, with his English impenetrability, no one can tell what he thinks. Probably he thinks of nothing apart from his mine, of his imperium in imperio. As to Mrs Gould, she thinks of her schools, of her hospitals, of the mothers with the young babies, of every sick old man in the three villages. If you were to turn your head now, you would see her extracting a report from that sinister doctor in a check shirt. What's his name? Monaghan? Or as catechising Don Pepe, or perhaps listening to Padre Roma. They are all down here today. All her ministers of state. Well, she is a sensible woman, and perhaps Don Carlos is a sensible man. It's a part of solid English sense not to think too much, to see only what may be of practical use at the moment. These people are not like ourselves. We have no political reason, but we have political passions, sometimes. What is a conviction? A particular view of our personal advantage, either practical or emotional. No one is a patriot for nothing. The word serves us well, but I am clear-sighted, and I shall not use that word to you, Antonia. I have no patriotic illusions. I have only the supreme illusion of a lover. He paused, then muttered almost inaudibly. That can lead one very far, though. End of Part 2nd, The Isabels, Chapter 5, Section 1《Part 2nd of Nostromo by Joseph Conrad The Isabels, Chapter 5, Section 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part 2nd. The Isabels. Chapter 5. Section 2. 
Behind their backs, the political tide that once in every 24 hours set with a strong flood through the ghoul drawing room could be heard, rising higher in a hum of voices. Men had been dropping in singly or in twos and threes. The higher officials of the province, engineers of the railway, sunburnt and in tweeds, with the frosted head of their chief smiling with slow, humorous indulgence amongst the young, eager faces. Scarf, the lover of fandangos, had already slipped out in search of some dance, no matter where, on the outskirts of the town. Don Juste Lopez, after taking his daughters home, had entered solemnly in a black creased coat buttoned up under his spreading brown beard. The few members of the provincial assembly present clustered at once around their president to discuss the news of the war and the last proclamation of the rebel Montero, the miserable Montero, calling in the name of a justly incensed democracy upon all the provincial assemblies of the republic to suspend their sittings till his sword had made peace and the will of the people could be consulted. It was practically an invitation to dissolve an unheard of audacity of that evil madman. The indignation ran high in the knot of deputies behind José Avellanos. Don José, lifting up his voice, cried out to them over the high back of his chair, Sir Laco has answered by sending today an army upon his flank. If all the other provinces show only half as much patriotism as we Occidentals. A great burst of acclamations covered the vibrating treble of the life and soul of the party. Yes, yes, this was true, a great truth. Sulaco was in the forefront, as ever. It was a boastful tumult, the hopefulness inspired by the event of the day, breaking out amongst those caballeros of the campo, thinking of their herds, of their lands, of the safety of their families. Everything was at stake. No, it was impossible that Montero should succeed. This criminal, this shameless indio. The clamour continued for some time, everybody else in the room looking towards the group where Don Juste had put up his air of impartial solemnity as if presiding at a sitting of the provincial assembly. Decoux had turned round at the noise and, leaning his back on the balustrade, shouted into the room with all the strength of his lungs, Gran bestia! This unexpected cry had the effect of stilling the noise. All the eyes were directed to the window with an approving expectation, but Decoux had already turned his back upon the room and was again leaning out over the quiet street. This is the quintessence of my journalism. That is the supreme argument, he said to Antonia. I have invented this definition, this last word on a great question. But I am no patriot. I am no more of a patriot than the capitas of the Sulaco Cargadores, this Genoese who has done such great things for this harbour, this active usher-in of the material implements of our progress. You have heard Captain Mitchell confess over and over again that till he got this man he could never tell how long it would take to unload a ship. That is bad for progress. You have seen him pass by after his labours on his famous horse to dazzle the girls in some ballroom with an earthen floor. He is a fortunate fellow. His work is an exercise of personal powers. His leisure is spent in receiving the marks of extraordinary adulation. And he likes it too. Can anybody be more fortunate? To be feared and admired is... And are these your highest aspirations, Don Martin? interrupted Antonia. I was speaking of a man of that sort, said Decoux curtly. The heroes of the world have been feared and admired. What more could he want? Decoux had often felt his familiar habit of ironic thought fall shattered against Antonia's gravity. She irritated him as if she too had suffered from that inexplicable feminine obtuseness which stands so often between a man and a woman of the more ordinary sort. But he overcame his vexation at once. He was very far from thinking Antonio ordinary, whatever verdict his scepticism might have pronounced upon himself. With a touch of penetrating tenderness in his voice, he assured her that his only aspiration was to a felicity so high that it seemed almost unrealisable on this earth. She coloured invisibly, with a warmth against which the breeze from the Sierra seemed to have lost its cooling power in the sudden melting of the snows. 
His whisper could not have carried so far, though there was enough ardour in his tone to melt a heart of ice. Antonio turned away abruptly, as if to carry his whispered assurance into the room behind, full of light, noisy with voices. The tide of political speculation was beating high within the four walls of the great sala, as if driven beyond the marks by a great gust of hope. Don Juste's fan-shaped beard was still the centre of loud and animated discussions. There was a self-confident ring in all the voices, even the few Europeans around Charles Gould, a Dane, a couple of Frenchmen, a discreet fat German, smiling with downcast eyes, the representatives of those material interests that had got a footing in Sulaco under the protecting might of the San Tome mine, had infused a lot of good humour into their deference. Charles Gould, to whom they were paying their court, was the visible sign of the stability that could be achieved on the shifting ground of revolutions. They felt hopeful about their various undertakings. One of the two Frenchmen, small, black, with glittering eyes lost in an immense growth of bushy beard, waved his tiny brown hands and delicate wrists. He had been travelling in the interior of the province for a syndicate of European capitalists. His forcible, Monsieur l'administrateur, returning every minute, shrilled above the steady hum of conversations. He was relating his discoveries. He was ecstatic. Charles Gould glanced down at him courteously. At a given moment of these necessary receptions, it was Mrs Gould's habit to withdraw quietly into a little drawing-room, especially her own, next to the great sala. She had risen and, waiting for Antonia, listened with a slightly worried graciousness to the engineer-in-chief of the railway, who stooped over her, relating slowly, without the slightest gesture, something apparently amusing, for his eyes had a humorous twinkle. Antonia, before she advanced into the room to join Mrs Gould, turned her head over her shoulder towards Decoux, only for a moment. Why should any one of us think his aspirations unrealisable? she said rapidly. I'm going to cling to mine to the end, Antonia, he answered through clenched teeth, then bowed very low, a little distantly. The engineer-in-chief had not finished telling his amusing story. The humours of railway building in South America appealed to his keen appreciation of the absurd, and he told his instances of ignorant prejudice and as ignorant cunning very well. Now Mrs Gould gave him all her attention as he walked by her side, escorting the ladies out of the room. Finally, all three passed unnoticed through the glass doors in the gallery. Only a tall priest, stalking silently in the noise of the sala, checked himself to look after them. Father Corbelin, whom Decoux had seen from the balcony turning into the gateway of the Casa Gould, had addressed no one since coming in. The long, skimpy soutane accentuated the tallness of his stature. He carried his powerful torso thrown forward, and the straight black bar of his joined eyebrows, the pugnacious outline of the bony face, the white spot of a scar on the bluish shaven cheeks, a testimonial to his apostolic zeal from a party of unconverted Indians, suggested something unlawful behind his priesthood, the idea of a chaplain of bandits. He separated his bony, knotted hands clasped behind his back to shake his finger at Martin. Decoux had stepped into the room after Antonia, but he did not go far. He had remained just within, against the curtain, with an expression of not quite genuine gravity, like a grown-up person taking part in a game of children. He gazed quietly at the threatening finger. "'I have watched your reverence converting General Barrios by a special sermon on the plaza,' he said, without making the slightest movement. "'What miserable nonsense!' Father Corbelin's deep voice resounded all over the room, making all the heads turn on the shoulders. The man is a drunkard, senores. The god of your general is a bottle. His contemptuous, arbitrary voice caused an uneasy suspension of every sound, as if the self-confidence of the gathering had been staggered by a blow. But nobody took up Father Corbelin's declaration. It was known that Father Corbelin had come out of the wilds to advocate the sacred rites of the Church with the same fanatical fearlessness with which he had gone preaching to bloodthirsty savages, devoid of human compassion or worship of any kind. 
Rumours of legendary proportions told of his successes as a missionary beyond the eye of Christian men. He had baptised whole nations of Indians, living with them like a savage himself. It was related that the Padre used to ride with his Indians for days, half naked, carrying a bullock hide shield, and no doubt a long lance too, who knows? That he had wandered clothed in skins, seeking for proselytes somewhere near the snow line of the Cordillera. Of these exploits, Padre Corbelan himself was never known to talk. But he made no secret of his opinion that the politicians of Santa Marta had harder hearts and more corrupt minds than the heathen to whom he had carried the word of God. His injudicious zeal for the temporal welfare of the church was damaging the Ribierist cause. It was common knowledge that he had refused to be made titular bishop of the Occidental Diocese till justice was done to a despoiled church. The political jefe of Sulaco, the same dignitary whom Captain Mitchell saved from the mob afterwards, hinted with naive cynicism that doubtless their excellencies the ministers sent the padre over the mountains to Sulaco in the worst season of the year in the hope that he would be frozen to death by the icy blasts of the high paramos. Every year a few hardy muleteers, men inured to exposure, were known to perish in that way. But what would you have? Their excellencies possibly had not realised what a tough priest he was. Meantime, the ignorant were beginning to murmur that the Ribierist reforms meant simply the taking away of the land from the people. Some of it was to be given to foreigners who made the railway. The greater part was to go to the Padres. These were the results of the Grand Vicar's zeal. Even from the short allocution to the trips on the plaza, which only the first ranks could have heard, he had not been able to keep out his fixed idea of an outraged church waiting for reparation from a penitent country. The political jefe had been exasperated, but he could not very well throw the brother-in-law of Don Jose into the prison of the Cabildo. The chief magistrate, an easy-going and popular official, visited the Casa Gould, walking over after sunset from the Intendencia, unattended, acknowledging with dignified courtesy the salutations of high and low alike. That evening he had walked up straight to Charles Gould, and had hissed out to him that he would have liked to deport the Grand Vicar out of Salaco, anywhere, to some desert island, to the Isabels, for instance. The one without water, preferably, eh, Don Carlos, he had added in a tone between jest and earnest. This uncontrollable priest, who had rejected his offer of the Episcopal Palace for a residence, and preferred to hang his shabby hammock amongst the rubble and spiders of the sequestrated Dominican convent, had taken into his head to advocate an unconditional pardon for Hernandez, the robber. And this was not enough. He seemed to have entered into communication with the most audacious criminal the country had known for years. The Salaco police knew, of course, what was going on. Padre Corbelan had got hold of that reckless Italian, the Capitaz de Cargadores, the only man fit for such an errand, and had sent a message through him. Father Corbelan had studied in Rome and could speak Italian. The Capitaz was known to visit the old Dominican convent at night. An old woman who served the Grand Vicar had heard the name of Hernandez pronounced, and only last Saturday afternoon the Capitaz had been observed galloping out of town. He did not return for two days. The police would have laid the Italian by the heels if it had not been for fear of the Cargadores, a turbulent body of men quite apt to raise a tumult. Nowadays it was not so easy to govern Zulaco. Bad characters flocked into it, attracted by the money in the pockets of the railway workmen. The populace was made restless by Father Corbelan's discourses. And the first magistrate explained to Charles Gould that now the province was stripped of troops, any outbreak of lawlessness would find the authorities with their boots off, as it were. Then he went away moodily to sit in an armchair, smoking a long, thin cigar, not very far from Don Jose, with whom, bending over sideways, he exchanged a few words from time to time. He ignored the entrance of the priest, and whenever Father Corbelan's voice was raised behind him, he shrugged his shoulders impatiently. Father Corbelan had remained quite motionless for a time with that something vengeful in his immobility which seemed to characterise all his attitudes. A lurid glow of strong convictions gave its peculiar aspect to the black figure. 
but its fierceness became softened as the padre, fixing his eyes upon Deku, raised his long black arms slowly, impressively. And you, you are a perfect heathen, he said in a subdued, deep voice. He made a step nearer, pointing a forefinger at the young man's breast. Deku, very calm, felt the wall behind the curtain with the back of his head. Then, with his chin tilted well up, he smiled. Very well, he agreed, with a slightly weary nonchalance of a man well used to these passages. But it is perhaps that you have not discovered yet what is the god of my worship. It was an easier task with our barrios. The priest suppressed a gesture of discouragement. You believe neither in stick nor stone, he said. Nor bottle, added Deku, without stirring. Neither does the other of your reverence confidence. I mean the Capitaz of the Cargadores. He does not drink. Your reading of my character does honour to your perspicacity. But why call me a heathen? True, retorted the priest. You are ten times worse. A miracle could not convert you. I certainly do not believe in miracles, said Deku quietly. Father Corbelin shrugged his high, broad shoulders doubtfully. A sort of Frenchman, godless, a materialist, he pronounced slowly, as if weighing the terms of a careful analysis. Neither the son of his own country nor of any other, he continued thoughtfully. Scarcely human, in fact, Deku commented under his breath, his head at rest against the wall, his eyes gazing up at the ceiling. The victim of this faithless age, Father Corbelin resumed in a deep but subdued voice. But of some use as a journalist, Deku changed his pose and spoke in a more animated tone. Has your worship neglected to read the last number of the poor veneer? I assure you it is just like the others. On the general policy it continues to call Montero a gran bestia and stigmatise his brother, the guerriero, for a combination of lackey and spy. What could be more effective? In local affairs, it urges the provincial government to enlist bodily into the national army the band of Hernandez the robber, who is apparently the protégé of the church, or at least the grand vicar. Nothing could be more sound. The priest nodded and turned on the heels of his square-toed shoes with big steel buckles. Again, with his hands clasped behind his back, he paced to and fro, planting his feet firmly. When he swung about, the skirt of his soutane was inflated slightly by the brusqueness of his movements. The great sala had been emptying itself slowly. When the jefe politico rose to go, most of those still remaining stood up suddenly in sign of respect, and Don José Avellano stopped the rocking of his chair. But the good-natured first official made a deprecatory gesture, waved his hand to Charles Gould, and went out discreetly. In the comparative peace of the room, the screaming Monsieur l'administrateur of the frail, hairy Frenchman seemed to acquire a preternatural shrillness. The explorer of the capitalist syndicate was still enthusiastic. Ten million dollars worth of copper practically in sight, Monsieur l'administrateur. Ten million in sight and a railway coming. A railway. They will never believe my report. C'est trop beau. He fell a prey to a screaming ecstasy in the midst of sagely nodding heads before Charles Gould's imperturbable calm. And only the priest continued his pacing, flinging round the skirt of his soutane at each end of his beat. Deku murmured to him ironically, Those gentlemen talk about their gods. Father Corbelin stopped short, looked at the journalist of Salako fixedly for a moment, shrugged his shoulders slightly and resumed his plodding walk of an obstinate traveller. And now the Europeans were dropping off from the group around Charles Gould till the administrator of the great silver mine could be seen in his whole lank length from head to foot, left stranded by the ebbing tide of his guests on the great square of carpet as it were a multicoloured shoal of flowers and arabesques under his brown boots. Father Corbelin approached the rocking chair of Don José Avellanos. Come, brother, he said with kindly brusqueness and a touch of relieved impatience a man may feel at the end of a perfectly useless ceremony. A la casa, a la casa. This has been all talk. Let us now go and think and pray for guidance from heaven. He rolled his black eyes upward. 
By the side of the frail diplomatist, the life and soul of the party, he seemed gigantic with a gleam of fanaticism in the glance. But the voice of the party, or rather its mouthpiece, the sun des coups from Paris, turned journalist for the sake of Antonia's eyes, knew very well that it was not so, that he was only a strenuous priest with one idea, feared by the women and execrated by the men of the people. Martin Decou, the dilettante in life, imagined himself to derive an artistic pleasure from watching the picturesque extreme of wrong-headedness into which an honest, almost sacred conviction may drive a man. It is like madness. It must be because it's self-destructive, Decou had said to himself often. It seemed to him that every conviction, as soon as it became effective, turned into that form of dementia the gods send upon those they wished to destroy. But he enjoyed the bitter flavour of that example with the zest of a connoisseur in the art of his choice. Those two men got on well together, as if each had felt respectively that a masterful conviction as well as utter scepticism may lead a man very far on the bypaths of political action. Don Jose obeyed the touch of the big, hairy hand. Decou followed out the brothers-in-law. And there remained only one visitor in the vast, empty sala, bluishly hazy with tobacco smoke, a heavy-eyed, round-cheeked man with a drooping moustache, a hide merchant from Esmeralda who had come overland to Sulaco riding with a few peons across the coast range. He was very full of his journey, undertaken mostly for the purpose of seeing the Senor Administrador of San Tomé in relation to some assistance he required in his hide exporting business. He hoped to enlarge it greatly now that the country was going to be settled. It was going to be settled, he repeated several times, degrading by a strange, anxious whine the sonority of the Spanish language, which he patted rapidly like some sort of cringing jargon. A plain man could carry on his little business now in the country and even think of enlarging it with safety. Was it not so? He seemed to beg Charles Gould for a confirmatory word, a grunt of assent, a simple nod even. He could get nothing. His alarm increased and in the pauses he would dart his eyes here and there. Then, loath to give up, he would branch off into feeling allusion to the dangers of his journey the audacious Hernandez, leaving his usual haunts, had crossed the campo of Salaco and was known to be lurking in the ravines of the coast range. Yesterday, when distant only a few hours from Salaco, the hide merchant and his servants had seen three men on the road arrested suspiciously with their horses' heads together. Two of these rode off at once and disappeared into a shallow quebrada on the left. We stopped, continued the man from Esmeralda and I tried to hide behind a small bush, but none of my mozzos would go forward to find out what it meant, and the third horseman seemed to be waiting for us to come up. It was no use. We had been seen. So we rode slowly on, trembling. He let us pass, a man on a grey horse with his hat down on his eyes, without a word of greeting. But by and by we heard him galloping after us. We faced about, but that did not seem to intimidate him. He rode up at speed and, touching my foot with the toe of his boot, asked me for a cigar with a blood-curdling laugh. He did not seem armed, but when he put his hand back to reach for the matches, I saw an enormous revolver strapped to his waist. I shuddered. He had very fierce whiskers, Don Carlos, and as he did not offer to go on, we dared not move. At last, blowing the smoke of my cigar into the air through his nostrils, he said, Senor, it would be perhaps better for you if I rode behind your party. You are not very far from Sulaco now. Go you with God. What would you? We went on. There was no resisting him. He might have been Hernandez himself, though my servant, who has been many times to Sulaco by sea, assured me that he had recognised him very well for the capitas of the steamship company's cargadores. Later that same evening I saw that very man at the corner of the plaza talking to a girl, a Moranita, who stood by the stirrup with her hand on a grey horse's mane. I assure you, Signor Hirsch, murmured Charles Gould, that you run no risk on this occasion. That may be, Signor, though I tremble yet, a most fierce man to look at. And what does it mean? 
a person employed by the steamship company, talking with saltiadores, no less, senor, the other horsemen were saltiadores, in a lonely place and behaving like a robber himself. A cigar is nothing, but what was there to prevent him asking me for my purse? No, no, senor Hirsch, Charles Gould murmured, letting his glance stray away a little vacantly from the round face with its hooked beak upturned towards him in an almost childlike appeal. If it was the Capitas de Cargadores you met, and there is no doubt, is there, you were perfectly safe. Thank you, you are very good, a very fierce-looking man, Don Carlos. He asked me for a cigar in a most familiar manner. What would have happened if I had not had a cigar? I shudder yet. What business had he to be talking with robbers in a lonely place? But Charles Gould, openly preoccupied now, gave not a sign, made not a sound. The impenetrability of the embodied Gould concession had its surface shades. To be dumb is merely a fatal affliction, but the king of Sulaco had words enough to give him all the mysterious weight of a taciturn force. His silences, backed by the power of speech, had as many shades of significance as uttered words in the way of assent, of doubt, of negation, even of simple comment. Some seemed to say plainly, think it over. Others meant clearly, go ahead. A simple low, I see, with an affirmative nod at the end of a patient listing half hour was the equivalent of a verbal contract which men had learned to trust implicitly, since behind it all there was the great Santome mine, the head and front of the material interests, so strong that it depended on no man's good will in the whole length and breadth of the Occidental province. That is, on no good will which it could not buy ten times over. But to the little hook-nosed man from Esmeralda, anxious about the export of hides, the silence of Charles Gould portended a failure. Evidently this was no time for extending a modest man's business. He enveloped in a swift mental malediction the whole country, with all its inhabitants, partisans of Ribiera and Montero alike, and there were incipient tears in his mute anger at the thought of the innumerable ox-hides going to waste upon the dreamy expanse of the Campo, with its single palms rising like ships at sea within the perfect circle of the horizon, its clumps of heavy timber motionless like solid islands of leaves above the running waves of grass. There were hides there, rotting, with no profit to anybody, rotting where they had been dropped by men called away to attend the urgent necessities of political revolutions. The practical, mercantile soul of Senor Hirsch rebelled against all that foolishness while he was taking a respectful but disconcerted leave of the might and majesty of the San Tome mine in the person of Charles Gould. He could not restrain a heartbroken murmur wrung out of his very aching heart, as it were. It is a great, great foolishness, Don Carlos, all this. The price of hides in Hamburg has gone up, up. Of course, the Ribierist government will do away with all that when it gets established firmly. Meantime, he sighed. Yes, meantime, repeated Charles Gould inscrutably. The other shrugged his shoulder, but he was not ready to go yet. There was a little matter he would like to mention very much, if permitted. It appeared he had some good friends in Hamburg, he mentioned the name of the firm, who were very anxious to do business, in dynamite, he explained. A contract for dynamite with the San Tome mine, and then perhaps later on other mines which were short to... The little man from Esmeralda was ready to enlarge, but Charles Gould interrupted him. It seemed as though the patience of the Senor Administrator was giving way at last. Signor Hirsch, he said, I have enough dynamite stored up at the mountain to send it down crashing into the valley, his voice rose a little, to send half Sulaco into the air if I liked. Charles Gould smiled at the round, startled eyes of the dealer in hides, who was murmuring hastily, just so, just so, and now he was going. It was impossible to do business in explosives with an administrator so well provided and so discouraging. He had suffered agonies in the saddle and had exposed himself to the atrocities of the bandit Hernandez for nothing at all, neither hides nor dynamite, and the very shoulders of the enterprising Israelite expressed dejection. At the door he bowed low to the engineer-in-chief. 
but at the bottom of the stairs in the patio he stopped short with his podgy hand over his lips in an attitude of meditative astonishment. What does he want to keep so much dynamite for, he muttered. And why does he talk like this to me? The engineer-in-chief, looking in at the door of the empty sala, whence the political tide had ebbed out to the last insignificant drop, nodded familiarly to the master of the house, standing motionless like a tall beacon amongst the deserted shoals of furniture. Good night, I'm going. Got my bike downstairs. The railway will know where to go for dynamite should we get short at any time. We have done cutting and chopping for a while now. We shall begin soon to blast our way through. Don't come to me, said Charles Gould with perfect serenity. I shan't have an ounce to spare for anybody. Not an ounce. Not for my own brother, if I had a brother, and he were the engineer-in-chief of the most promising railway in the world. What's that? asked the engineer-in-chief with equanimity. Unkindness? No, said Charles Gould stolidly. Policy. Radical, I should think, the engineer-in-chief observed from the doorway. Is that the right name, Charles Gould said from the middle of the room? I mean, going to the roots, you know, the engineer explained with an air of enjoyment. Why, yes, Charles Gould pronounced slowly, the Gould concession has struck such deep roots in this country, in this province, in that gorge of the mountains, that nothing but dynamite shall be allowed to dislodge it from there. It's my choice. It's my last card to play. The engineer-in-chief whistled low. A pretty game, he said, with a shade of discretion. And have you told Holroyd of that extraordinary trump card you hold in your hand? Card only when it's played, when it falls at the end of the game. Till then you may call it a... Weapon, suggested the railway man. No, you may call it rather an argument, corrected Charles Gould gently. And that's how I've presented it to Mr Holroyd. And what did he say to it? asked the engineer with undisguised interest. He, Charles Gould spoke after a slight pause, he said something about holding on like grim death and putting our trust in God. I should imagine he must have been rather startled. But then, pursued the administrator of the San Tome mine, but then he is very far away, you know, and as they say in this country, God is very high above. The engineer's appreciative laugh died away down the stairs, where the Madonna with the child on her arm seemed to look after his shaking broad back from her shallow niche. End of Part Second, The Isabels, Chapter 5, Section 2《Part Second of Nostromo》by Joseph Conrad, *** The Isabels*, Chapter Six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part Second, *The Isabels*, Chapter Six. A profound stillness reigned in the Casa Gould. The master of the house, walking along the corridor, opened the door of his room and saw his wife sitting in a big armchair, his own smoking armchair, thoughtful contemplating her little shoes, and she did not raise her eyes when he walked in. "'Tired?' asked Charles Gould. "'A little,' said Mrs Gould. Still without looking up, she added, with feeling, "'There is an awful sense of unreality about all this.'" Charles Gould, before the long table strewn with papers, on which lay a hunting crop and a pair of spurs, stood looking at his wife. The heat and dust must have been awful this afternoon by the waterside, he murmured sympathetically. The glare on the water must have been simply terrible. One could close one's eyes to the glare, said Mrs Gould. But, my dear Charlie, it is impossible for me to close my eyes to our position. This is awful. She raised her eyes and looked at her husband's face, from which all sign of sympathy or any other feeling had disappeared. Why don't you tell me something? she almost wailed. I thought you had understood me perfectly from the first, Charles Good said slowly. I thought we had said all there was to say a long time ago. There is nothing to say now. There were things to be done. We have done them. We have gone on doing them. There is no going back now. 
I don't suppose that even from the first there was really any possible way back, and what's more, we can't even afford to stand still. Ah, if only one knew how far you mean to go, said his wife, inwardly trembling, but in an almost playful tone. Any distance, any length, of course, was the answer, in a matter-of-fact tone, which caused Mrs Gould to make another effort to repress a shudder. She stood up, smiling graciously, and her little figure seemed to be diminished still more by the heavy mass of her hair and the long train of her gown. But always to success, she said persuasively. Charles Gould, enveloping her in the steely blue glance of his attentive eyes, answered without hesitation, Oh, there is no alternative. He put an immense assurance into his tone. As to the words, this was all that his conscience would allow him to say. Mrs Gould's smile remained a shade too long upon her lips. She murmured, I will leave you. I have a slight headache. The heat, the dust were indeed... I suppose you are going back to the mine before the morning? At midnight, said Charles Gould, we are bringing down the silver tomorrow. Then I shall take three whole days off in town with you. Ah, you are going to meet the escort. I shall be on the balcony at five o'clock to see you pass. Till then, goodbye. Charles Gould walked rapidly round the table and, seizing her hands, bent down, pressing them both to his lips. Before he straightened himself up again to his full height, she had disengaged one to smooth his cheek with a light touch, as if he were a little boy. Try to get some rest for a couple of hours, she murmured, with a glance at a hammock stretched in a distant part of the room. Her long train swished softly after her on the red tiles. At the door she looked back. Two big lamps with unpolished glass globes bathed in a soft and abundant light the four white walls of the room, with a glass case of arms, the brass hilt of Henry Gould's cavalry sabre on its square of velvet, and the watercolour sketch of the San Tome gorge. And Mrs Gould, gazing at the last in its black wooden frame, sighed out, Ah, if we had left it alone, Charlie! No, Charles Gould said moodily, it was impossible to leave it alone. Perhaps it was impossible, Mrs Gould admitted slowly. Her lips quivered a little, but she smiled with an air of dainty bravado. We have disturbed a good many snakes in that paradise, Charlie, haven't we? Yes, I remember, said Charles Gould. It was Don Pepe who called the gorge the paradise of snakes. No doubt we have disturbed a great many, but remember, my dear, that it is not now as it was when you made that sketch. He waved his hand towards the small watercolour hanging alone upon the great bare wall. It is no longer a paradise of snakes. We have brought mankind into it, and we cannot turn our backs upon them to go and begin a new life elsewhere. He confronted his wife with a firm, concentrated gaze which Mrs Gould returned with a brave assumption of fearlessness before she went out, closing the door gently after her. In contrast with the white glaring room, the dimly lit corridor had a restful mysteriousness of a forest glade, suggested by the stems and the leaves of the plants ranged along the balustrade of the open side. In the streaks of light falling through the open doors of the reception rooms, The blossoms, white and red and pale lilac, came out vivid with the brilliance of flowers and a stream of sunshine, and Mrs Gould, passing on, had the vividness of a figure seen in the clear patches of sun that chequer the gloom of open glades in the woods. The stones in the rings upon her hand, pressed to her forehead, glittered in the lamplight abreast of the door of the sala. "'Who's there?' she asked in a startled voice. "'Is that you, Basilio?' She looked in and saw Martin Decoux walking about with an air of having lost something amongst the chairs and tables. Antonia has forgotten her fan in here, said Decoux, with a strange air of distraction. So I entered to see. But even as he said this, he had obviously given up his search and walked straight towards Mrs Gould, who looked at him with doubtful surprise. Senora, he began in a low voice. "'What is it, Don Martin?' asked Mrs Gould. And then she added with a slight laugh, "'I'm so nervous today. 
as if to explain the eagerness of the question. "'Nothing immediately dangerous,' said Deku, who now could not conceal his agitation. "'Pray don't distress yourself. No, really, you must not distress yourself.' Mrs Gould, with her candid eyes very wide open, her lips composed into a smile, was steadying herself with a little bejeweled hand against the side of the door. Perhaps you don't know how alarming you are appearing like this unexpectedly. I, alarming, he protested, sincerely vexed and surprised. I assure you that I am not in the least alarmed myself. A fan is lost. Well, it will be found again, but I don't think it is here. It is a fan I am looking for. I cannot understand how Antonia could. Well, have you found it, amigo? No, senor, said behind Mrs. Gould the soft voice of Basilio, the head servant of the casa. I don't think the senorita could have left it in this house at all. Go and look for it in the patio again. Go now, my friend. Look for it on the steps, under the gate. Examine every flagstone. Search for it till I come down again. That fellow, he addressed himself in English to Mrs. Gould, is always stealing up behind one's back on his bare feet. I set him to look for that fan directly I came in to justify my reappearance, my sudden return. He paused, and Mrs. Gould said amiably, You are always welcome. She paused for a second, too. But I am waiting to learn the cause of your return. Deku affected suddenly the utmost nonchalance. I can't bear to be spied upon. Oh, the cause. Yes, there is a cause. There is something else that is lost besides Antonia's favourite fan. As I was walking home after seeing Don Jose and Antonia to their house, the Capitaz de Cargadores riding down the street spoke to me. "'Has anything happened to the violas?' inquired Mrs. Gould. "'The violas? "'You mean the old Garibaldino who keeps the hotel where the engineers live? "'Nothing happened there. "'The Capitaz said nothing of them. "'He only told me that the telegraphist of the cable company "'was walking on the plaza, bareheaded, looking out for me. "'There is news from the interior, Mrs. Gould. "'I should rather say rumours of news.' "'Good news,' said Mrs. Gould in a low voice. Worthless, I should think, but if I must define them, I would say bad. They are to the effect that a two days battle had been fought near Santa Marta, and that the Ribierists are defeated. It must have happened a few days ago, perhaps a week. The rumour has just reached Caita, and the man in charge of the cable station there has telegraphed the news to his colleague here. We might just as well have kept Barrios in Sulaco. What's to be done now? murmured Mrs. Gould. Nothing. He's at sea with the troops. He will get to Caeta in a couple of days' time and learn the news there. What will he do then? Who can say? Old Caeta? Offer his submission to Montero? Disband his army, this last most likely, and go himself in one of the OSN Company steamers, north or south, to Valparaiso or to San Francisco, no matter where. Our Barrios has a great practice in exiles and repatriations, which mark the points in the political game. Deku, exchanging a steady stare with Mrs. Gould, added tentatively, as it were, and yet, if we had, could have been done. Montero, victorious, completely victorious, Mrs. Gould breathed out in a tone of unbelief. A canard, probably, that sort of bird is hatched in great numbers in such times as these, and even if it were true, well, let us put things at their worst, let us say it is true. Then everything is lost, said Mrs. Gould, with the calmness of despair. Suddenly she seemed to divine, she seemed to see Deku's tremendous excitement under its cloak of studied carelessness. It was, indeed, becoming visible in his audacious and watchful stare, in the curve, half reckless, half contemptuous of his lips, and a French phrase came upon them, as if for this Costaguanero of the boulevard that had been the only forcible language. No, madame, rien ne peut du. It electrified Mrs. Gould out of her benumbed attitude, and she said vivaciously, What would you think of doing? But already there was something of mockery in Deku's suppressed excitement. What would you expect a true Costa Guanero to do? Another revolution, of course. On my word of honour, Mrs. Gould, I believe I am true. He de pas, a true son of the country, whatever Father Corbelan may say. And I'm not so much of an unbeliever as not to have faith in my own ideas, in my own remedies, in my own desires. Yes, said Mrs. Gould doubtfully. 
You don't seem convinced, Decoud went on again in French. Say then, in my passions. Mrs Gould received this addition unflinchingly. To understand it thoroughly, she did not require to hear his muttered assurance. There is nothing I would not do for the sake of Antonia. There is nothing I am not prepared to undertake. There is no risk I am not ready to run. Deku seemed to find a fresh audacity in this voicing of his thoughts. You would not believe me if I were to say that it is the love of country which... She made a sort of discouraged protest with her arm, as if to express that she had given up expecting that motive from anyone. A Sulaco revolution, Deku pursued in a forcible undertone. The great cause may be served here, on the very spot of its inception, in the place of its birth, Mrs Gould. Frowning and biting her lower lip thoughtfully, she made a step away from the door. You're not going to speak to your husband, Deku arrested her anxiously. But you will need his help? No doubt, Deku admitted without hesitation. Everything turns upon the San Tome mine, but I would rather he didn't know anything as yet of my... my hopes. A puzzled look came upon Mrs Gould's face, and Deku, approaching, explained confidentially. Don't you see? He's such an idealist. Mrs Gould flushed pink, and her eyes grew darker at the same time. Charlie, an idealist, she said, as if to herself, wonderingly. What on earth do you mean? Yes, conceded Deku, it is a wonderful thing to say with the sight of the San Tome mine, the greatest fact in the whole of South America, perhaps before our very eyes. He paused. Mrs Gould, are you aware to what point he has idealised the existence, the worth, the meaning of the San Tome mine? Are you aware of it? He must have known what he was talking about. The effect he expected was produced. Mrs Gould, ready to take fire, gave it up suddenly with a low little sound that resembled a moan. What do you know? she asked in a feeble voice. Nothing, answered Deku firmly. But then, don't you see, he's an Englishman. Well, what of that? asked Mrs Gould. Simply that he cannot act or exist without idealising every simple feeling, desire or achievement. He could not believe his own motives if he did not make them first a part of some fairy tale. The earth is not quite good enough for him, I fear. Do you excuse my frankness? Besides, whether you excuse it or not, it is part of the truth of things which hurts the, what do you call them, the Anglo-Saxons' susceptibilities. And at the present moment I don't feel as if I could treat seriously either his conception of things or, if you allow me to say so, or yet yours. Mrs Gould gave no sign of being offended. I suppose Antonia understands you thoroughly? Understands? Well, yes, but I am not sure that she approves. That, however, makes no difference. I am honest enough to tell you that, Mrs Gould. Your idea, of course, is separation, she said. Separation, of course, declared Martin. Yes, separation of the whole Occidental province from the rest of the unquiet body. But my true idea, the only one I care for, is not to be separated from Antonia. And that is all, asked Mrs Gould, without severity. Absolutely. I am not deceiving myself about my motives. She won't leave Sulaco for my sake. Therefore Sulaco must leave the rest of the Republic to its fate. Nothing could be clearer than that. I like a clearly defined situation. I cannot part with Antonia, therefore the one and indivisible Republic of Costaguana must be made to part with its western province. Fortunately, it happens to be also a sound policy. The richest, the most fertile part of this land may be saved from anarchy. Personally, I care little, very little, but it's a fact that the establishment of Montero in power would mean death to me. In all the proclamations of general pardon which I have seen, my name, with a few others, is specially accepted. The brothers hate me, as you know very well, Mrs Gould, and behold, here is the rumour of them having won a battle. You say that, supposing it is true, I have plenty of time to run away. The slight, protesting murmur on the part of Mrs Gould made him pause for a moment, while he looked at her with a sombre and resolute glance. Ah, but I would, Mrs Gould, I would run away if it served that which at present is my only desire. I am courageous enough to say that, and to do it too. But women, even our women, are idealists. It is Antonia that won't run away, a novel sort of vanity. 
"'You call it vanity?' said Mrs Gould in a shocked voice. "'Say pride, then, which Father Corbelin would tell you is a mortal sin, "'but I am not proud. I am simply too much in love to run away. "'At the same time, I want to live. There is no love for a dead man. "'Therefore it is necessary that Solaco should not recognise the victorious Montero. "'And you think my husband will give you his support?' I think he can be drawn into it like all idealists when he once sees a sentimental basis for his action. But I wouldn't talk to him. Mere clear facts won't appeal to his sentiment. It is much better for him to conceive himself in his own way. And frankly, I could not perhaps just now pay sufficient respect to either his motives or even perhaps to yours, Mrs Gould. It was evident that Mrs Gould was very determined not to be offended. She smiled vaguely while she seemed to think the matter over. As far as she could judge from the girl's half-confidences, Antonia understood that young man. Obviously there was promise of safety in his plan, or rather in his idea. Moreover, right or wrong, the idea could do no harm, and it was quite possible also that the rumour was false. "'You have some sort of a plan,' she said. Simplicity itself. Barrios has started. Let him go on, then. He will hold Caeta, which is the door of the sea route to Salaco. They cannot send a sufficient force over the mountains. No, not even to cope with the band of Hernandez. Meantime, we shall organise our resistance here. And for that, this very Hernandez will be useful. He has defeated troops as a bandit. He will no doubt accomplish the same thing if he has made a colonel or even a general. You know the country well enough not to be shocked by what I say, Mrs Gould. I have heard you assert that this poor bandit was the living, breathing example of cruelty, injustice, stupidity and oppression that ruin men's souls as well as their fortunes in this country. Well, there would be some poetical retribution in that man arising to crush the evils which had driven an honest ranchero into a life of crime. A fine idea of retribution in that, isn't there? Decoux had dropped easily into English, which he spoke with precision, very correctly, but with too many zzz sounds. Think also of your hospitals, of your schools, of your ailing mothers and feeble old men, of all that population which you and your husband have brought into the rocky gorge of San Tome. Are you not responsible to your conscience for all these people? Is it not worth while to make another effort which is not at all so desperate as it looks, rather than... Deku finished his thought with an upward toss of the arm, suggesting annihilation, and Mrs Gould turned away her head with a look of horror. "'Why don't you say all this to my husband?' she asked, without looking at Deku, who stood watching the effect of his words. "'Ah, but Don Carlos is so English,' he began. Mrs Gould interrupted. "'Leave that alone, Don Martin. He's as much Costa Guanero. No, he's more of a Costa Guanero than yourself.' Sentimentalist, sentimentalist, Deku almost cooed in a tone of gentle and soothing deference. Sentimentalist after the amazing manner of your people. I have been watching El Rey de Salaco since I came here on a fool's errand, and perhaps impelled by some treason of fate lurking behind the unaccountable turns of a man's life. But I don't matter. I am not a sentimentalist. I cannot endow my personal desires with a shining robe of silk and jewels. Life is not for me a moral romance derived from the tradition of a pretty fairy tale. No, Mrs Gould, I am practical. I am not afraid of my motives. But pardon me, I have been rather carried away. What I wish to say is that I have been observing. I won't tell you what I have discovered... No, that is unnecessary, whispered Mrs Gould, once more averting her head. It is, except one little fact, that your husband does not like me. It's a small matter which, in the circumstances, seems to acquire a perfectly ridiculous importance. Ridiculous and immense, for clearly money is required for my plan, he reflected, then added meaningly, and we have two sentimentalists to deal with. I don't know that I understand you, Don Martin, said Mrs Gould, coldly preserving the low key of their conversation. But, speaking as if I did, who is the other? The great Holroyd in San Francisco, of course, Deku whispered lightly. I think you understand me very well. Women are idealists, but then they are so perspicacious. 
But whatever was the reason of that remark, disparaging and complimentary at the same time, Mrs Gould seemed not to pay attention to it. The name of Holroyd had given a new tone to her anxiety. The silver escort is coming down to the harbour tomorrow. A whole six months working, Don Martin, she cried in dismay. Let it come down then, breathed out Deku earnestly, almost into her ear. But if the rumour should get about, and especially if it turned out true, troubles might break out in the town, objected Mrs Gould. Deku admitted that it was possible. He knew well the town children of the Sulaco Campo, sullen, thievish, vindictive and bloodthirsty, whatever great qualities their brothers of the plain might have had. But then there was that other sentimentalist who attached a strangely idealistic meaning to concrete facts. This stream of silver must be kept flowing north to return in the form of financial backing from the great house of Holroyd. Up at the mountain, in the strong room of the mine, the silver bars were worth less for his purpose than so much lead from which at least bullets may be run. Let it come down to the harbour, ready for shipment. The next north-going steamer would carry it off for the very salvation of the San Tome mine, which had produced so much treasure. And moreover, the rumour was probably false, he remarked with much conviction in his hurried tone. Besides, Signora, concluded Deku, we may suppress it for many days. I have been talking with the telegraphist in the middle of the Plaza Mayor, thus I am certain that we could not have been overheard. There was not even a bird in the air near us. And also let me tell you something more. I have been making friends with this man called Nostromo, of the Capitas. We had a conversation this very evening, I walking by the side of his horse as he rode slowly out of the town just now. He promised me that if a riot took place for any reason, even for the most political of reasons, you understand, his cargadores, an important part of the populace, you will admit, should be found on the side of the Europeans. He has promised you that? Mrs Gould inquired with interest. What made him make that promise to you? Upon my word, I don't know, declared Deku in a slightly surprised tone. He certainly promised me that, but now you ask me why, I could not tell you his reasons. He talked with his usual carelessness, which, if he had been anything else but a common sailor, I would call a pose or an affectation. Deku, interrupting himself, looked at Mrs Gould curiously. Upon the whole, he continued, I suppose he expects something to his advantage from it. You mustn't forget that he does not exercise his extraordinary power over the lower classes without a certain amount of personal risk and without a great profusion in spending his money. One must pay in some way or other for such a solid thing as individual prestige. He told me after we made friends at a dance in a posada kept by a Mexican just outside the walls that he had come here to make his fortune. I suppose he looks upon his prestige as a sort of investment. Perhaps he prizes it for his own sake, Mrs Gould said in a tone as if she were repelling an undeserved aspersion. Viola, the Garibaldino, with whom he has lived for some years, calls him the incorruptible. Ah, he belongs to the group of your protégés out there towards the harbour, Mrs Gould. Muy buen. And Captain Mitchell calls him wonderful. I have heard no end of tales of his strength, his audacity, his fidelity, no end of fine things. Hmm, incorruptible. It is indeed a name of honour for the capitas of the cargadores of Sulaco. Incorruptible. Fine, but vague. However, I suppose he's sensible too, and I talk to him upon that sane and practical assumption. I prefer to think him disinterested and therefore trustworthy, Mrs Gould said, with the nearest approach to curtness it was in her nature to assume. Well... If so, then the silver will be still more safe. Let it come down, Signora. Let it come down so that it may go north and return to us in the shape of credit. Mrs Gould glanced along the corridor towards the door of her husband's room. Deku, watching her as if she had his fate in her hands, detected an almost imperceptible nod of assent. He bowed with a smile and putting his hand into the breast pocket of his coat, pulled out a fan of light feathers set upon painted leaves of sandalwood. I had it in my pocket, he murmured triumphantly, for a plausible pretext. He bowed again. Good night, Signora. 
Mrs Gould continued along the corridor, away from her husband's room. The fate of the San Tome mine was lying heavy upon her heart. It was a long time now since she had begun to fear it. It had been an idea. She had watched it with misgivings turning into a fetish. And now the fetish had grown into a monstrous and crushing weight. It was as if the inspiration of their early years had left her heart to turn into a wall of silver bricks erected by the silent work of evil spirits between her and her husband. He seemed to dwell alone within a circumvallation of precious metal, leaving her outside with her school, her hospital, the sick mothers and the feeble old men, mere insignificant vestiges of the initial inspiration. Those poor people, she murmured to herself. Below, she heard the voice of Martin Decou in the patio speaking loudly. I have found Don Antonio's fan, Basilio. Look, here it is. End of part second, The Isabels, chapter six.